Hey there, I'm Mark Traeger. And I sit down with Evan Carmichael in a 10-part series because I was able to build uh, an over million dollar a year business. 10 years ago now, I was at, in the recession. I was at the point in my life where I had no revenue, I had no employees, I had no clients, and I thought I was gonna shut down my business. I was able to go from zero to a million dollars plus by following some simple steps. In this 10-part series, Evan and I sit down and we break through everything. We look at operations, we look at uh, how to build your portfolio, we look at where to get your customers from. The first video starts right now. It's gonna help you take your business to the next level. What's up, Believe Nation? I am testing a new series on how to build a million dollar company, and I thought I'd start with a friend of mine, Mark Draper. Draper, that's awesome, let's keep that in. Mark Draper. <laughs> only how known, long have I've I only known you? for 12 years. <laughs> Can't even say my name. That's <laughs> the best. <laughs> I'm so happy I flubbed the intro. We gotta keep all this in. Uh, Mark has built an awesome million dollar plus business in the, what are you doing? This dog just randomly showing up. As of course. Well. This is fun. Uh, what do we teach people to do? We teach you how to build an agency, marketing agency. If you want to build a million dollar plus marketing agency, that is what this series, 10 part series is all about. And so do you have a quick, like something quick you want to intro, say about yourself, sure. what you do? Sure. Yeah. So I started Fanta 12 years ago. Uh, we started really heavily focused on video, but you know, as marketing has changed, as advertising has changed, we've been able to expand. Uh, into all assets or facets of digital marketing and analytics because really you wanted me to start with one piece of value so we might yeah. as well start right away yeah 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 the only okay, the okay. O yeah yeah, go. Okay, yeah yeah the only thing that matters yeah is the value you drive to a client it seems basic but that's that's the only thing that matters okay so point number one this video you have to drive value to your client how do you do it so it starts uh with trying to figure out what your skill sets are. So okay. what, what are you good at? Yeah. You know, if you're really great at design and you like marketing, then it makes more sense to start a creative type of agency. If you're really great at websites and building websites, then it makes more sense to start a digital type of agency. Uh, whatever your passion is and whatever you focus on is where your business will go anyway. So the, the first place to start is figuring out what are you really good at? And, and you don't have to be the best at it, but when you're starting, you know, you want a few people to be able to say like, oh, you got a gift here, or you're talented, or that's really good, or we really like it. And it seems super, super basic, but, but that, that positive reinforcement is gonna help you build confidence and get you through things. And that's where you start. So for us, we started with video. Yeah. And I went to film school. Uh, I, I went and worked in corporate video. If, if you go back and look at our stuff from 12 years ago, it's, it's not good. It's, it's really, really bad work. And, um, but I started with video because that's, that's what I knew. And then the video mar became video marketing, and then video marketing became oh, we need to put this on a landing page. And then the landing page became, oh, can you do the microsite? And for years, we had clients asking us, they said, oh, we, we love how you do video so much. Can you please do this other stuff for us? And we said, no, we're just, we're video agency only. So, so sorry, you have to go find someone else. And we would hear all these bad things about bad experiences. And finally we said, why are we, why are we turning clients away when they like us, when they like what we do? Why don't we apply what we're doing to all of these other uh, styles of work? Yeah. And so that's how, our company turned into you know, a full service digital agency or full service marketing agency because the clients were coming to us and saying, saying, please help us with these other things. Right. And so it's okay to start with just focusing on logo design or it's okay to start with uh, trying to be the best at creating a landing page and driving traffic to that landing page. Yeah. It's all about what you're good at and then marrying up that with value. Right? We can't lose sight of the fact that, like I, I say this to my team, it matters more what clients think about your work than the quality of the work. Okay. Right? That bothers me because I'm a yeah, because I'm a perfectionist, right? Yeah. Like I have high standards. So I go, oh, you know, it's it should all be about how good the work is, but it's not. Yeah. Right? It's how people feel about the work. Right. Right? So right. if you're working right. with people and you're starting out and you go, Oh, I don't have a portfolio, but you have one or two people who like you. Right. That's that's great. Right. Like right. start. Right. Right? People like that I called you Draper instead of Draper. <laughs> no one likes that. No one <laughs> likes that. If you guys like that, put in the comments. Just as, I'm going to screenshot and show Mark how much you love that we call them Draper. Um, well, so the point of this series is to get to get specific, right? So like mm -hmm. somebody wants to build a million dollar plus marketing agency. So tip number one is you have to know yourself, what you love doing, where you can bring the most value. So I'm thinking, okay, I love that. I agree. Now how do I? What's my next step? If I'm just starting, right. how do I figure out? Maybe not even what I'm good at yet, because you may not be good at it at the start, but you have a passion for the thing to get better at. How do I, how do I make that decision to know, yes, this is the right path? 
So you can do as much planning as you want. You can do as much thinking as you want. I, you know, I started my company, I was really young. I was 24. Yeah. But I actually had written a business plan. Not, that sounds really fancy. I had actually printed off a bunch of other people's websites and kind of came up with the idea for what I wanted to start yeah. uh, three years earlier. And, and I only remembered that like much later. I found all these notes and I was like, where are all these websites? And I was like, oh yeah, when I was like 19 or 20, I had this vision of starting something. Yeah. So do you want to start something? Like ask yourself if you want to start something and you're really good at it, then it, like, it's not complicated. Like you just have to start. You just have to start because it's going to take you time to get better and that's okay. It's going to take you time to listen to the clients who you're working with and, and fix your operations and all the other topics that we're gonna kinda get into in other videos. Yep. But there's there's not really much magic to it other than the courage to just say, this is something I'm doing. And being okay with, with uh, getting better. Yep. And being okay with figuring it out later. You know, when we switched maybe three and a half, four years ago from being only video, Right? And, and the previous video we did was how to build a multi, you know, multi-million dollar or whatever yeah. video company. And now we're talking about marketing. Yeah. Uh, we just switched. Yeah. Right? I was like, this is who we are now. And this is what we do. And I started talking to people. I took them out for lunch. And I said, this is what we want to do. And this is how we want to help. And people like that. So if you want to start a website company, yeah. decide, okay, I want to start a website company. Uh, start talking to people about the fact that you are now a website company. Yeah. And how you want to help them. I get it. I mean, <laughs> and that's the point of this series because it, people will overthink those things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, like when I started, we didn't have a website for the first two months. Yeah. Now this is in 2006, but yeah. I mean in 2006, sure. we started the company, we started the company with no website for, for two months. Right. Uh, even if you go through, um, if anyone goes through the Wayback Machine, it's like, it's, it took us four years to actually create something that wasn't still embarrassing. Exists. Wayback Machine? I think they way stopped keeping track. Yeah. No, is it still to keep in track? Yeah, if you want to go, if you want to go way back, phantommedia.com. Like, it's like embarrassing. it's embarrassing. Yeah, it's yeah, embarrassing. Yeah. For, jinx, uh, double jinx. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, jinx me or no? Uh, we, I was saying to someone the other day, I'm like, I think we're on our fourth logo. We've only we've been around 12 years. We're on our fourth logo. Yeah. And that's because our first bunch of logos were really bad. Okay. Right? They just they just weren't good. Uh, you know, we incorporated the company because we thought like, oh, if we have, you know, the word incorporated or limited or company, right, it'll right. seem big. Like, right. like, we just made lots of mistakes. So right. just, just don't worry about that. Get started. Right. Get started with one client that turns into three, yeah. that turns into six, that right. turns into, you know, do, try to do good work, try to listen. So, but, but really the core for kind of the, the first part of it is thinking about the type of company you want to build. Do you want to be a great freelancer? Okay. That's running a company. Yeah. Right. Do you want to be a freelancer as two or three people working for you? Do you want to have a team of 30 or 40 people? That's, that's like a totally different type of company. And you're right. not going to be there from day one. But, but you know, understand... What do you need to be at to, get a, to hit a million in revenue? What size? Can you, you can't do that as a freelancer? Can you do that as a freelancer? No. Right? So like what, what size yeah. team do you need to be at to hit a million? So... A range. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to be anywhere between, oh gosh, maybe if you're killing yourselves, four or five people. Yeah. Up to, uh, I mean, up to anything, I guess. But if you have, yeah, I you mean, have a you thousand can't... people, you make a million bucks, you're not in business. No, I mean, if you're, if you're, so, so I'm talking about like full-time staff. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. If you're outsourcing, because you can build a great outsource model yeah. too, where you're yeah. outsourcing tons and tons of stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing a million dollars and you only have 20% margins and you're only earning 200,000 in-house. Yeah. So, so you're only going to have uh, two, three people on salary. Yeah. But if you do everything in-house and you're doing a million dollars, you might have eight, nine, 10, 12. It depends right. on your cost of living. It depends the area you're working in. Yep. Right? So if somebody's just getting started or they, they've started their agency they, and they like, man, I want to be like Mark in a couple of years. The, the biggest thing I hear, sorry yeah. to interrupt, the biggest yeah. thing I hear from people, because I, I have conversations once or twice a month with other people trying to do it. Yeah. Most people aren't starting out. Okay. Right? Hey, if you're starting out, think, think ahead. Okay. Most people are doing this for a year or two okay. and they're not getting any traction. Okay. Right. Are we going and to cover that in future videos or that this is... Let's add it. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't a topic. Okay, here we go. Bring it in. How to gain traction. <laughs> but I was going to say, yeah. uh, these things take time Yeah. and there are these tipping points, right? You always talk about focus on momentum, Yeah. right? Focus Love on momentum. momentum. Things things yeah, start yeah. to pick up. Yeah. I never I never knew that year four would be easier than year three Right. or that year three would be slightly easier than year two, right? Like the longer you're doing it, the more that you're doing... Uh, it's not that things get easier, but you're just more well known. You know more people. You've had more opportunities. You've done more work. You're you're in the game for longer, and so focus on some momentum. But most people who 
feel like they're not getting traction, yeah. it's because they're only two or three years into it, or, or they're four or five, and then they're not making big changes. And so you have to be willing to make those changes. You have to give it some time. So, so going all the way back, start. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like start the clock now. Start the clock tomorrow. Yeah. So that way you're like, this is what we're doing. And don't worry about the business card. Don't worry about the website. Start telling people this is what you're doing. Start doing free work. Okay. Start honing your skills. Start talking to lots of people. Right? Decide the type of company you want to be. Think about your skill sets and just start. Okay, so, so if somebody's trying to go from deciding, like the point of this video is decide what you want to The type be, of company and, you want to be. Yeah. And how you can bring value to your clients. Yeah. Right? What are three questions that I need to be asking myself to figure out that problem? Oh, very good. So everybody watching, ask good. yourself these three questions. Yeah. So I would say, what is something that you feel is easy, but you're surprised that isn't easy for other people? Okay, good. Right, that was that was mind blowing for me when right. I started, and I was a few years in, and I started hiring people, and I got frustrated. I was like, I was like, this is really simple stuff. Right. And then I learned. I was like, oh, I'm just actually really good at this. Right. Okay, that's right? a good one. But it yep. seems so easy to me. Like like I felt bad charging people money for it. Right. It was so easy. Right. But so so that's the first question. What's something that seems really easy to you, but others are like they can't do or they struggle with, there's, there's just value there. Yeah. Uh, the second question, always ask yourself if you're good enough. Okay. Right, now this can be really depressing, right? Yeah. Like I ask myself if I'm good enough and I just end up with like, no, I'm not. Okay. Right, so the, so the other side of that is to pull yourself out of that hole by figuring out what are the few things you can do to get better, right? Like I look at competition and, and I go, gosh, they're so good. Are we even doing anything good, right? right? And we've, I've been doing this for 12 years. Like people look at me, like I actually had a conversation with someone who's my competition, right? and he's looking at me and he's like, these guys are so good. I'm looking at him going, these guys are so good. And meanwhile, we're like, we could be best friends because right. we're, we're in the same place and doing the same thing. But there's like some kind of healthy competition there. Yeah. So when you're starting out, look at a few people that you think um, are achievable. Ask yourself if you're good enough. And then and then like really use that not to get yourself depressed, but to close that gap. Right. Because everybody starts somewhere, right? And so if you're able to... It's a kick forward, not down. Yeah. But you're still getting the kick. Yeah. That yeah. would be the second thing. Yeah. I like it. And then the third thing I would say is you can't be everything to everybody. Okay. And I still, I still struggle with this too. So what's the question with that? So the question would be, what are those core elements that I really should be focusing on and doing? And what are the things that I shouldn't be wasting my time on and saying no to? And I fall into this all the time. You know, I have friends ask me to help them with their website when I have no time. Right. You gotta dump those friends. Do I? <laughs> Mr. Carmichael? <laughs> right. Those friends don't serve you, man. Yeah. So so you can't be everything to everybody. Yeah. The, when you're starting, the more niche you are, yeah. the like the harder and yet easier it is. So picking so like what would be a, what would be a niche example somebody? Oh, if you're like, like I'm only gonna ever focus on logo design. Right? For, like, for athletes or for sports oh, that's brands? Even, like, that's even better. Okay. Like, like, it depends on, again, the type of company you want to build. Right. If, if you want to be... a good starting if, point? Like, I'm going to develop websites for the yoga industry and be the best yoga website person and then expand from there? That's a great way to look at it. Okay. It's hard, but it's a fast way to grow. Okay. All right, so when I started the company, we Why were doing... It it's hard because when there's no one talking to you, there's no one talking to you. There's zero revenue. There's nothing happening. But how does the yoga thing make it worse? So when I when I started, we were we were doing lots of things for lots of people. Again, I was right. like, oh, a little money here and a little it's money like here and a little money here. You know, oh, I need eight hundred dollars and a thousand dollars. Is that good? Uh, I mean, you, it, it helped. It? it helped me generate a hundred thousand dollars of revenue my first year. That's a lot more than everybody when they're right. starting up. That was great. Do but, you recommend but when that I, you do it again. Well, is that the path? Like people are watching. Like man, hundred k. Like they would love to have hundred k. I know, revenue. but here's but here's the problem. Yeah, here's the problem. I had hundred k revenue, but only only like eighteen of it was doing the stuff I wanted to do. So do you recommend that or no? Do you put your foot down and say this is what I do? I, I wouldn't do it again that way. How would you do it if you're starting over? If 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 you're your twenty four year old Drager again. Yeah, I mean, I said it right this time. Twenty four year old Drager. So. This is the this is the struggle, right? Like my, like when I started my company, my wife had no income because she was just graduating college. My first daughter was th three months old, and I quit my job. I quit my forty thousand dollar a year job, and I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to start my company, and I had hundred thousand dollars revenue. Yeah. And that year we took home seventeen thousand dollar pay. Right. So we were living below the poverty line for the first year. So 
I mean, I had to hustle. I had to, I had to not go bankrupt. I had to make it happen. So, so but if I could have, yeah, if I could do it again, it, I would say, you know what? Um, we did all of that work on all of those different things, and I still only made seventeen grand. Mm -hmm. So, it was it was about having the courage to say, we'll get through that first year. Things will get better. And if I had focused all my efforts only on that one thing that we were good at. Maybe I still would have made 17 or 18 grand. Right. And maybe I would have actually been less busy. Right. Right. It's uncomfortable not to be busy. So if you want to do the, if you want to be but the yoga website person. If you want to be the web, say by no. year two it's better, by year three it's even better. But say no to the guy who wants you to make a car dealership website. Of course. Or say no to the even person who goes, in the hand. say no to the person who's like, oh, you seem to be pretty good at design, can you do my business cards? Right. Right. And say no. If you want to be a design company, be a design company. If you want to be, uh, if you want to be a website company, be a website company. If you want to be a photography company, do that. A what if it pays agency. you more than 17K? Do, what if do it's you like, love it? No. Is it your skill set? Yes. But you don't like it? Nope. So what's your passion? I want to be the yoga guy. I don't want to design your business cards. So but then say no. Don't fall into the temptation of just well, taking the, the money and I'm losing a few years. Because yeah. that's what people do, You're right? You're going to lose a few years. Is it worth costing you a few years? Right? It will, it will slow you down. So Drager, like go back to 24-year-old Drager. Uh, Mark, can you help me with my business cards? But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pay you. Oh, no, I would have totally done it. Oh. <laughs> but I shouldn't. No, I shouldn't but, but, have. But like, I'll pay you. I'll pay you 17k just my business cards. <laughs> but that's you a battle, should, right? Yeah. Listen, if there was a there was a time. Thing, there was a, there was a time to get through the first year where where this company hired us to do landing pages, right? You're right. We were starting a video agency, right? But if we're doing landing pages, and I, I'm outsourcing it to my wife, and I'm saying like, hey, copy and paste this stuff because we needed the eleven thousand dollars, you know, to come in and pay the bills. But when it is high pain and you have bills to pay, but you don't love it, do you still do it? Like, is that is that the life? Could it save your business? Or if or it's, you say like, if, no. if, it's gonna, if you're gonna lose your apartment, yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna not make rent, if you're yeah. not gonna make payroll, yeah. If you have a gap, then take it. Yeah. Right. Like, listen. Like, you, you got to. If those are the case. Yeah. If you if if it if if you are taking that seventeen grand, yeah, and you are losing three months of your time, yeah, to make payroll yeah. when you, and there are other things that are lower margins waiting for you in the wings, yeah. then that's going to hold you back. Right. If you have nothing to do, right. How many business? How many businesses you know that are starting up that have nothing to do? You're focusing sure. on the wrong stuff. Sure. Right. It's, but so it's, it's it's pain opportunities versus non-pain opportunities, like biz dev, right? Getting out listen, there talking to people. Uh, the, num the number one thing that I see holding business owners back yeah. is they're too selfish when they start. Meaning? They, they imagine that, that they should be paid first. You shouldn't be paid first, right? They imagine that they should earn some kind of income. Like, oh, if I was working for someone else, I should earn some kind of income. And they rob all the operating capital out of the company. Yeah. Right? If, if you really, like, the, the ones who take off are the people who don't pay themselves for two or three years. Yeah. Who uh, work... Um, who live in the office that they work in because they can only afford a single rent and they don't have two rents. Yeah. Uh, when I was really trying to kickstart three years in my business, I took out a loan. I used that loan to hire someone. Right. And I stopped paying myself for six months. Right. I remember that. And my wife was like, uh, hey. Right. I think I was like, hey, too. Hey, wasn't I? why are you borrowing money to pay someone else and you're not right. paying yourself? Yeah. Right? yeah. Like, like I've seen it, I've seen yeah, it with yeah. friends who, yeah. who go like, oh, we have three partners in the business, and all partners need to earn this to live. It's right. like you have too many partners. Yeah, right. You're gonna, you're gonna. The company needs revenue to do what the work it needs to do, so that way later, you can be like, look at how great this company is. Yeah, right. So I and I, I didn't know that starting. I just, I was nervous to to use any cash. But right. even now, like, like, I, I feel like I should earn like double or triple what I pay myself because I I'm worth that. Right. Um, but I'm trying to do something great here, and, yeah. and that takes resources. Yeah. So don't rob the company of that money, because because you feel like I've worked really hard. I'm entitled to this or that. Right. Right. Put that off for 12 months, 18 months, and give yourself little treats if you need it. But like the little treat should be What's like. What's your hey, favorite little treat? Uh, early on, I gave my wife $500 to buy new clothes. Like my like, treat was going to McDonald's and getting a large French fry right. and sharing it with three people. Right. right. Like I get it. Right. You Anything. Know, this was this was two to two and a half years in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We're earning like we're like I think I was you know yeah. seventeen. I think I went to thirty two grand the next year. It doesn't have to cost a lot. It's the celebration. It's like hey, no. You know it was what? more. It was more like the surprise. Like yeah. like it's been two years since we bought clothing. Yeah. You know like yeah. Like here you go. Yeah. 
have an afternoon. Like you can spend a lot of, like it feels like a lot of money when you got no money, 500 bucks. Oh man, right. Right, two years she, <laughs> she earned that. <laughs> Sounds like a few hundred bucks a month, dude. I hear you. Mark, what's the most important thing that you want to talk about on, on charging and money? So I, I think for a lot of people who are starting out, especially if you're creative, yeah. right? if you're an agency, you're gonna be a pretty creative person, yeah. is the feeling like, uh, I don't wanna look at it. I don't wanna know, like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ostrich it. I'm gonna put my head in the sand. Yeah. I'm not gonna worry about it. And truthfully, it's something you have to be aware of. Okay. But if you do worry about it, you, I'm gonna be both sides here. You don't have to worry about it that much. Okay. Right? So we're 12 years in. Yeah. We still price things like in this really open, safe way. Okay. Right? What Everyone's, does that mean? Um, we just assume how much something will cost and how much someone will pay us and we just figure out that it's gonna work out in the end. Like, like it, it's, it, sounds, it sounds crazy, okay. but I am not good with numbers. Okay. And so the thought of, of all of my financials and all of my things, the thought of going like, this is a big project and how many hours and how much does it cost and all of these things, I'd okay. rather go like, uh, that's 80 grand and then hope that it costs less than 80 grand to deliver. <laughs> and it sounds crazy, <laughs> Yeah. right? And I've been doing this long enough that I kind of know what you things gotta, cost. You got a feel for it. But if, if I have to wait two weeks to deliver a quote because I'm busy or a week or something, figuring something out. Well, why does it take that long? For most people? Well, some projects are really complicated. Okay. Right? And if you're outsourcing oh, stuff you and you're waiting. You don't know the price until you get into it. Right. You don't know what, you don't quite know what's happening until you get into it, but they okay. won't get into it until they want to know what the price is. Okay. And then if you're relying on vendors, you have to go out to them and then they say, well, what's the scope? Okay. And then you got to give them the scope. And like, it could take, it could take months. Okay. So truthfully, if you're like, yeah, I think this is 12 grand. Okay. And it's 13. Well, yeah, I mean, you've lost a thousand dollars for a really great opportunity to build your portfolio. Or hopefully it's 10 and you get to keep two of it. Or maybe it's six and you get to keep six of it, right? Like, okay. like when you're starting, if, if you are really getting stressed out with how to charge for things. Yeah. And I mean, this can be a big risk. If, if you're going, if sudden, suddenly you landed some kind of big bank yeah. and they're like, hey, we want all of this stuff, uh, you know, chances are you, you're going to be too overwhelmed to take that. You're going to be too scared to take it, or they're just not going to give it to you because okay. you won't pass due diligence. But if something, if something big is happening, it's like, oh, we want this million dollar project. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh gosh, I don't know if it's going to cost me 2 million. You're losing a million dollars. Yeah. I'm not talking those numbers. Okay. I'm talking when, when, when you're doing an $800 project okay. or a $5,000 project. And or, that's what your cost costs you $5,000 to do? Uh, what you think it's worth. Okay. Right? So there's two ways to price a business. Yep. Right. Whenever you're dealing with this, it's it's either going to be based off of uh, your your cost to deliver with markup. So it costs me eight thousand dollars to deliver this project. I think I should earn forty percent margin, so I take eight thousand dollars and I mark it up. Okay. Or it's going to be based on your hours, right? But you uh, don't do any of this stuff. Later, we reverse engineer it. <laughs> okay. But so you have a sense. I'm saying there's, there's, there's ways you have to price a business. Either right. it's going to be a hard cost plus markup. Yeah. It's going to be your hours. I think yeah. it's going to take 140 hours to do this. My hourly rate is 60 or 80 or 100 or 200 or 300, whatever it is, your hourly rate. And yeah. that's your answer. Uh, or you, uh, you just make a number up based on what you think it's worth. Right? I know it's only going to it's only gonna take 12 hours to do this project, but I'm experienced. I'm a genius. I know it takes me 12 hours, but it's worth $10,000. And then okay. there's that's another way to price your business, right? And really, you shouldn't stick to any one of these. You should be open to all of them because it depends on the client. If, if you're working with someone who is coming to you because you're really good at your job and they don't have a lot of money and you like them, you're probably going to price it less, right? Right. If you're working with someone who, who um, where it's a lot of outsourced elements, right? You're like, you're spending a lot of money. You probably want to protect yourself by marking it up. But the reason why I said we reverse engineer this later is let's say you come to us and we go, we, we do this on, on most projects. We'll start talking to you and we'll say, well, how much budget do you have? And that's the other thing is we ask clients, like, how much budget do you have to work with? Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. And they say, oh, I'm not quite sure. How much will it cost? It can cost anything. All right? So realistically, are you going to spend $10,000 on this? Are you going to spend $2,000 on this? Are you going to spend $100,000 on it? Right, like you may say you don't have a budget, but everybody knows what they feel is reasonable, and or at that's least a ballpark. That's important to know. At least the ballpark. A ballpark, right? And so if someone says, "Well, we can't see going over ten thousand dollars," okay, now you have a place to start. Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself, "Can I deliver anything for ten thousand dollars?" I think it's one of the hardest things for people just getting started. What What do I charge for my thing? 
I'm going to help you shoot this video. I'm going to help make a mm -hmm. website. Well, what does a website cost? Well, if, you're, if, you're, if your cousin does it, it's free. And if you hire some right. big agency, it's going to cost you $50,000. But, but it's not about what, when you're starting, it's not about what other people charge, right? It's about... So how do I figure out what I should charge for that website or for that video or for that Instagram campaign? I, I don't overcomplicate it like that. Okay. I say, what is the client asking for? Yeah. Do I think I can do it? Yeah. And if I can't, what do I need to do to be able to do it? Right? Like maybe I can't do it, but maybe I can hire my cousin or maybe I can hire my friend or I can do this stuff. What will that cost me? And can I deliver this within their budget? Because you're starting, right? And when you're starting, clients... Okay, but first you're asking for their budget. Yeah. So when they say, Mark, how much is it going to cost you to design this website or do this landing page or make this business card? I say, I first say question what kind of budget do we is, have to work with? Right? Because truthfully, and, and it might seem crazy because they'll say like, well, like I, I, I told you I want a website. Right. But it's like saying like, I want to buy a car. Yeah. What kind of car do you want? Right. Right. You want to take a trip. Yeah. Hotel. Yeah. Flights. Like, where are you going? What yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Right. Like, like these are, these are very, most, most people understand this, right? Yeah. When they come back and think about it, they go, okay, I guess that makes sense. Because do you want a $4,000 website or a $40,000 website? Mm. Right? And they might say, well, of course I want a 4000 one that's so much cheaper. I don't want to pay more than I have to. But it's not about that. It's about, it's about what do we what have to it. work with yeah. from a budget point of view. So the first question back is, what's your budget? Then they say, I don't know, Mark, uh, you know, you're the expert on this. I'm just trying to figure it out. I just want a website. Perfect. Then Some people spend ten to 20000 on a website. Some people spend 50000 plus. Some people want to expect a website to be like four or five grand. Where are you in that? Right. Right? And they still say, I don't know. It's like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> you, you must know if you're comfortable spending $80,000 on a website, right? Or if, if you're like, well, I expect a website to cost 8000 Now, then you can, again, this is when you're starting, right? When you're starting, you yeah. need experience. You need clients. You need people to like you. You need yeah. opportunities. You need all of these things. So I don't look at it in terms of like every lead that comes through is a chance for me to make money. Yeah. Every lead that comes through is an opportunity for me to prove myself. Right. And my goal is not to lose money in this regard. Right. Right. So we talked in the previous video about not being selfish and trying to draw out all this money. If you need this money to live, it's going to skew your motivations. It's going to make you say like, I need to take this project and I need to earn five grand on it. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it that way. I get to take on this project and I have an opportunity to prove myself, learn a bunch of things, make a bunch of connections, and hopefully I don't lose money on it. What I also love and what you're saying is you're, you're pushing it back on the client. And I think a lot of people will have insecurities around that, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when they say, even just the question, how much does it cost, are already insecurities. It's like, well, I should know how much it costs. And then when you say, well, what's your budget? And they say, well, I don't know. You're the expert. Then more insecurities. Like, I'm supposed to be the expert. I'm supposed to know. I literally go medium, low, high. And I did that twice with you. Yeah. I went, is it 12 grand? Is it 4 grand? Is it 100 grand? Yeah. Is it 15 grand? Is it 10 grand? Is it 50 grand? Yeah. Right? Like, and, and, I, and I do that. Now, I know there's certain things I can't do, right? I've been doing this long enough. Sure. If someone wants something and they don't have the budget, yeah. I know now. Right. Uh, I'm also at the point in my business where we're telling people what they should spend on mm -hmm. stuff, right? Oh, well, I think you should spend this on it. But, but for our first seven or eight years, we didn't price anything that way. Right. Right. And does it, it, it does lead to some trouble sometimes, right? Sometimes you get a project where you look back on it and you go like, wow, we did all of that work. And uh, we didn't earn very much money. But then that's the next part of it, is, is when you're in a creative field, uh, you want every project to be the best it can so it can be an expression of what you're capable of and what you can do and all those things. Mm -hmm. So the worst case scenario is you do a project with a client you don't like, or they just don't like you by the end of it. You don't do good work, and you, or you can't show it, and you don't earn any money. Yeah. Right? That's, that, to me, that's, that's losing. Yeah. If you can either not make money like you know i'm not making money i'm not really doing great work but the client loves me that's still a win right because then you have another opportunity to actually move up the budgets yep. to do the next thing to change the things if the client's not really that happy with you but you did great work yeah now you have a portfolio piece yeah if the client's not happy with you, you didn't do great work but you had great margins yeah well now you have money to go out and do the next thing yeah right so ideally you're not losing all of those right but when it comes to financials of course you need an accountant of course you need to be aware of cash flow those things are, you know, our bookkeeper, maybe not accountant, a bookkeeper or cash flow. Like you kind of have to have your stuff together a little bit. Um, 
But other than me watching cash flow, making sure that I have enough money to pay everyone and that eventually I will get money back from clients, yeah. we're, we're not really that savvy. <laughs> like we don't, we, don't, oh. we don't leverage money from this person to try and squeeze that person. Uh, we pay our, our, our suppliers and our vendors and our staff right away, but we don't get paid from clients for like three or four months. Um, like we're just very conservative in a lot of ways, but that gives me the freedom to be able to say yes to the client in the meeting mm -hmm. and then later figure out what we're going to actually do. And that's very, very powerful. I love that you, so I love that you push back on the client. I love that you give some options and ranges. I think it's something that everybody can learn from. Uh, how do you feel about free work? Uh, you talk about portfolio piece. That doesn't bother me. But when to do it, when not to do it, somebody's yeah. starting up, they don't have a portfolio or it's limited or it's not the work they want to do. When to make the decision say, okay, this is worth doing for free versus, you kind of mentioned it with the three things to look at. Yeah. So what are the three things again? Portfolio, money, and? Happy client. Happy client, like? They love you. They, they love you. They love you. And they'll talk about you. They'll talk about you. You call them up, they always take your call. You right. email them, they respond right away. And yeah, those, and those, those people referrals. come back. Those, Maybe? What percentage of your business referrals? Mm, that's interesting. Um, In the ballpark. Probably very little. Really? Um, because, because the majority of our business is repeat. Okay. Right? So, so when you're in a business where, where, where it's not project-based and it's yeah. not repeat, then referrals are important. Yeah. So most people who meet us for the first time meet us because they're looking for someone online. Okay. And we're going to get into marketing later. But yeah. they meet us online. Uh, we do get referrals from people where someone's talked to someone, but there are a lot of people who talk to a lot of people. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there. Right. So the majority of our work actually comes from someone looking for us online mm -hmm. or maybe being introduced to us like five or six or seven years ago. And then they leave the company and go here and take us with them. But now we have this company and this company. Yeah. And then that person, you know, leaves and goes here. And now if we can hold that, sometimes we can't. And now we have three companies. Or it's just year after year after year. Our best clients... We work with, um, you know, we work with for five, six, seven years. Uh, there are clients that we, we worked with 10 years ago who disappear for four or five years and then come back and they become our best clients and then they disappear yeah. and then they become our best clients again. Yeah. And so it, it's always kind of changing, but, uh, you know, having people, having really great customer service, and again, we're getting into that as well. Yeah. Having people like you. Yeah. Uh, being able to deliver is really, really important. So the three things, you're making money from it, mm -hmm. it's a good portfolio piece, and you have happy clients. I want to hit it. You want one of them. At least one. Yeah, I mean, ideally all three would be fantastic. Sure, I know, but, but like where's the, if, if it's zero, it's a walk away. If it's three, if it's, it's a home if run. If it's zero, you don't know to the end, though. So that's the other thing. If it's zero, you don't what? You don't know to the end. You don't know to the end of the project. If you've even, if, if, there are projects Possibly, that start out sure. with the greatest of intentions, right. the best of relationships. But they don't have the budget, Everything so looks, you know it's zero on the budget. You're not taking tax check. Well, I don't mean zero as in like you're, ta you're taking it for free. I mean like but you, it's not, you did it's my not like, oh, we got 10 grand. It doesn't and hit your margins you know though. It, yeah, it doesn't hit your margins. And as you get more into it, you figure out, you get a, you get a better oh, sixth sense learn, about you it. You learn quickly. For sure. But, but, but so it's fine. So like three is a home run. Three to three is a home run. Zero to three is a, this sucks, we're out. Zero is like you don't want to look at that person again. Do you take the one? Do you take the two you're going to take? If you got nothing to do, you do. You take the one. Sure. If you have nothing to do, right? So everything is an opportunity to prove yourself. Yeah. Right? And, um, you know, I, I, I think it helps to know what your motivations are yeah. to, to dictate that. Like, yeah. Like, one of my motivations is recognition. Yeah. I know that I live off recognition. So I will much rather do something for free for someone yeah. just to have them turn around later and say, like, that was really good. Happy client. Sure. Yeah, yeah. happy client or to hit success, yeah. uh, having a portfolio, which can be client testimonials, it can be examples of work, it can just be having the logos up on the site. These are the people we worked with, yeah. right? That is cornerstone yeah. to any agency, okay. right? People wanna work with people who have worked with other people. Yeah. And it, it, it's a catch-22 when you're starting. So what you start with is just, is just anyone you can, and yeah. then you slowly kind of remove the bad examples and you get better examples and better examples and better examples. And, yeah. and year over year, you work your way up in budgets, you work your way up in experience, you work your way up in value, you, yeah. your portfolio grows. It's just, it's just time. It just takes time to do these things. Yeah. Everyone I look up to is 20 years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, I want to be them. But you know, they're, they're, they have 20 years more experience. Yeah. Nobody starts, I mean, sorry, maybe Gary Vee starts by literally saying like, I'm opening up my doors and here's my agency and look at how big and great we are. But even within the, the doors of their agency, 
there has to be that ramp up period. There mm -hmm. has to be the examples and other things. Mm -hmm. Most of us start and then year over year over year you grow. Uh, awesome. So the two main things I'm taking from it is for pricing, always ask for what their budget is, always give some pushback, never just go into something where, where you're in the dark and quoting on something oh, it kills without me. expectations. And, and, and don't, don't allow for generalities. Don't, we, don't do the like, oh, don't worry, we have budget. You know, and then right. we go yeah, and we quote something and then we go, okay, great, your budget, 30 grand. Whether it's 500 bucks or 5,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks, you have a general range and then yes. you quote against that. And then ask yourself the three questions, a filter through which picking projects, you have to have at, at least one, ideally two, and home run is three, mm -hmm. of I'm making good money from this. Mm -hmm. It's a testimonial piece for my business and it's a happy client. Yes. Today we're gonna to talk about how to stop second guessing your decisions. Okay. It's a big one. What's your advice? Where do we go? You want to ask a question there? How do we stop second guessing our decisions? <laughs> so first of all, as an entrepreneur, there's no rule book, right? You don't know what's expected of you. You don't know what to do. You don't know the right answer. You don't know the wrong answer. A lot of times you spend your time just hoping you're going the right way. Right. And so really what most of us have to rely on more than anything else is our gut. Okay. And so we're told not to really trust our gut. We're told, you know, I, I tend to, try to take counsel with lots of people and I might really strongly believe one thing but you know I'll rationalize it or, or someone will say something else but in my gut it's just going like no like this is the right answer and what I've learned is every time where where I'm saying this is the right way to do it yeah and I don't listen to that it kills me okay it kills me in the end so all that said there's a reason why you wanted to start your agency mm -hmm. there's a reason that the clients have chosen to work with you Right? There's a reason people are telling you you're good at your given craft. What you need to do is understand that, that the common denominator in that is you, and it's the innate way you, you react. It's the, the taste you have. It's the work you do. It's the things that you go, this is right and this is wrong. And so what I've learned is you have to be able to trust your gut. But most of us really suppress that. Most of us try to, try to rationalize it or try to, try to go against it just to be nice or just so that way more people will listen to you or more people will like you. Yeah. And so where do you start? You, start? you don't start with me, actually, or anything I have to say. You start with your book that you wrote. You, know, you start with your one word. And so understanding and being able to work through your one word helps you get to that core essence in my opinion, you, yeah. know, you wrote the book on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it gets you to your core, core essence yeah. of, of understanding what is this thing? How do I look at this? What am I pursuing? What am I going after? My one word is extraordinary. And so there are things that I choose to do without even realizing it because I'm always trying to lean to the extraordinary. I don't want things to be ordinary. Yeah. I don't want things to be average. Yeah. I don't want things to be, if you, if you can get it from us or get it from somewhere else, why would you pick us, right? I want them to be extraordinary. And so that motivates me and that, even when I don't know it. Yeah. So understanding that one word, mm -hmm. you know, in our office here, uh, one of our team's uh, one word, one of our team members' one word is passion. Okay. So understanding that he is always going to look at his work through the lens of, of having a passion for something, a drive for something, a desire for something, means he's gonna pour himself into the work, right? right? Someone else's one word in my in my office is art. It's a very strange one word we thought, but we realized it wasn't art like a, a picture on the wall. It was when things align so well that it that the only word to describe it is like magical. It's like it's like it, it's artistic yeah. how things can be so perfect and can align so well. And so when he's doing his work and pursuing his recommendations and trying to work on behalf of the client, he's looking for that. So someone is passion, someone is art, mine's extraordinary. They're all living in the same kind of world. And so I'm attracting uh, talent and, 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 and um, staff that align with my values. I'm attracting clients that align with my values because they want the extraordinary. Right. And so to answer the question, like, how do you trust your gut? Yeah. How do you make better decisions? Mm -hmm. It's actually understanding who you are, understanding why people like you, why people don't like you. A lot of people find me loud or abrasive or I don't think things through mm -hmm. long enough or or, uh, you know, because I, I try to come at everything, I think, with a, like a lot of heart. And some people think I could be more polished or more this or more that or whatever it is. Okay, cool. Some people don't like me. I can't change to make them like me. Yeah. But what I can do is embrace who I am, embrace my one word, how I approach things, and just do more of it. Be like, be more comfortable sharing it. Be more comfortable uh, uh, owning that. And you're going to attract more people. You're going to build a better culture. And you're going you're gonna to trust your decisions more. Because you know, like, like I take comfort in knowing that 
clients come to work with us because they like me. Okay. Right? They like what I have to say. They like what I have to do. They like me. The people I hire believe the same things I believe. So if people come to work with me because they like me, they're going to like the people who I have on my team. They're going to like our recommendations. We're going to deliver a project and they're going to like the project. Right? I take comfort in all of those things aligning because as I'm making decisions to hire someone, I'm like, no, no, they, they, they need to click in with us. I don't need to change for them. When I'm making decisions on, on pitching for clients, if I feel that connection, we just talked about pricing and would you do things for free? Yeah. If, I, if I feel like there's a great opportunity, this is a great client, it's like, sure, I'll do it for free. Of course I will because we share the same values and we have the same things. But that only comes from me understanding me and, and having the confidence to be able to do that. And so if you work through your one word, if you understand what makes you you, if you understand why people like you, then you can attract more of those clients, more of those people, and, and you can make decisions with more confidence. Right. So if I'm just getting started, I've got this big decision in front of me, should I take this path or this path? Is it for you, come back to what would the extraordinary version of Mark do or what would make this extraordinary and that helps shape your decision? Mm. I think I have learned to trust my gut more. Okay. So, so I know that I pursue things because I want them to be extraordinary. Yeah. And most of the time that helps me. Sometimes that gets me into trouble. Okay. All right. Sometimes I overinvest in projects that like I just spend more time and energy on stuff to make it extraordinary when no one asked for it to be extraordinary and okay. no one wants it to be extraordinary. And is that good? Like your client doesn't want extraordinary, but you want to. Well, it helps me realize that, that they're not a great client for us. Right. And so I get through the project and I go, why am I working so hard for this? Why do I care so much? Why do I want it to be so good? Why do I want these things? And I go, oh, but what's not your a good advice client there? Like, but so it's a bad client yeah. who doesn't respect and you thought they would be great and you learned along the way that these guys suck. Awesome. Do you, so the action you can take is you can say you fire the client. Right? Okay. Do you fire the client? Do you, you know, if what they want is, is a tenth of what you actually want to give them, do you, do you just mail in the project and give them what they want? Or do you add, even if it's at a loss to you, add it to make it extraordinary? Like how do you balance that decision? Yeah, so <laughs> you, you can only, I, I, would, I would still go all the way until the client is basically telling you to stop. But right? what if they've already told you to stop, but it's not what you want? Then you stop. You hand them the project, right? Like, well, like yeah, you can't. You, you but can, they'll say like, this is great. They love your vision for what you oh, can yeah. do, but. We, we, beg, we beg clients to let us take it further. Okay. We, like, so so we, we did this project with a client where, a, where it was missing a core component. We were shooting this video, mm -hmm. right? And we put it all together. The client likes it, but it's missing, it's missing a few shots of a people doing a few things. And there's this big hole in the project. Like it just doesn't make sense without it. Yeah. So we go back to the client and say, listen, client, we will show up Monday morning at this place. We will make all of the arrangements and we will do it for free. Okay. And they're like, mm, do we really need it? And we're like, we need it. We need it because the project doesn't make sense. We right. will do everything for you. We just need you to call this location and tell yeah. them we're coming by. Right. And they were like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't really want to make that call. I don't really want to do that. You know, I don't really want to go there. Like, I can't just show up. Like, we can't just break yeah, into yeah. a facility. Yeah, yeah. So, like, a little part of us dies. Yeah. And we tell the client, like, we are willing to do this. Just please let us make the project right. better. Well, because even though it's free, it's not free because they have to still have their team involved somehow. Even it's, not, you're not it's not free them. for them because there's this perceived thing of like, I don't really want to bug that person. Right, there's right? work. Right. There's their time even though you're not charging right. them for it. Yeah. So I can understand their point of view, right? They're like, that's oh, good enough. I, I had to, like, we, okay, we so have to what do you do? So a little part of you dies and then? A little part of us dies and we wrap up you, the project. You cancel it. And you give them what did they it, want. Did, did it make us money? Yeah. It's no longer an example piece. Right. Does the client still like us? Right. Right. Like you can't. Like, okay, so now it's, it's immediately not an example piece. Right. Right, so hopefully we made money. Would you the client still likes us. We've worked with them for many, many years. Would you then take it and, and tweak it to make it on your own? Yeah, we do that too. Even if you don't, like, because you want the portfolio piece yeah. and say, you know what, I'll eat the cost of the extra whatever, so I have a portfolio In piece. In this case, we didn't, but, but well, you we, may not, you we, like, we you do that all the time. You can't go to their facility. Yeah, yeah. You need them, right? Yeah, yeah. we, we do that all the time. Though. In cases where you don't, so I just, I, last week I emailed my client and I asked for four changes to be made after the project was delivered to yeah. fix a few things just so it would be at my standard on the website. And, and we are paying for that. And we will give the client the updated version after the fact. We'll be like, hey, we met our deadlines and everything's great, but we noticed a few little things we wanted to fix. Right. And we'll give them that, but I pay for that out of pocket. Right. 
it reminds me, there's a photographer who came and took a picture of me early, uh, and I just want a headshot for my website. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do fancy stuff and like made me look like, I, I feel like I had like devil eyes or something. It's just mm. really weird. That's what, that was his expression. But like, I don't really want to put that on my website as a profile. So he gave me what I wanted, but then he said, hey, do you mind if I put this up on my website as a portfolio piece? Mm. Evan being like devil eyes, like, yeah, go for it, man. Well, that's bold of you. I would have been like, no. Because <laughs> I, I would have trusted your gut and your gut says, oh, I don't really want people seeing me this way. I don't care about that. I just don't want to, I, I, I had a vision in mind for what I wanted and yeah. I got it. And then if you want to tweak something to then fit something else that serves you and I can be part of that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. We've, I mean, we've gone so far to submit, like there's a few things we submit awards for sometimes. Yeah. People think it's credible to get awards. Yeah. We'll submit our versions of stuff for awards, not the client version. Right. Right. And do you ask the client for permission or you just do it? <laughs> uh, we just do it. Right. Okay. I hear you. We've only been in trouble once with right. one client for, and it's only because they won the award. Okay. And when we said, great news. Right. You won the oh, award. You told them? Yeah, we gave them the award. Okay. We're like, you, or this project won okay, the award. And they're like, the and they're like, thanks. Just so next time you know, yeah. just so next time you know, can you ask us in advance? Right. And, and thank you so much that we won an award. That's great. But can oh, you ask okay. us in advance next okay. time? And no, we were, we're like, fine. oh my goodness, I didn't realize. Like, I, to be honest, I didn't even think. That right. who, who would get mad for winning an award? Right. And they didn't get upset. Right. But they were like, next time, please ask. Right. So right. That's happened once. One of the things I think you're really good at is pushing clients, whether it's, uh, and like you've gotten way better at this too, pushing them on what they need in their business, pushing mm. them on the limitations that they have. Mm. Like you recognize that you're the expert at this. You're trying to help them accomplish a goal. You guys are on this joint path. And because you're the expert, they should listen to you on this thing. You're good at pushing people to bigger budgets if you feel that it serves their need better. And so to this theme of making better decisions and learning to trust your gut. How do you, how, I think a lot of people have an idea and they would love to tell the client or ask the client, but they never do it. So how do you get the, the courage, I guess, to, to trust your gut? Yeah, you that hear way. that voice, you're like, yeah. ah, you know, I wish if I, if I had asked them this, yeah. and then you, you, they take away the yes for yeah. them, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so a, f a few things. When I was starting out my career, I felt like I had to have all the answers. Yeah. And now I have grown very comfortable with this being exploratory with clients. Okay. Right. So one, remove the idea that you should somehow have a crystal ball and know how things are going to turn out when mm. you don't. Right. You know, you just, you just, I can't predict. Now when clients say like, how's this going to be? I'm like, I don't know. Right. Right. I, I trust my process. I know that we're very good. I know we will get there working with a client, but, but I used to feel that somehow I had to be able to answer the question that couldn't be answered because that showed how smart I was. Yeah. And that's not. It's actually having the confidence to say, we will go through this together. The questions you are asking, I cannot answer. But trust me, it's going to be like a lot of fun to get there. Um, it's having excitement for the work you're doing, right? If you're not excited about the project, the opportunity, or the work, clients can get a sense of that. Um, it's having, you know, we are very transparent with budgets. We are very transparent. If clients ask any question at all, we answer the question. Um, we've only ever had one client ever say like, hey, let me see the budget breakdown. Yeah. Like the actual like hours and budget and hourly rate. One yeah. client. Yeah. We do like 100 to 140 projects a year for the last 12 years and we've had one client ask for that and we give it to them. Yeah. And they said, oh gosh, I wouldn't spend money this way. I said, okay, how would you like us to spend your money? But we're very open. Uh, and I, th I believe that the clients understand that. Like, like things cost money. Uh, they cost what they cost. If you want it to cost less, we'll pull stuff out until the project no longer works. Yeah. If you want the project to be better, and, and I, I say better because spending more money doesn't always make it better, but yeah. if you want to spend more budget, it's more resources for us, that's fantastic for everybody. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, it's if something is going to break the project, we are always looking for something that's going to break the project. Yeah. Right? Every project has, a, has like a red flag or, or a linchpin or one core component where if you like, if we do not do this yeah. really, really well, the project will fail. Right. And so we are actually just coming at projects and looking at, for, like trusting my gut, yeah. right? knowing how I would approach it and yeah. going, ah, this is the one thing that's going to make the project fail. Yeah. So, so for someone, like this could be on the macro, it could be on a big picture where like, you know, should I even take this client or they want me to do this website? But, Trust your gut. <laughs> no, no, okay, but so I, I'm thinking, like, should, they want me to do this website, but it's actually, it's great for me, but it's not even for them. Like, it's not the best thing that they should be doing. I wouldn't do it. 
or in a, in a little mini scenario where you know, you're shooting a video and you think there should be an extra light and so you pause and you say, hey, can we bring in an extra light? Yeah. Where you, you know it might be inconveniencing them but you know like this is, I'm trying to get the best video for you out. When, when you have an idea, whether it's a little tiny thing like that or something bigger and there's that th voice telling you, yeah. say, hey, I should ask. But, but it comes down to will it break the project? Right, so, so if you're shooting and you want an extra light because yeah. you really want to fill in yeah. this side of the face and whatnot, okay. but you are going to sacrifice something else to make that happen, you have a one hour window. You don't get any more time. So, so like, but like, if it will not break the project, if you can save it later, if you can edit around it, if you can fix it, if you can fix the code, if you can rewrite it, if you can take a photo better later, it's not cornerstone, then, then if you can, bring it up, but don't, don't lose sight of the, f the big picture of delivering the project. Sure. But if it's going to break the project, you have to say something. Okay, so that's it. So if, if, you're, if it's going to break the project, it's an important decision, you got the voice telling you I should say something, mm -hmm. but you're afraid, what do you tell yourself to get in there? Uh, There's lots of people, like they know yeah. this is the right thing, but they're, f they're just afraid to... What if, what if it's the wrong call? Like, I made, what if it's the wrong call and, and the client thinks I'm an idiot or, or I want to do this and it doesn't work and so yeah. they don't do it, but they feel like they should do it. How do you, so, what do you tell yourself? So there's a few things. If, you're, if your little voice in your head screaming at you in the moment yeah. and you're not comfortable speaking up, yeah. end the conversation by saying, I, I need to go away and talk to my team and think about this. Whether okay. you have a team or not, I need to go away and talk to my team and think about this. I'm, okay. I'm really not sure about okay. this one part of it. Okay. And then you go away and an hour, a day, two days later you come back okay. and you say, I talked to my team about this and we have some concerns. Okay. Or I talked to my team about this and we can totally do it this way, but I, I'm a little bit worried about this or this. So or, if you don't have an answer, don't fake an answer. No. S say I'm going to go think about it. And that's part of the process. I, yeah. used to, I used to think I needed all the answers all the time. Yeah. And now I've learned that yeah. that most people actually have to take time to explore things. Yeah. Right? You have to, you, you, I'm not sure about that and I don't know why. So let me just go away and think yeah. about this. Let me do yeah. some research. Let me look at what other people are doing. Yeah. Let me, let me talk to, um, let me talk to someone on your team. Okay. Can I talk to Bill and then maybe, and, and then okay. I will come back to you. But I'm, I'm a little bit worried about this. Okay. So if right? you don't have an answer, don't fake an answer. Ask some more time. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like you have to have the answer. Mm -hmm. What if you'd have the answer? Like you feel like this is the right thing, but you're just afraid. That's it. Well, how do you tell yourself? Because a lot of people have that, but they don't. They still don't say it. It's like, what do you tell yourself so that you say it? Do you want to be? <laughs> I don't like. I don't. I don't have that. I, I have that issue in, in like social media. I don't like to share things, and I should be more vulnerable, and I should okay. share more. But in a meeting, it's just like it's just. It's to me, it's black and white. It's common sense. It's right. Like so. Sure, so, but your common sense is not somebody else's common sense. So for right? me, I'll say if you're eighty-five percent sure, you're a hundred. Because you're never 100 percent sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, that, that's a great way to explain it then. Right. So yeah, if, you're, if, if, you're, if, if trusting your gut is, yeah. if that little inkling is there, yeah. do not suppress it. Do not say, "Oh, I hope things will work out later." Right. That's a red flag. Yeah. That's some. That's and and your you owe it to your client. Yeah. To speak up about something they're not aware of. Now, I I have seen a lot of creatives harp on an issue over and over and over again when the client is just saying no and they're not listening and they're yeah. and they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about the 10th time you're going back to the client. Yeah. Or you, we're not talking about arguing with a client to try and prove you're right and they're wrong. Right. This is just, if you're sitting in the meeting and someone's like, let's go left, and you're like, guys, I think we should go right, yeah. then, then you, need, you need to speak up. Okay. I love it. So, so takeaways I'm hearing are one, figure out your one word. It gives you a lot more clarity and confidence. That's, that's an easy one for me. But for yourself and your team, which was interesting, like the people who you work with, you want to know their one word so you can help them with what they're doing. Oh, yeah. You understand them better. Uh, two, when you work with clients, if, they, if you don't have an answer, don't fake one and just say you need some more time. And three, when you have that little voice saying that you got to step up, then practice listening to it and stepping mm -hmm. up. Understanding your market and your competition, mm -hmm. I think is a big thing mm -hmm. when people are getting started. I don't know what my market is. Well, how do I stack up against the people? I There's tons of people doing what I'm trying to do. What's your advice? So first of all, it makes sense to start where you live. Right? Local market. Local market. Okay. Right? You, you, yes, you can expand. I, I like to think, I want to create the type of company where someone across the country yeah. would want to work with me. They're going to fly over all those other companies. They're going to pass everyone else to come and work with me. Okay. That's the dream. Yep. But, but truthfully, you're going to start with places you can drive to, places yep. you can call, places you can work with. Right. 
So, so depending on the type of agency you run, some things have to happen local, some things don't. Okay. If you're shooting photography for a website or something, it has to happen local. Right. If you're shooting a video, it tends to be very local. Right. If you're doing online advertising, it can be anywhere. Right. Design can be anywhere. All these, all these other great things can be anywhere. Yeah. But what you want to start with is you want to look at your local market. And the number one uh, conversation I have with entrepreneurs who are trying to do what I do, mm -hmm. I have these calls once or twice a month. They're always saying, oh, man, I really love the business that you've built. How do I do what you do? And then I say, oh, right. where are you located? And they say, oh, um, Send them this I, video series now. I'm in New England. Yeah. Or uh, I'm in uh, North Dakota. Yeah. Or I'm in, where, pick, pick, pick any place, right? Like I'm in rural yeah. England. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's like, well, first of all, I'm just lucky that I was born in Toronto. Right. I'm lucky that Toronto happens to be the main economic hub of Canada. Right. Right. Like if you were born in Manhattan. Yeah. Pretty great place to run a business. A lot of competition. Yeah. But a lot of money. Yeah. So if you're thinking about your million dollar plus business yeah. and the companies you're modeling, consider your market and where you are at. If you okay. are dealing, uh, you know, if we're down in Miami or down in uh, Orlando, it's not a huge market. In fact, there's not like there's sure there's a lot of lawyers. There's <laughs> there's a lot of um, professionals, medical so how professionals. Much of your business is here local still. Around the area, driving distance. Oh gosh, most of it, um, like eighty percent, ninety-five percent of our business. So much of our business is based off relationships, right? Really, and I, and how can you build a relationship with someone if you're if you're pounding the phone, cold calling them, or so if I want to build a business only on local, yeah, how big a city do I need to be in? Well, it depends on the type of business you want to build, and okay. that's where I was going. You know, if you're if you're if you're comfortable, uh, if you're comfortable working with projects. Um, where it's mostly medical professionals uh, or lawyers or realtors or local, uh, like, like those local type of businesses who need tons of help. The window cleaner, right? right. The, the person who runs um, uh, a construction company. Right. It could be a $40 million construction company, right. but it's a construction company. If you love that business, if you love those clients, if you love that work, then those businesses are everywhere. If you want to run... Um, uh, the startup for a new vodka company or a new vodka drink, you're probably going to have to be in like California or New York or Toronto or Montreal or London or Paris or like, like if think about the types of companies you want to work with more so than the size right. of the projects. But Toronto right? has how many people? Uh, in the general area, we're about four to five million. We're the we're we're right it's we're right above city. Chicago. It's a big city, right? Yeah. So so so, so if I'm in a, if I'm in a city, we're that fourth has, largest in North America. If I have a city with with twenty five thousand people, like I'm probably not building a million dollar business off of doctors and dentists or lawyers, or am I? I mean, you'd be the king of that town, right? But or is, the queen but of doable, that town. Like, at some point, is there a minimum size or city? Like it needs to have a million people at least to. Be able to it, it depends, right? On the type of people you're going to go after. No, it depends on, on, the, on the companies that are there, right? So if you're, okay. in, if you're building a marketing agency, you're in B2B, right? You're a B2B company. You're selling yeah. to other businesses. So yeah. if it's a bedroom community with a million people and there's no industry, yeah. there's no companies, it yeah. doesn't matter how many people. You can't do it. If you're in a 50,000-person town and there's only one factory, you're yeah. not going to do it. Okay, if you're so in a small town with a lot of industry or a lot of companies, works. you're doing great. So if I want to build a million-dollar business and I'm in one of those sleepy communities... Do start, I have to move? You, you have to move yeah. or you have to start thinking non-local. Okay. Right? So this is the challenge. How do you build businesses? How do you, so, so my wife's aunt is, um, is a really successful entrepreneur out of uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Okay. It's, it's not a huge market, but she decided, or, or based on her experience, she's very heavily in, uh, involved in technology and IT as it relates to law practices. Okay. She went on the speaking tour. She speaks a lot. She is the she's as far as I'm aware the best at what she does yeah. for that one type of company. And so when she goes around, she has clients from all around America. Right, right. And they're more than comfortable to fly over everyone else yeah. to work with her. Right, right. So she didn't have to move. She didn't have to move her business. She didn't have to do any of those things because she's willing to to go out there, build the relationships, build the the, the type of company she wants to build. She doesn't physically move, but she has to travel a lot for her work. People have to meet you. Right. Right. So, so, okay, so if, I, if I think, okay, my, my, if I'm in a big city, awesome, I'm, I'm set. If I'm in a small city or town... A lot of competition there. So that's with the second half of your right, market well, so we get and there, competition. We get there. I, yeah, yeah, I hear you. If, I, if I'm in a tiny little community, but I want to build a million dollar plus business, and I recognize, okay, it's not going to happen in this community, do I start here and then move, or do I just move to that new bigger city that I'm going to build my business in? 
it it depends on so so starting here and then moving if if you're comfortable being the big fish in the tiny pond and you can learn make your mistakes you know now like again video one i think it was or video two said like get started right get started right away yep so don't let this be the thing that holds you back but it's getting started moving to the city like if i want to my goal i want to build a million dollar plus business like you did mark mm -hmm. in in the, in this space is it better to start in my sleepy town and get a couple clients and get some experience and then trying to transition that to a bigger city? Or is it like, I need to move to the next biggest city in my province or state and then just start up there? I, I would start in my town. And then grow. Knowing that this is just, this is, that these clients aren't my real clients, that my work is probably not that transferable. Right, um, okay. But it's, but this, this start right away. And so if it's gonna take you four months to move, if but, what if, no, but what if I move right away? Like, okay, I made a decision. Well, who, I'm gonna who lives their lives where they're like, I'm moving tomorrow to a place that I've never been to something I don't know. And how do yeah, you but, find your region? Yeah, and, but who lives their lives and I'm going to start a business? Like everybody, everybody hems and haws and like right. takes six months to start a business. So, so, but if you're saying just start, what's my best start? Your best wanna, start is, is start local. Right. But because I'm going to wait four months to move, like what if I said I would move right away? What's my best start? That's a lot of change for one person to do. So, so in this so situation, <laughs> someone's like, I'm, I'm quitting my job, yeah. I'm starting a company, I'm moving into a place I don't know for businesses I don't know to, to a totally new geography or town. Right. I mean, if you're moving an hour away, move. Okay. Move. You don't even need but to move though, you can just- Drive, commute, do whatever commute. you need to do, yeah, that's right? Not moving, right? If you're, if you're, yeah, if you're in New England and you're halfway between like New York and Boston, sell yeah. into both places, right? Like just say, okay, Monday and Tuesday, I'm gonna be in this city and I'm gonna spend the night at a whatever, at a Airbnb or something, and I'm gonna hit my meetings and I'm gonna do my thing. Like, you gotta hustle, you gotta drive, you gotta be willing to go. So this is, if you're in, uh, you know, if you're, if you're six hours from right. the local area, that's a pretty big move. Well, whether you're even physically moving or not, whether, so if you're an hour and a half out of a big town, mm -hmm. whether you decide to go into that big town and trying to sell there, or into your own local town and sell where you are, mm -hmm. even though it's not that far commute, it's still not exactly where you are, What's the better play? Like if I want to hit a million as fast as possible, that's my goal, I want to be the next Mark Drager, what's my fastest path? Is it build here, get some revenue, get some experience, easier connections, or is it like right away, these guys don't get me, they don't get my art, like in the big city they have bigger budgets and go straight there. What's my best path? If you have relationships where you're at, start right away with the plan to move. If, if the clients are waiting, if the people are waiting, build yeah. your portfolio, start right away. Okay. If, if, it's, if it's starting from zero in both areas and you have the ability to move right away, move right away. Okay, right. cool. Everything's, gonna, everything's based on relationships. Sure. So, so your relationships in your local little town or wherever you might be will take you so far. Right. And that's fine, you're gonna learn some stuff. Most people will turn their nose down at it if it's not big enough budget, if it's not good enough, if it's not this, if it's not that. But you, again, right. you're gonna start and you're gonna move your way up. So if you don't know anyone, if you have no work in your town, if there's a sleepy little town with this or that, or um, you know, I used to talk to a business owner from, from uh, New Zealand who was like, if I could sell the sheep, I'd yeah. be a millionaire. Right. But all we have is sheep, I can't sell the sheep. And right. I don't know, I've never been to New Zealand, I don't think that's the case, but that was his attitude. So you gotta move. Right. Or, or and also on, on longer lines of relationship, you can also say, hey, do you know anybody in this city? Mm -hmm. Like if you're an hour and oh, a half yeah, outside great. of New York, like it, great, you may have connections here, but like, hey, do you know anybody in New York who might be able to use me or, or yeah. whatever the next closest big city is yeah. to you? And even now, like we're not in Toronto. No, like how my, long, office, my office is in Markham. From here to downtown Toronto is how 14 long? 14 kilometers. It takes anywhere from half an hour with no traffic to an hour and 10 with traffic. Right. I don't, I don't live in Toronto either. And you live? I live 55 kilometers from here. Which so takes miles is like 30 miles. From your house to Toronto, downtown Toronto is what? <laughs> hey. hey, Lucas, hey. you just brought lunch. Lunch, bring <laughs> Lunch, it in. bring it in. Well, we just gotta drop. eat, entrepreneurs need to eat. Thanks, okay. Lucas. Yeah, thanks, man. Leave in it in, house. leave it in, leave it in. <laughs> yeah, all of it, <laughs> including that and this. From, from your house to, to, mar to, the to office? downtown Toronto is what? Oh, uh, an hour. Yeah, an hour and a half, two hours if it's a Friday afternoon. Right, so I think there's a lot of people, like they may not be in the city, but they're around yeah. the city, so you don't have to go and move to the city, but you're focused on building up business around here. You would take a local business, but you're not focused on mechanics and doctors and whatever out in Oshawa. No. Oshawa, but, you're in Oshawa? Yeah, I'm in Oshawa. Right. But if, you know, so, so this really only applies for the people who are like, who are like three, four, five hours right. from someplace, in, in my opinion. Right. If if you really want to be, if you have your dream to be in that place and go and do that thing, like ultimately you have to go where the money is. If you want to build a million dollar business, 
You don't want to do that yep. on 10,000 projects, right? Right. You want to do that on, like, like I said, you know, we have, we're a million plus. Yeah. So we do 80, 90, 100, 120, 130 projects a year. Yeah. Still a lot of projects. Yeah. Some of them are very, very small. Four or $500 is a project. Some of them are very large. $225,000 is a project. Yeah. Right. That gets one project code, one invoice. Yeah. So, but you know, we're doing 90, 100, 120 of those a year. So y you want to be able to not have to have right. 10,000 clients because you can't give them attention and do all those other things. Talking about competition. So in terms of competition, what you want to do is be able to look twofold. In your little sleepy town, you could totally crush it, right? You could be the best, you could be the best very, very quickly, mm -hmm. right? But you're going to hit a ceiling where unless if you have your eyes set on being the best in America, the best in Canada, the best in Europe, the best in the world, wherever it is, chances are those competition are not going to push you to be the best that you can be, even when you're starting. So what I recommend is look at the people that you really want to be like, right? They're not... The people who are bigger than you are not your competition. So understand that, right? You're going to look at them and you're going to go, we're just as good as them. We could do what they would do if people would just give us a chance, but they're not giving you a chance. Okay. So they're not your competition. The people who kind of do what you do, but don't do what you do, they're not your competition either. Okay. The people who are smaller than you are not your competition. Okay. Right? Your competition are the people, the companies, or even the indifference or the lack of budget of the people that you want to work with why are they not working with you? Okay. That's your competition, right? I really want to work with this type of company. If they are going to the huge agency, you're, never going to, you're not going to win that, so you have to work your way into that, right? So that's how you look at the competition. You say, okay, I need to turn myself into this type of business to compete against those people and be better than them. If it's, a, if it's um, if the type of company you want to work with do not seem to have budget, your competition isn't any other company. Your competition is, is a lack of budget. Mm -hmm. So are you going to win that? Are you going to be able to sell into it? Mm -hmm. How do you convince people to have budget when they didn't think they had budget? Right. So, so I started and people get caught up in looking at the different companies. They Google their area. They look at who's up and they go, oh, okay, let's do a SWOT analysis. Let's look at our strengths and our weaknesses and our opportunities and our tactics or whatever SWOT stands for. And, and uh, I think it's that. Strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, opportunities. I don't know what the T is. It might be tactics. tactics. Tactics feels off, but I don't know. It might be. You might be right. Anyway, whatever. I haven't threats. Done Threats. Sure it's threats. I haven't done a SWAT yeah. in 12 years. First Don't year do I a SWAT because it doesn't help, according but, to Mark Jager. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, but the point is, you look at what everyone's doing, and that's great. Yeah. But your business is going to be built off of relationships and your portfolio. right? And so if I keep going up against company down the street for every single pitch, mm -hmm. well, they're my competition. Mm -hmm. But if I don't, then they're not. right? Like, Don't get caught up in looking at all these companies if you're not going up against them. If they're much, much bigger than you, say, how can I get there because I want their clients. I yep. want to steal their clients. If they're smaller than you, are they stealing my clients? Are they nipping at my toes? So, so how do you set, because our last part about finding the market, Yeah. so it's great to have a market, but there might be a lot of competition there too. So maybe you want to move. So how do you assess, how do you assess which market to get into with what competition is there? Do you, do you care about the competition? Do you just disrespect the competition? You feel you can do it better? Uh, if there's no competition, <laughs> is that a good thing? We did, like, we did that for a long time when we started. So, so, so how do you, how do you, how, what's your advice? Like, I'm looking at a market, great, I need to go where the money is. Mm -hmm. How much does the competition that's in that market matter for me to have success as an agency? It only matters if it's bumping up against you. Okay. That's it. But it, but it right? will, right? I mean, if you're bidding on projects. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. There's all, I mean, even if the competition is... I, I, I have to be honest. I think, if I think back over the years... Yeah. I couldn't give you a percentage. Let's say 80% okay. of the projects that, that we pitch or we win or whatever, okay. they, they never get multiple quotes. So did you then convince them that they need an agency to work with? No, they're looking for someone. And they only had one person to reach out to? They found us or they're working with us a second time because, again, the business is building. Right. Or they've moved somewhere else. Or they're maybe it is a referral. Right. And there are lots of people who go, oh, I've got to go out and get two or three quotes. Or we're talking to a few other companies. Right. And that's fine. Um, but, but most people, in fact, have re like reach out to a few people and people don't respond. Okay. They don't respond like sure. They, like they literally don't pick up the phone and call back yep. within an hour or two. Right? right. Like you have to you have to call back within so, an hour. So or two. am I not like, concerned about my competition unless I'm actually bumping up against competition? Like don't yeah, overthink. Don't it. waste your time. Just find the market. Fine. Yeah. And if you do good work, you're gonna win. Yeah. And don't worry about the competition yeah. unless you're getting crushed. Right. Like we, there's a whole bunch of services yeah. where I see 
like there's a whole bunch of services we offer where we only have eight or ten clients. Okay. And I go, oh, these all these other companies are doing work somewhere else. But if a hundred people knocked on my door, could I handle a hundred people? Right. right. There's a lot of work out there. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity out there. So am I wasting my time by worrying about what other people are doing if it's disservicing the people right in front of me? Right. Right. Now, if you have nothing to do, if you have one project but you can handle ten, yeah. If you're losing all the time, right? Like you keep going up, you're bumping up against people, and you keep losing. Yeah. Then you gotta you gotta figure your stuff out, right? You gotta get better. You you have to give it time. You have to expand. You have to do all those things. But if you're sitting at your computer at eleven o'clock at night, and you're googling everyone, and you're feeling depressed because these people are big and we're really small and they're really established and we don't have anything, and no no no, like you're wasting your time. They're not your competition. For services that you offer. Would you rather be first to a new market and, and bring and educate and talk to the clients and get be the first one? Or would you rather go to an existing market and beat out local competition? Hmm. Uh, I'm not a, personally an early adopter in any aspect of my life. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I like showing up to the party late and being better than everyone else. Yeah, that's, I'm the same that's, way. That's, virgin, that up, no. that's the virgin model. Is it? Okay. Yeah, I guess. It's yeah. 100%. It's to go into a market that does it really poor and do it better than everyone else. Yeah. Okay, so key takeaways, you have to go where the money is. You've got to be in a market that is big enough to support you. Uh, and if you're in a small market, look for connections to the bigger one, but also like start here and scale that to get to where you want to go. And then for competition, don't worry about the competition unless you're actually bumping up against them. Pretty much. Cool. We're talking about how to find the ideal customer for your business. Mm -hmm. Mark, what's your advice? So first, now that you've worked through all those other things we talked about, you understand who you are, you understand the value drive, you understand your market, you understand your competition and everything else. It starts with knowing the cert. <laughs> it sounds so boring, doesn't That's it? So funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listing this all off and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's so boring. It, it, it's like, it's really not rocket science. Okay. It's what type of companies do you want to work with? Okay. What value can you drive for them? Okay. And who is the person in the company who's actually going to make the decision? Okay, so how do I figure out what type of company? Well, it's based on your motivations and your skills. Okay. Right? Like we used the example last time. If you, if you love working with the local contractor, the local construction owner, okay. like, like, you know, you just love tools. And so you love working with people who work with tools. Okay. Then there's an affinity there, right? You're going to have great relationships, great conversations, and then you work with those people. Okay. If you want to do something that's really stylized, that has a lot of eyes on it, then you're going to want to work with a big brand or a B2C company or maybe a startup that's doing an app and you're like, mm. okay, I want to get into this market or this thing. But, but that's all like your motivations, the type of company you want to work with because okay. you bring passion and you bring skill and what have you. But the real thing is to understand who in that company you're trying to sell to, okay. who has the budget, yeah. who's making the decision, who has the final word on it, and you need to meet those people. Okay. So a lot of us, when we're starting, we overlook things like internal communications. Right? We think marketing. Okay. Right? Marketing means that I have to help this business with advertising. Right. But there are lots of companies who need to be better at, at winning over culture and communicating to their staff and speaking to clients who are already clients like through inside sales. Okay. And so this is a great way to get in through HR, okay. to get in through uh, internal communications, if it's a publicly traded company, through shareholder relations. Okay. And you can get into these places and you can start to still do good work. Okay. Maybe a little square or conservative, but you can start to do good work. You can win over the clients because there's less people going after them. Okay. And then when you do really great work there, they refer you into marketing, they refer you into communications, they refer you to outbound things. Okay. So, but you can only do that if you know the type of company you want to go after and you can know how you are going to get in front of them. Like, where are they? Are, are they at networking events? Are they uh, online? Are they reading certain things? Are they listening to certain podcasts? Okay. Like, where are they? Where are these people? Okay. Are you going to knock on their door? Yep. And then knowing that if you are going to go to HR communications, what do they care about? If you're going to marketing, what do they care about? If you're going to the business owner, the entrepreneur, yeah. what does she or he care about? Right? And, and so the customer is important to know who are these people, the type of company and the role. But I keep saying, what do they care about? Yeah. Right? Like, like yeah. the value you drive them, what they want to do, what they want to accomplish. So, okay. So, so from the top, if I'm looking at trying to find an ideal customer, do I start around shared interest? Is that what I'm hearing you say? I, I've always found that in my in my selling style, yeah. which is to like try to be friends with my clients, to, okay. to care a lot about what they have to do. I find that I have a lot of shared interest with a lot of people. 
So, right. so the two ways could be either one, like I love chainsaws and so I want to go work with a chainsaw still, company. Still, great chainsaw company. Right, or, 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 or some other company, right? Yeah, Husqvarna, I'm not a big fan of them, but <laughs> no, if you're watching, I totally will work with you. <laughs> so, but that's one way, or I love playing hockey and there's right. this, there's, there's and you're sitting on the bench and the with person, somebody who does it, right? Yeah, or your kids are playing hockey. Your but their business soccer. may not be one that I super care about. Maybe, maybe you just like that person. Right. Okay. So either yeah. or. I find it's very helpful for me to actually be interested in the in the industry. In the business. Okay. So yeah. So like so like as a company, we have tended for whatever reason. Yeah. Like like I like cars. I like mechanics. I like all those things. Yeah. So every chance we get to work with automotive. Yeah. I like. Yeah. I enjoy it. Okay. Now my, maybe my team doesn't. Yeah. I like I don't know. Yeah. I love entrepreneurs. So we love working with uh, you know the term we use is like owner managed or entrepreneurial or mission driven. Yeah. Like cuz these companies like they have a purpose. They they, they hum. Yeah. There's like an yeah. energy. I love it. Uh, okay. I like hey. working with nonprofits. What's she eating? Hey. You are eating something that you're not supposed to eat. Oh, I don't know. I'm so used to my dog eating everything. Okay, you're going to stay here now. Okay, so so if I want to get into automotive, let's use that. I want to get into automotive. I want to be the agency for automotive. I'm not going to just join a bunch of hockey teams and hope that somebody on my bench works at automotive. No. Right? Or I don't that, know. Okay. If you, just, if you just put it out there, you'd be surprised. Okay. Great. So, 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 so I want to get into think automotive. About, think What's about, my strategy? Okay. So do you want to work for a dealer? Think about how many dealers, think about how many people work in dealerships. Okay. Right. And if, you know, I go to church and I happen to be, like I go to church with a guy who's responsible for detailing and cleaning every Nissan vehicle at a Nissan dealership. Okay. Nissan's owned by Infinity. Yeah. I can get into that dealership. They're usually dealer networks. Once you get into one, you can get into two. Once you get into two, you can get into 10. Then once Nissan's doing it, suddenly Volkswagen, because they own multiple brands. Yeah. So if I, that's my version of automotive, I, I, like I really want to work with the service centers. I really want to work with the dealers. I really want to be part of that business. Yeah. That can be automotive. Yeah. It, automotive though is also aftermarket. It's also technology. It's also tires. It's also uh, uh, parts centers. It's all like, if you like being around car people, yeah. is it is it custom motorcycle shop? That to me is still in that world. Is okay. it is it car restoration? Yeah. Right. So if if you are looking for these people, they are everywhere. Okay. And yeah, they're they're at maybe at your church or friends of friends. Uh, they're maybe on Facebook, but the other thing you can do is most of these places have dealer associations. Yeah. Um, if you have, if you really want to get into like, if you want to be the king of automotive. Maybe take a trip and happen to go down to Vegas when the big thing is. You don't have to have a booth. You don't have to do those things and walk the floor. You know, spend the six or seven hundred bucks to try and get there. Really cheap. You know, do it cheap when you're there and yeah. walk the floor and meet some people and hand out a few cards or what have you. But uh, but if you think about automotive as everything related to aftermarket, everything related to uh, auto sports, so any kind of um, auto racing. Uh, if you think about uh, MX, like uh, dirt biking, yeah. or motorcycles, or anything related to that, because I love mechanics and I can get into it. You think about uh, air, uh, air, airplanes. Yeah. You can think about rockets. Like to me, it all lives in the same world. I think it's super cool. These people are everywhere, and one relationship turns into two, turns into three, turns into four. So, w if I'm hearing you right, it's figuring out what you have a passion on that you would love to be in that world of, and now you're going to bring your marketing agency knowledge too. You're going to start by looking at who your current contacts are, who are in that space, but then maybe even saying to your friends, "Hey, I'm 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 looking for people in the automotive space." For sure, I want to connect with someone. Because when somebody says they want a marketing agency, so this is the big so vague, broad. This is the big vague thing, right? Yeah. You know, like I like working with nonprofits and charities, okay? Um, because I, I like the good work that they do, right? I'm attracted to the mission. I like entrepreneurs. Yeah. I'm attracted to the mission. Yeah. I like uh, automotive because it interests me. I yeah. like custom furniture making. I think okay. that's cool. Like I think a lot of working with your hands and stuff's cool. We happen to work with a lot of financial institutions, a lot of insurance companies, a lot of banks, a lot of pension plans, a lot of unions. I'm not super passionate about that, but but we're good at it, okay. and we have a lot of context there, and we do a lot of good work there, and that kind of comes from we used to, and we still are, but we used to be more passionate about the work than about the industry we were in. So that's another way to look right. at it. Like like if you love design, and you love the, the creative process of design, 
I don't know if you really care who you're working with if you have the opportunity to do great design. Okay. Right? Now, you might want to work with like a, like a drink company, or you might want to work with a, I mean, gosh, like there's great, think about American Standard. They make toilets and sinks. Okay. The level of design is impeccable. Okay. Right? Like, like there's great design in every industry. So if you love design, then try to find the people who love design too. If you love a certain industry, try to find the people who have, who, who are in the same industry as you. If you love horseback riding, and you're going to go hang out at the stables with other people who happen to have money and are into horseback riding. They own businesses. Maybe maybe your shared connection is like Jim right. or, or Barbara who happens to ride horses. And like, like it, it's, it, there's no right way to go about this. You just have to find what works for you and start doing it. Right. And, and don't question that you're doing it wrong. Right? Like sure. that's, that's the big thing. So, so as I hear you, so once you identify ideally the market, if you're going after a market, then it's one, using your current connections and your current resources and the people you know and telling people at your church or hockey team or whatever. And then two, trying to be involved in the organizations and the events to be around like-minded people. That's a great way. And, and then when you have that, con this is all to get to the conversation. Right. right. Once you have the conversation, think about what they want and need. Okay. So if you're speaking with a business owner, they probably care about revenue, they care about profitability, they care about lead generation. Right? They want to make money. Yeah. Uh, if you're speaking to someone in communications, they care probably about not being misunderstood, about following process, mm -hmm. uh, about um, speaking to the, the rational side of things, but also maybe some emotion. If you're speaking to someone in marketing, they care about the brand, they care about the feeling, they care about probably still lead generation and other things. If you're speaking to someone in HR, they care about people. Right? How do these people know this? How do they understand it? How do we do health and safety? How do we recruit people? How do we keep people? So there are all these different departments, and they have all these different needs, and it's always the same system no matter what. But you want to tweak what you're saying and, and, and how you're approaching it. And, and you can ask them. If you don't know, you don't want to, don't, don't say, what is keeping you up at night? Right. Right? Like, don't say, like, oh, what are you worried about? Okay. Ask them what areas of their business need help. Okay. Right? If you're speaking to someone in HR, and they say, we really need help. Like we're losing a lot of staff. Turnover is really hard. There's a problem that a marketing company, a really smart agency, just better communications. That, you can help them with that, right? You can help them with that challenge by recruiting better people, by helping them fix their culture, by helping them draft better copy to recruit better people, mm -hmm. by um, potentially communicating more internally. Like it might be just like go have more company barbecues. Well, what role is that of a marketing agency to tell someone to have better company barbecues? But if that's the problem they're having, and even if I'm not an event company, and even if I'm not going to make any money off of it, if that's the answer, then I should give them that answer, because then they can try it, and then they will trust me, and then I will be a partner, and then I can help them with other areas of the business. Right. I've got an expression called the chief goal officer. Oh, I like that. That you have to be the chief goal officer. If you understand their goals, then you know how you can help them. Yeah. This is your first part of understanding what are their goals. Be the chief goal officer first. I don't even know though if most people know how to articulate their goals. Because the goal is the answer. And what they know is the problem. And I do this with my team okay, too. Okay, let's talk about it. Because you're not going to say, hey, what are your goals and how can I help? Like, that's not a great start. start. challenges. Okay, so, so what, challenges. like three questions. How do, I get to, how do I get to understand somebody's goals with somebody who's in my market? It could be an mm -hmm. ideal customer for me. Mm -hmm. What am I asking them? So this isn't my question. And I don't even know if I really use this because I always change my wording depending okay. who I'm talking to, but here's the, the essence of it. Yeah. I didn't invent this. I heard this from someone else who's really smart. What is something that should be easy but isn't? Okay. In your business. In your business. Yeah. But you can ask this as a manager. You can ask this to anyone, right? Like, okay. What's something that should just be like really, really easy to do? Okay. But, but isn't. it isn't. Yeah. Right? That's something that can be fixed. Okay. That's one. Um, is something holding you back from being the company that you should be. Okay. Again, I don't ask that, but I ask a bunch of questions for it. I say like, what do you stand for? And, okay. and, and what are you fighting for? And what are you fighting against? And okay. what do you believe in? And like, I ask all these general questions. But that's, but that's what you're trying to get it, to. Okay. The essence of it is, is really like, what's holding you back from being the company you should be? Okay. Not the company you want to be. That's aspirational and mm -hmm. that's fine. Not the company you are today. Mm -hmm. like the, the type of company you need to be, the type of company you should be. Mm -hmm. What's holding you back? Right? There's a challenge there. And mm -hmm. that might be, Marketing, communications, staffing, operations, lack of funds, lack of money. It could be anything, but something yeah. is there. It's always there. Yeah. I think the third question, and I usually coach my clients on this, okay. is that change is hard. Okay. And so the question I have, ask my contacts, is, 
is the company actually willing to and ready to do what change. they have to do to change? Right? And you, because if I'm working with a business owner, mm -hmm. then it's actually their team or their company or their circumstance that's holding them back. It's yeah. going to be really hard to change. Yeah. Do you want to lead this? Do you want to spend the next 18 months or a year or whatever it is doing it? Yeah. And if it's someone mid-level or, or kind of junior, it's like, is, is, are the people above you really willing to actually do this? Mm -hmm. We work with so many people who are like on fire. Right. They're like, oh, I can't wait to come in there and change the company. And then, and they have all these big ambitious plans and we quote all these things out and we plan all these things and they're like, mm, it didn't get approved or it never went up or, or it gets watered down because no one really actually wants to change. Okay. I like to work with companies that want to change. Yeah. Right? Because I can help them. Like, please just let me help you do what, like, let me do what I do and I'm going to help you. And if I'm not helping you, then you're, you're not going to work with me. You're going to fire me. Right. So just let me come in and help you, please. Please let me help you. That's what we do most of the time. So uh, I know it sounds funny, like I'm like begging, but, but really you need to be courageous. You need to be willing to make change. You really, really need to work at it. So will they do that? And whatever the other two questions were. <laughs> no, no, I like it. I like it. I, I'm thinking about the process and there's one piece that feels missing, um, which I wanted to ask you about. So, you know, from the beginning, I'm thinking about what I love, what industries I love, the type of people I want to work with. So if yeah. I pick automotive, awesome. My next step is I'm going to ask everybody in my network, see if anybody's involved in automotive somehow, or ask mm -hmm. if they know anybody in automotive. Yep. And I'm going to go to any local automotive events yeah. and try to participate so I'm known. When I have a conversation, I'm asking those three questions to learn more about them once I've found the ideal. Yeah, there's, there's, there is a middle step there that right. you are missing, which is, which is okay, so, so if I'm asking the people what their challenges are, yeah. I, I'm assume, I, they have invited me in to talk about business. Right. Right now, what if they haven't invited me to talk exactly. about business? What if, what if the person in my church says, yeah, you should really talk to Frank. Yeah. I'm gonna connect the two of you guys, you have a great conversation. Then, but even bringing it up that this is what I do, like you find a person in your church, in your community who is in that industry. Yeah, we in should grab automotive. coffee, let's grab coffee and talk. So, so, so th how yeah. does that work? I, I say, let's grab coffee, we should talk. But, here's, but why? What, you why? say, here's what I do? Oh, I'm super interested in what you guys are doing. Okay. I have a few questions I'd really love to run by you. And are you talking about what your business is? No, I'm saying these, these are the excuses. Okay. Not excuses, these are the reasons. So, okay. So yeah, there has to be a reason for someone to give you time. So uh, I'm, I'm a new company, I'm really interested in learning more about what you do, and, I, and, I, and I'm hoping, please, if you will, will you give me an hour of your time so I can ask you some questions? Okay. So if that's the case, then you go in and you don't sell them, you just ask them really smart questions. And, okay. And this has happened to me, by the end they're like, wow. I haven't even thought of those things. That's great. We should, we should totally get together, and that's fine. Or, um, hey, we should grab coffee because, so for me, because I'm very relationship based. I'm like, you seem like the type of person that I actually want to be friends with. Okay. I tell people that. Like, okay. You ever met someone where you're like, this person's pretty cool. Yeah. Like, I would just like to learn more about them. So just go meet that person. Right. I had someone who used to work in my company who said, you know, I don't have to be friends with my clients. I have enough friends. I need to be a professional to them. Okay. I'm like, uh, not, not, not my here. company, not, not a Fanta, yeah. Yeah. right? And, and yeah, there's a place for being professional, a place for being friends, but when I was able to actually flip them around, like six months of me coaching and coaching and coaching, they're like, wow, okay, no, there is a value. Like, I was totally wrong before. There is a value to caring about people and getting to know people and, and spending time with them and all of those things. Okay, so, so if you know that Susan is at your church, but you don't really know her, you kind of know her face, but she's in... The automotive business and could be a potential client for I you. Walk up to Susan and be like, "Hi, Susan." So, like at church, or at the I'd end of like, church, I'd, you're gonna find her. Yeah, and I'd be like, I'd be like, I just found out that you're in automotive. Yeah, I think that's really, really cool. What did what? I'm sorry for ambushing you. What yeah. do you do? Right. Oh, cool. You're senior VP of blah 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 or yeah. whatever. Yeah. I'm like, that's that's really cool. This is gonna come out of nowhere. Can I take you out for coffee? Okay. And I know this seems weird, but I'm a new company. I'm getting into this area. I'm super passionate about this stuff. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Can I take you out for a cup of coffee and ask you a few questions? Okay. Right? Nobody says no to that. Right. Like, if they say no to that, then I would be like, okay, I don't want to, this probably isn't someone I want to work with. That's awkward. And right. Sure. But you're in church. And, right. Or you're at the hockey game. Or you're, or you're wherever you are. Or it's Aunt Betty happens to be the nephew of someone who's this or that. Right. Like, that's how life works. I love it. I think the thing, the only thing is now maybe running through people's minds are, I don't want to say I'm a new company. I don't want to, I want to show oh, that I'm, I'm totally serious. Totally embrace would, it. No, totally right? embrace it. Yes, but the, explain why. Explain oh, okay. why. So I agree, I, but... Yeah, when I started my company, I, I, I was six months in and I was about to go bankrupt. And I hired a business coach. And the greatest thing that my business coach ever said to me, and it was just a bit of a confidence boost, he's like, 
you're a really likable guy, Mark. I was like, I am? Like, I, I kind of think I'm a jerk, and I'm very black and white, and I'm very blunt. And he's like, no, like, you're like, you're likable. Like, like people like you. They yeah. want to help you. They want to work with you. And he said, go take this client that you just got. So at the time, we got referred from a friend into Canada's largest bank. One tiny person at one tiny part of Canada's largest bank, and we only got it because of a friend, gave it to me, like a gift. He knew we were going bankrupt. And he's like, here, here's something for you. My coach said, take that person out for lunch and explain your situation. Explain, you just started your company, that you have a wife, that you have a kid who's four months old, you really just want to help people out. Is there any way that they could see to refer you to anyone else in the company? And so I was like, oh God, I was super nervous. I called them up shaking, I asked them out for lunch. And they're like, yeah, we can totally grab lunch together. And then I drive all the, it's like an hour and a half away. I drive all the way there. We're going out for this like Swiss chalet lunch, you know. Uh, anyway, so I take them out for lunch and I, and I basically, it's very awkward. We go through the lunch meeting and finally I say, listen, the reason I want to take you out, new company, right? This is, this is my journey. This is what I want to do with people. I would really appreciate if you refer me to anyone else. And I said, oh, well, we'll see what we can do and this and that. And they were being very polite. But okay. like two weeks later, they refer me to someone named Greg Skinner, who was kind of downtown Toronto. Got it. And that person was my client for 10 years. But so you also asked for a referral in that meeting, if they know anybody, but if you know that they could do it themselves. They were already my client, right? Like I'd done one really tiny okay. thing for them. And, but, but I went out for lunch. I admitted where I was. I yeah. didn't try to pretend to be anyone else I was. I still, I still had to go pitch that right. new person. I still had to win the business. But would you do that in the first meeting with Susan at your church? Would oh, you yeah, ask totally. for a referral? Totally. Okay, so, so if I got it, you find shared interest, what you love doing, you love cars, awesome. Now I'm going to ask everybody in my local network who knows somebody who's in cars or is in cars. And I'm going to go to every local event around cars to be a part of the community sure. and expose myself. Two, if I find somebody, I'm going to ask them for coffee. I'm going to say I'm a new business. I want to pick their brain. You're not trying to pitch anything. You're just trying to get to know them better because I want to mm -hmm. work with friends. Mm -hmm. At the meeting, I'm going to ask the three questions that we went over. We'll show them on screen because I forgot them, but they were great. <laughs> and, then at the end, really and then at the end, I'm asking if... My business sounds like anything interesting. Is there somebody you know who might be a fit for what I'm doing? If, if you're comfortable, you can always do that after. Okay. Right? Like if you're starting a relationship. It's okay. not like a, a, a window. Right? So afterwards, you can send me emails. Say, thank you so much for the conversation. I really thought about it. It was really meaningful to me. Yeah. And oh, I always have goodness, a follow-up. You, you totally changed my stuff. By the way, if you could see clear to refer anyone to me, it would mean right. so much to me. Got it. Right? Like, like, so always have a follow-up. Thank like, you. Right. What 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 is our issue with asking people? I don't like to ask people for stuff. Yeah. I don't want to be bothersome to them. Yeah. So I had to get over that. Yeah. I didn't. I also didn't used to want to ask for the business. Yeah. Eventually, you have to say, "Are we getting started on this project, or how much will it cost? Or right. Like, or how much is your budget? Or like, like we have to get comfortable asking. How these much questions. will you ask in this in the meeting itself versus the thank you email after? Um, it depends on the way the conversation is going. Okay. But I typically, I I typically show up to these meetings and don't talk at all. And I just listen, listen, Great. listen, and, and then I walk out. No, I, and then I walk out, and I'm like, I lost my opportunity, right? Like someone okay. who was a little bit more direct would have said, perfect, now let's talk business. And you're the direct guy. I know, I know. And, and I, I... So let's imagine how hard it is for people watching to, I know. to then do it. But I watched someone do it, mm -hmm. and let me just, like, I know, I know we're going really long here, but yeah. I, I watched someone do it once where I was sitting in a meeting with them, and we were having this coffee, and, yeah. and, and literally the person said... And this is this is someone who's working for me. She goes, "We're a really good company. We're just shifting into this stuff, and we're still figuring some stuff out. Yeah. But we really care. Right. And everybody who's working with us right now is yeah. someone we care so much about because yeah. we cannot afford to lose them. Okay. And so I want to know in the next few months how we can work together more. Okay. Uh, what have you got coming up? Okay. And I was like, and they're like, oh, um, well, I guess we have these three or four things. Should right. we talk? She's like, yeah, let's talk. Okay. And so. And, and that stuck with me. I, I would never had the guts right. to do that. And but you know now I'm willing to say like, what's what's the worst thing they're going to say? Like we are in. If I'm asking the person out to ask them some questions, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Right. Right. But you might in the thank you email but afterwards. I might in the thank you email, okay. or I might even phone them up afterwards and say, I'm sorry, I might be taking too much of your time. Okay. What I like to do is I like to share my intentions. Okay. Right? We just want to help people. Okay. Why won't more clients in your industry right. let us help them? Right. We think that the industry is really broken and weird. Right. Why are people wasting so much money? Right. Right? And like I, I ask them these questions that get them thinking. Right. And it may apply to them or it may not. Yeah. Um, 
And then by the end, if, if we're comfortable for follow-up coffee, I might say, do you think I'd need a referral to someone in your company? Do you think you would be the right person to talk to about these types of things if we were to maybe okay. work together? Um, do, do you think your company has budget for the type of stuff that I'm talking about? Because I, I don't really know if they do. Right. These are all still very soft questions. Right. Right. And ultimately, it's okay to ask them. Yeah. Uh, if you ask over the line and you're being too direct yeah. um, for selfish reasons, you'll kind of turn them off, but, but that's still not the end of the world. Okay. Like I, I always think it's better to just ask. Cool. Right? Just ask. I love it. If someone says no, it's like no, right? Like if if you're asking for the right reasons, right. Like, just ask. And and a soft is in the email after, and if and if you work your way up to it in the meeting itself. Yeah. For sure. How to build a brand that gets noticed. What do you think? Mm -hmm. What do you got for us? So here's here's the 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 good thing and the bad thing. Okay. Of being a marketing agency. Yeah. Your marketing agency. Yeah. You should be, be good. you should well, the bad thing is it has to be really, really, really good. Right. So you're super being judged high on. standards. Right. You're being judged on it. Yeah. Uh, we find that weight I find that weight crushing. Like, right. like uh, I'd rather not do something right. than do it badly. Right. You can't let that stop you. Right. The good thing is you're a marketing agency, so you should be good at this, right? right. Like if you're a creative agency, then your brand should be really, really creative. Right. And because that's what you're good at. Right. And if you're a, a website company, you should have a great website, yeah. great portfolio of work. Uh, if you're, uh, you know, an analytics or lead marketing type company, then your site can be a little bit more basic. But but I would think that you'd be leveraging really great analytics and lead generation, and you'd be killing it and yeah. crushing it in terms of people coming in. Yeah. So, uh, really, when you're building your brand for yourself, the biggest struggle that most of us face is uh, actually like what to grab onto. Okay. So. So for me, and, and maybe others face this as well uh, in marketing, mm -hmm. is is most of my um, ideas and recommendations are based off of these little like seeds or core truths or little little like the, you can look at something and there can be all these different ideas you can have. Okay. But you need like something to grab onto. Okay. It's like really hard to explain. I can hear a story, you know, if I'm if I'm I don't know, I'm talking to an applesauce company, right? I don't get really very passionate or interested in applesauce. Okay. But if I hear a story about the fact that the recipe uh, comes from a grandma that's this and this and this, that would be that like, you know, the grandma used to make it for the grandchild and the grandchild grew up to start this applesauce company. Mm -hmm. That would be, it seems obvious, but that would be like one of these like, oh, we can grab onto multi-generational. We can okay. grab onto grandma's eyes. We can but grab that's onto a client, these, right? right? But when you're working on yourself, right. you can do anything. Right. It's it, like when you're working with a client, you're learning about them. You're taking this in. You're seeing it from the outside, mm -hmm. and all these little ideas are coming up. And you're going, you're going. We can do, we can do this. We can do this. We, this is super fun because you're exploring it. Right. And when it's yourself, it's really hard. Right. It's really hard to see it from the outside. It's really hard to know what's good enough and what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and and to be honest, most most really great advertising agencies, most really great marketing agencies, creative agencies have terrible marketing themselves. Hmm. And so what we do, and what a lot of people so do, is, wait, is that a good thing? It's a bad thing. Does it matter? It's a terrible thing. But if they're all great, like, who cares? No. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> but if like all the no, great marketing it's... agencies have crappy marketing themselves, does it matter then? Like, they've had tons of success. No, it's good for you because you can have better marketing and still their market share. The reason that they do it is because it's doesn't based matter, on, though. Or like, it's based whatever. on relationships. Or, or your brand is the work, not what you do internally. I'm just, I'm just asking. So where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not where I want to take it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I like your yeah, answer. Go for it. Okay, I, you're the expert. Where I'm going with this is okay. So you've done your one word. Yeah. You know what makes you you. Yeah. You know your essence. You know what clients value because we know our market. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, like we're All working, we're working down. Yeah, we're yeah, working yeah, down a great. funnel here. It. Right. So by the time you've hit this point, yeah. you need to create a brand for okay. yourself okay. that represents the feeling and the essence of all of those things. Okay. So if I'm, uh, if, if I, my one word is, like my wife's one word is strength or strong, mm -hmm. right? So if she were the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. no matter what she was going into, mm -hmm. that brand should speak to strength mm -hmm. or it should be strong. She could, she could start a, a kid's daycare, but we are going to create the strongest, most well-rounded children possible. Right. Right. right? So, right. so on the agency side, yeah. if she was creating a, an agency, Right, strength yeah. and, and being strong, strong-minded, strong-willed, yeah. pushing people. Uh, I start to think about different color tones that that falls into. They better be strong colors, not soft colors. Okay. They better have strong uh, uh, fonts, not weak fonts. They right. better have strong photography, not weak photography. It starts to play into it. The way you explain the work, your portfolio, what you do. Yeah. 
better be strong. Mine's extraordinary. Yours can be passion. It can be art. It can be believe. It can be anything you want, right? But, but that is the core of your brand because right. your brand is really nothing more than um, a visualization of what you want people to feel about you. The way you answer the phone is part of your brand. Right. Because that's nothing more than how you want people to perceive you and feel about you. The, the way that your documents look, right? Like I, it really bothers me. Like we have a certain header on our documents yeah. that have project number, it has date, it has version history, it looks super clean. Okay. Right? Like it's important to me that art, like if you write, send over a Word document right. to my team, it bothers me when it doesn't fit into that. Because it's extraordinary. Yeah, but it's mostly like like everything should be clean enough that you would want to release it to the world, mm -hmm. right? Like it shouldn't have formatting issues. It, like that bothers me. It maybe doesn't bother someone else. Yeah. But to me, being precise and being effective and efficient is part of being extraordinary. Okay. Right. And so and so, if you're sloppy, yeah, you can be the best marketer or uh, person in the world, but you're not going to be sloppy at Fanta. Like, right. Like that really. Bothers right. me. That really bothers me. So, so that also has to feed into our brand. We have we have like a no nonsense brand. Okay. We have a black and white, like like literally our, our brand colors are like black, white, and orange. Like right. it's just like it's a black and white brand. Me too. Hey, I like my shade of orange better. F seven three zero. F seven three zero zero zero. You better. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's it's that. Yeah, you can like you can go into all of those things. But building your own brand is worth it. Yeah. And it's worth it because. If you're one of the big agencies, you're literally relying on your reputation and your name, right? If you're, like if we're thinking about really big agencies, if you're McCann, right, you're, re you're relying, yeah, on your work, of course, but they, they've been around for 40 or 50 years, right? If, if, um, if you're Vanner Media, Vanner, Vander Media, Vanner Media? Vanner Media, Vanner Media, yeah, Vanner yeah, Media Gary, yeah. right? Like, like, I'm sure, I, I, I've been on this website, we've looked at it. It's a good website, Okay. right? It's a good website, of course it is. But from a brand point of view, it's him. Right, like, like, sure. he, like his his attitude, his essence, his yeah. signature yeah. falls into the brand. The For black, sure. the white, the colors, mm -hmm. everything about it is the brand. I don't even think they have a portfolio. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I don't even think they have a portfolio. And what work. do you think about personal brand versus logo? Like we're building around the logo, not about the face. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't. Everybody has their own way to arrive at the work that they do. So for Ari, right. right, like, help me make a decision. Yeah. I'm starting. Do I make it about me? and have my face and my signature mm -hmm. and a, a close-up, or do I make it about the logo and the company that I'm trying to build? What, so, when do I pick each one? Yeah, so if you want to build a million dollar company, it's built around you, but it isn't you. Okay, but right. should I, so are you saying to build a million dollar company it has to be around the logo and I'm a piece of it, but it's not my face and I have people under me? Well, brand, the, you're, you're building your brand is more than your logo, right? So, so it's, it's, from the, so think about your Instagram profile. Is, mm -hmm. it, is it your face or is it your logo? Let's try to think of like a personal brand versus a business brand. I don't know if I have an answer for you because I even struggle with that. Right? Well, like I can turn to you and say yeah. like, like I, I run our Fanta account as my personal account because to me, I'm not just at work. I'm right. all over the place and I did that for a long time and I really right. enjoyed doing it. And then my team came to me and they're like, that should be your personal thing. Why are you sharing? Why do clients care what your kids are doing? And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but this is me, right? Fanta is me. And Fanta is all of you too. But, but this, is, this account is my eyes of how I come to work and how I live my life and the stuff that we do. And then they were like, no, no, you shouldn't do that. That's wrong. Okay. And so I stopped for maybe a year. And then I went back to them and I was like, that's stupid. I don't, I don't, <laughs> care. I don't care what the rules are, right? I enjoy, I, I don't want to start a Mark Drager Instagram account. Okay. I have no interest in doing that. Okay. Right. Fanta's me. I'm Fanta. Yeah, I have a team. Yeah, we do lots of stuff. Maybe clients like me. Like, don't follow me if you don't like what I'm sharing. That. Right. Right. To me, and, I and am so one like of the you're same. Past, you're past a million dollars in revenue now. You've got how many people on your team? Uh, Just for context. Like Twelve full-time people. Twelve full-time people, and then freelancers on different projects. Yeah, lots of freelancers. Um, and the the Instagram account is called Life at Fanta. Yep. There's your logo as a thing. Yeah. But then you're posting a mix of your personal stuff and projects and Thought leadership is what you've got some stuff in too, right? Of like, here's what happened, but here's your take on it. Yeah, and that's 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 what I've I've played with a little bit, but I wish that I had more courage to do. Okay, and, I, and that's what I'm gonna do. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do more. Like like really, I I just treated it however I wanted, and I loved it. Yeah, and everybody seemed to like it. Someone told me I was breaking the rules, and it's not appropriate, and a, and a real company wouldn't do that. Okay, and now I'm like, well, I don't really care, and that is. Um, 
that is what having the brand's about. Like that attitude of, of that story of yeah. being like, this feels right to me, I'm gonna do it anyway, even yeah. if it breaks the rules. Yeah. That's what your brand should be. So, well, logo or face. a rule breaking brand. Like you wanna work with ambitious companies, mm -hmm. so you need to reflect that. Mm -hmm. if, if, your, if your core value was like, you know, something boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Steadfast. Yeah, exactly, stead right? Then, then, then steadfast security. Not, right. Then, then it's a different. Yeah. Right. So. But like, so, so, like in that example, like, if if you're if you're a design company. Yeah. Right. And I keep going back to design because there are a lot of really design-based marketing agencies. Yeah. And there's a lot of lead generation-based marketing agencies or whatever it is. But if you're yeah. a design company, and you're trying to decide what you do with your with your Instagram, it's like share whatever inspires you. Right? Share whatever's happening. Share your work. Share whatever you can share. But, but just have it come from the heart. Have it come from your one word. Have it come from a place of truth. And if people like it, great. And if they don't, that's fine too. Right? Like that's, that's what marketing is about. It's not about trying to trick people into buying something that they don't want or right. liking something that they don't want. It's literally sharing the best version or essence of what is true to you. So when you're building your brand as your agency, if you are a one-person shop, yeah. maybe you want, may not want to represent yourself as a one-person shop. Maybe you're going to be afraid okay. because it'll turn off really big clients, okay. but it'll endear you to smaller clients. Right. Right. And so, so you know, are you trying to fake it till you make it? Or are you just going to say, like, this is me and this is what I do and this is what I believe? Like, there's this line, I, I don't know who said it, and I've heard it on a podcast, but, like, specificity is the heart of narrative. Okay. It's like a really academic... Saying. Yeah, I like it. But what I noticed it most is in comedy. So in comedy, I'll watch a comedian. Let's say that we have a, a black, you know, an African American, a black female Canadian, right? Um, a comedian, not Canadian, a comedian. Canadian comedian. <laughs> yeah, we have an African American <laughs> female comedian who's talking about her very personal things. Yeah. Right. In marketing, yeah, we would say, oh well, oh, well, she's only going to identify with only people who are like her will identify with her story. Okay. But the truth is, she's really funny and she's really meaningful, and I really like where she's going and I really like what she's doing because she's being so true and specific to her okay. voice and her tone. Yeah. Right. If we can be more like that. Yeah. As brands and not say, oh. Uh, we want to we want to approach we want to approach the, the the Southeast Asian market. Yeah. Oh, we really want to go after this market and do this and make these people look like these people. They have to be represented. Yeah. But real stories of real people that are very specific are endearing to a lot of people, right? And it turns off the people that it needs to turn off. That is marketing. That is branding. That's what if you can do for your company. The agencies who go like, like, hot stuff. Yeah. They're doing good work, but mostly they're courageous enough to do this stuff. I wish I did it earlier. I wish I did it now. <laughs> <laughs> Better. How to go from one million to five million? That's the next. That's the next. That's the next series. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to track back now to what we've talked about. I mean, it starts with understanding this is a per, this is your company has to be based off of what you stand for. So figuring out your one word and then bringing that to the business as opposed to just figuring out a one word for the business. But like, it's a personal thing that you're bringing to the company. Um, I'm, I, f I forgot the second point because we dove into personal branding versus the other one, but there was another key piece that we we're talking about. <laughs> 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 if you're even more lost than I am in, in the like, because I'm so focused on what you're saying that I, I lost the track of where we're going. Like first is find your, find your brand, find your one word, uh, bring that to the work that you're bring creating. To everything you do. Oh, this is what I'm, everything at least, Everything that you do is a great philosophy, but from a branding, how I see it as everything that touches the customer. So your letterhead, the customer experience, your website. Everything, everything that touches the customer is Right, marketing. but like how you sit in your office may not touch the customer, but you may want an extraordinary chair. And you should have an extraordinary chair. So it's like there's a lifestyle and a, and a operations, like how you deal with your website developer may not touch the client, but it's important for the business, more like how to build it up, ops versus mm -hmm. branding. So like figure out, at least how I'm thinking about it, one, figure out what your one word is, and then how you bring that to every single piece of anything that touches the customer. I think customer facing, you have to touch it. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. The last thing quickly I just want to touch on is how much, in our last video we talked about customers, finding who the customer is, and creating uh, a way to attract customers to us. But it's a very like I'm out there doing the work, meeting people yeah. approach. Yeah, and we're going to get into lead generation and marketing. Okay, so but this is more topics. like branding. I want my branding. I want my brand to stand out. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing thought leadership content. 
So, and so here's where you're struggling with it. There's yeah. a difference between the tactics that you do and the brand that you have. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, where do you think yeah. people, there's a difference between, okay, I'm just gonna have a great brand and I'm gonna pay attention to my stationery, my Instagram and my website and it's, it's a, yes, it's a breathing thing that will evolve, but it's a one-time thing as opposed to like thought leadership that is an ongoing you telling narrative. But thought leadership could be a cornerstone to your brand or not. It could be. So how do you make the decision versus what we talked about last video? Those are tactics. Right. So, but the tactics of... We'll you know, see that in the next video. Oh, we're doing the next video. <laughs> I'm not spoiling the answer here, guys. This is a 10-part series. Hold on. Let me Mark's look. looking at his notes. Let me look. Hold on. We'll pause. Yeah. This uh, is all Wall State. Keep all this yeah, in. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Next is uh, lead generation and okay. sales. We're going to get into tactics. We're ending this video here. This Actually, is a no. Ten uh, purpose value. Actually, no. <laughs> Hold on. So we combined a bunch of them. So I had brand broken into brand, brand, and here. brand. Okay. And we, we've combined everything into... What's the next video? You're killing me, man. I'm killing you. We need to have like awkward silence music or something. Happening. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just go to tactics next. And then... And What's then tactics? Well, what you said, where you're always like, oh, that's tactics and that's next. Great. <laughs> what, what is yawning. I'm yawning? <laughs> She's bored. She doesn't want to build a marketing agency, but for people who want to build a market, this is, this is the, Mark Drager built Fanta, I keep wanting to say Fanta Media, built Fanta to a million plus in revenue mm -hmm. with 12 people full time, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of freelancers around him. And, and I want to suck out of his brain how he did it to help you guys do it too. If you want to build a marketing agency, this is a series to pay attention to. We're on episode seven. You should have said that seven episodes Go ago. Go watch all the other ones. Today we're talking about marketing tactics. What do we need to know about marketing tactics? Mark Drager. Are you going to ask a question? That's my question. <laughs> That's not a question. Okay, great. We talked for 15 minutes about what we're going to talk about and you lead with, we're going to talk about this. Go. Marketing tactics. That's not okay, a question. Okay, listen, we ended our last video on this huge cliffhanger, insane cliffhanger, talking about... <laughs> Should somebody focus on the uh, branding and the thought leadership and like I'm going to be an expert and I'm going to, I'm going to bring people to me, I'm going to be a magnet or am I going to focus on going out and being a networker and using my connections and going one to one to meeting people. Right. And so yet yeah, both can work, right? right? But like how do I make the decision as to, there's tons of marketing tactics. Of course. There, there's Anything books can everywhere, work. right? Anything can work. So like, and it all can work and that's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an entrepreneur, how do I then find a tactic that will work for me so I can build a million dollar business? Of course. Mark Drager. Okay. So what you want to start with yeah. is understanding the two or three ways people will be introduced to you. Okay. Okay. So, so you need to try and get yourself in front of people who don't know you and well, okay, so let's start with the hardest thing. People okay. who don't know you yeah. and don't even know that they need you. Okay, do right. I even want Ooh. those people? That's really hard, right? That's, do I want to convince? That's advertising. Well, we talked back before about I don't know how to. I don't know how to close those being, people. Being early personally. to a market versus. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying. I'm saying it's it's the hardest. Okay. Okay. So maybe I should rephrase. I said you want to. Okay. That that's what exists. Okay. People who don't know you and don't even know they need you is hard. People who don't know you, but are looking for your services, is pretty easy. Okay. People who do know you and are looking for your services like that's the best. Heck. Right. That's amazing. Right. Right. So, so when, when you start when you start to you. think of you about this way. Yeah. Uh, you can start to think about the, the, the tactics that feel right to you. Okay. If you are an introvert yeah. who does not like to talk to people, yeah. who will never stand up on stage, yeah. never be a public speaker, not very fond of social media, there's still a place for you in this world. Like, you, know, you, can, you can still grow a great agency, but, you, but, but being the thought leader who is standing up on stage and speaking panels uh -huh. is, not gonna help, is not gonna help you. You're not gonna be good at it. You're gonna hate it. Okay. Right? So, so once we understand these three levels, right, the people who don't know you, don't know they need you, you can reach them through like an awareness campaign, mm -hmm. through an interruptive Facebook campaign. Uh, you can go and speak at, um, at an industry, if you're good at this, you can go speak at an industry, um, you know, a, a conference for doctors where you can teach them about new business. And like, oh, I never even thought of that. Right. Uh, the next level down, the people who don't know you but are searching for your businesses. Right? This is where the tactics of getting in front of these people. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Are mm -hmm. they going to Google? Do you want to do AdWords or pay-per-click and drive them to a landing page and introduce you? It's a pretty good way to generate leads and, okay. and kind of get into that. Do you want to do uh, um, uh, a, a Facebook campaign where you're actually advertising? It's a pretty good way to get in front of those people. Or are there more roundabout ways? You know, are, are they people who, who are interested in marketing and learning about marketing but don't know that they need a marketer yet? And so is 
being a YouTuber something that's going to connect you? Is, right. is doing uh, social media posts something that's going to connect you? Is um, starting or being a, a connected to your the American Marketing Association and being involved with that chapter something right. that's going to get you there? Is it sponsoring events or awards? Right. So there's a million ways. But like, how do I ways. know what's right for me? It's it's based on you and your skill set and what you're good at. Does my personality type? I know you're huge into Myers Briggs and you have everybody on your team mm -hmm. do Myers Briggs. Mm -hmm. And you're a what? I'm an INTP. What am I? Uh, you emailed it to me. I was an E. No, you're not an E. You're I was an, an E. I. You're an E? No, I was an E. I, I was what you thought I was, but I was an E, not an I. INTJ? Really? Does that make sense? Oh, an ENTJ? Yeah. Maybe. E is emotional. I'm more emotional than... than no, it's extroverted. That's what oh, e and I stands no, for. Oh, No, that's not true. I'm, right. I'm I. Yeah. There was one, though, that you weren't sure on about the emotional caring versus... Okay, whatever. We'll figure it out. We'll flash on the screen. Here it is. This is what I am. Good. Okay. Don't worry about it. Forget it. Forget it. We'll you don't want to do this now? You want to do this live care. on camera? No, no. I want to I get to the... Like, it doesn't matter what I am. No, no, but I have it right here. I have it right here. <laughs> Hold on. Wait for it. You I ready? F. Oh, you sent, you sent me an image. And the image isn't in the email. You, and I wrote okay, back, you know wow, that's amazing. I guess I, I N it. and I J, I but I thought it. you were a T. This is for you oh. now, Mark. This you're an INF, you're an INFJ. Perfect. I don't even know what that means anymore. It doesn't matter. INFJ. So you love, you love personality tests, especially that one. Mm -hmm. Everybody on your team does it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's what you recommend for entrepreneurs, like find your one word and find your Myers-Briggs. So does that apply to, does your personality type, like I'm, I'm trying to give value to the people watching. Yeah. There's so a million marketing. No, 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 I know. <laughs> Nothing you're not doing. <laughs> how, how do we figure it out? Like, what, what am I, besides, yeah. like, what are you good at? Okay, but, like, is there, is, there, is there something else? Can I do a personality test? And then because I'm this, I'm more geared towards doing this kind of work? Like you said, introverts shouldn't go on stage. You know, I'm an introvert, so I'm I, an introvert I go on stage. Well, and I go but, on stage. And but is there anything I can learn? Maybe, maybe I'm paddling down the wrong creek. I'm just wondering if there's anything. <laughs> Wow, you know, hitting, that's the shawarma. I'm, I'm, I'm just like bringing up all hot garbage. I don't know. I'm, I just want to find a way for, for people who are struggling mm -hmm. to identify the thing because they may not even know what they could be good at. Like maybe, maybe Facebook ads is the thing, but they haven't tried it yet. And so they'll say, I'm not good at this. But like, what do you need to be good at Facebook ads? You need to be very analytical. So you want to you play to your strengths. Right. So how do I find my strengths? So is it personality like, type is like, going to tell me or it's not going to tell me? Yeah, personality will, okay. certainly. But where we started with the type of company that you want to build. Back to episode one. Right, back to episode one. Yeah. Right, like if, if you are a creative agency. Yeah. Then, and, and when we said, hey, when you're building your brand, it better be a creative brand. Yeah. You want to find marketing uh, channels that allow you to express your creativity. Right, so sponsoring an event. Yeah. Where you can actually put your work up on display in front of everyone. And right. wow people with how creative it is. Right. Is a great tactic. Yeah. Right. But it's not if you're an analytical company. Right. If you're an analytical company, you could help that event invite more people. But unless you stand up and do a case study and you're like, oh, guys, let's stop the event. Right. We improved, you know, we improved uh, ticket sales by 8%. People right. are going to be like, who cares? Right. Right. So that's not going to be a great thing. But, but uh, business uh, intelligence and analytics, I, I, spoke, I spoke at a government business intelligence analytics conference. Right where one of my clients insisted that I come and help right, them do it. I remember it. that. I, remember I was that. so out of my depth. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was police departments talking about this and this, and I came from Marcom, and I'm like, okay, well, this is government, and it's all very technical. But I was still introduced to eight, eight or ten people. I mean, there were 100 yeah. people sitting at the conference, little local thing put on by the business bureau or whatever. But so, so if, if you are uh, leaning more towards lead gen and analytics, yeah. then you're going to want to go towards case studies. You're going to want to um, maybe try and do like a sponsored post. You're maybe going to want to do blogging. You're going to maybe want to just allow, create uh, areas and go to places where people can put that work on display. If you're more creative, yeah. uh, maybe you want to do Behance, maybe you want to do Pinterest, maybe you want to do What's the Instagram. First one? Behance. Behance? Behance is a, it's a community, it's a portfolio community where designers can go and put, oh, okay. put stuff. Okay. Lots of people go there to, to source yeah, the work. companies for yeah, work, yeah, okay. specifically. Uh, maybe you want to go to your local art gallery and you want to actually print you actually want to print your work and you want to put it up and you want to yeah. do a pop-up. Let's try that. I want, I want to double down on this what? personality test thing. We're going to double down. <laughs> sure. Let's see how it works. Myers-Briggs? Let's go letter. There's, a, there's either or for each letter, right? Yeah. 
Let's go letter by letter. <laughs> Great. So you're assuming that I have it like really well memorized. Absolutely. Here. You got I it. I love it. I love it. We'll go okay. letter by letter yeah, and give me my best marketing tactic for each letter. <laughs> That's the goal that people want, Mark. So so the first one is E or I. <laughs> right? You can't do this. Introvert, extrovert, right? Sure. It's the first one. So yeah. if I'm an introvert, what's what's one thing I should be looking at as a marketing tactic? Okay, let's start. We'll go extrovert first. I think what you said on the last episode or two episodes ago is 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 one of the best things to do. If you're an extrovert, talk to everybody oh, in your talk. There you go. Be if you're, if you're an extrovert, okay, I, that yeah. I can do. Okay, that I can do. Okay. If if you're an extrovert, yep. and you love people, yep. so being an extrovert yep. means that not like I'm an introvert, you're an introvert. Yeah. We've just been talking for hours. Yeah. Doesn't mean we can't talk. It means okay, but that I'm an extrovert. What do I do? What do I do? What do if I do? If you're an extrovert, you love people, you yep. feed off people, spend more time with people. What's my marketing tactic? What's your marketing tactic? Um, uh, have have five coffees a week. Yeah. And after each one, sign a thank you note and mail it to them. I took that from my friend Nikki Pet. Okay. She next. does it all the time. Great. She Love is Nikki. the queen of literally making me. Okay. Now I want that for every letter. What's what am I doing as an I? Uh, if you're an introvert, then uh, I would. Well, you're an introvert. So what do you do? I know, but. But it's not what do I do now, it's what did I, what did I do? Sure. What did I do? Um, Pay-per-click. AdWords to a landing page. Okay. People phone you. Okay. I don't mind answering the phone. I don't Got mind it. talking to people when they're asking me questions. They're I coming love to you. It. Come to me. Nice. Ask me the questions. I don't really, I'm not very good at going out to you. Nice. Right? Two gold tactics down. What's next? What's the next letter? What's the next letter? Yeah. It's, uh, it's N or O. Okay. Uh, no, it's N or S. One okay. is observant and one is intuitive. Great. What am I doing? <laughs> Dude, like this is this is becoming increasingly impossible now. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. I'm I'm observant or I'm what? Intuitive. Intuitive. Yeah. So what is an what is an observant person? What should they be doing? <laughs> this is becoming the literally the Myers Briggs video. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but hold you, on, hold like, on. You're a big believer in Myers Briggs. I am. I am, but but Myers Briggs isn't usually parsed out to each individual component because well, it, let's because we need to add more value to Myers Briggs. Yeah, but it's a collection of four. I so know. if you're an I and an S, it's different than if you're an I. But and here's an the S. thing: you're giving them four different strategies, and and there's going to be some I, lineup. I know, but there are like 64 different combinations. I right? got it. So. But but like in these eight strategies, we're gonna they're gonna find something that they can use. Okay, so hold on. So as me. we're talking through these eight gold strategies that are coming out of Mark Drager's mouth, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Just think, all of them can work. What do you, because at the top of this whole thing, Mark said, you got to do the thing that feels right. You got to do the thing that's for you. Mm -hmm. But finding that is difficult. So by going through the personality test, we're going to get eight different strategies. See which one feels the most right to you and double down on that strategy instead of trying to do all eight. I don't want you to do all eight. Pick the one out of the eight that feels the most, right? We're, we're building up a lot of anticipation for these eight so that we get gold. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Observant, or I bought you a lot of time on that one. Yeah. Observant versus intuitive, right? Yeah. So someone's observant. What, so what should they do for marketing to build their brand? So I use 16personalities.com, yeah. which is a free service. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And, and that's where I recommend it to you. So based yeah. on some of their stuff, what they're saying is that, um, is that energy is the next level. So intuitive versus observant. Okay. So that's the second scale. Okay. And what that allows for. <laughs> <laughs> You're asking me to like break this down. Well, the other four scales determine how you interact with the world, make okay. decisions, schedule your activities, or okay. react to external feedback. Yeah. The energy scale actually determines how you see the world okay. and what kind of information you focus on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but let's pause. Like, sure. this is important because no, don't pause the camera. Okay. Pa pause because a lot of people will go and look at a Myers Briggs yep. or read it or do it, and then they have no idea what to do. Like, what do I do with that information? I guess so. I mean, if you do the test properly, it gives you your strengths, weaknesses, your relationships. Yeah, yeah okay, great. How do I market my business? Right. I'm trying to build a million dollar agency. I just spent 20 minutes answering these questions and get this thousand page report. What am I supposed to do to market my company? Play to your strengths. But that's, so tell me. This, but, this but is what it is. Myers Briggs is. <laughs> this but, video is good. But people go. ask, people do these personality tests. Yeah. And then they don't know what to do from there. The tactics, like, break it down, my next step. What am I supposed to do? So if I'm observant, it's how I see the world. What do I what do I do with that? I, I, how I does that help I don't me? think we can pursue this the whole way because when I mean play, play to your strengths, yeah. What I mean is, well, let's brainstorm. If it's not perfect, 
Sure. You know I, a thousand I, just to, I just have tactics. to know. I just have to know much better, like how these things actually boil down to the really individual. So let's do indicator. it. This is on the spot. Okay. okay. Uh, Observant is how is how you see the world. Yeah, it's how you absorb information. Hold on. How you absorb information. So yeah. so part of marketing is being able to absorb information, right? Before you act on it. He's reading. Yeah, I just have. We should like speed this part up. This is going to take a while to go through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but think a lot. Even if it's not perfect, we need eight strategies. I, I know everyone you're looking for. This is super abstract. Uh, okay. If it, listen, if it's abstract, it's not helpful. Like Myers Briggs needs to lose the second letter. If it's not helping me, Wait, it, it <laughs> it's not helpful because the way you're trying to take the tool isn't helpful. What I'm what I'm what I mean by play, what you're trying to do is you're trying to parse out each individual letter and yeah. then have a trait related to it. Exactly. Right. I need actionable information. If you're gonna that's, give me inf if you give me information, make it actionable. I wasn't the one who suggested we dig into Myers Briggs. No, I did, you were the I one did, who took but it there. Like, now I'm pissed at Myers Briggs. Like, make it actionable. You want to help people. Here's, here's where it's actionable. So for example, if you are, so you are uh, an INFJ. I don't want to go through 34 different I'm not case asking examples. you to. What I'm saying is what I mean play to your strengths is you have certain things that you're better and weaker at. Right? Yes, but I want to know you what have, my marketing tactic should be. I want to make this tactical. I want to make this helpful for people. These are people who are looking to start a marketing agency and yeah. a marketing company. But there's a lot of ways to market and grow it. So how do I figure out? There's a lot of marketing strategies. Everybody says, you know, look at what you're good at. I, don't even, I mean, I don't even know what I'm good at yet. I'm still trying to figure stuff out. How do I figure out based on any kind of knowledge that I have, what marketing tactic I should, are you just saying try everything once? No. So, and just see what so, sticks? So here's, here's how I break it down. Then. This is it. The new Myers-Briggs, better than Myers-Briggs. <laughs> has nothing to do with Myers-Briggs. Because it's better. And here's... <laughs> has nothing to do with Myers-Briggs. Okay, good. How do you break it down? At the end of the day, we, we've talked about this. We've talked about this before. Okay. In previous videos, the relationship is everything, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, the the marketing tactic is hopefully to increase your awareness. Hopefully, more people know about you, more people see you, more people want to talk to you, more people see your work. They want to call you, they want to work with you, they bring you the project. They say, hey, I want to work with you, and here's the budget, and please, please, they beg you, please yeah. work with me. Yeah. Right? That's the dream, and that's the goal. Mm -hmm. In a marketing agency, who whoever whomever owns the relationship, whoever owns wins. the relationship wins. One hundred percent. Right. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. So when I say that you have to play to your strengths, yeah. it's all about what are the things that you are good at to be able to put yourself in front of people so that way they can get to know you and what you're doing. If you're an introvert, okay. if you're not going to go out to the world, yeah. if you're not great at these things, uh -huh. then you need to get in front of people when they're looking for your type of service. Okay. And you need to build a really great portfolio or have really great credibility or have a really great landing page. Okay. Have something to convince them to pick up the phone and call you or send you an email. Right. If you're an extrovert, mm -hmm. if you're good at meeting people, mm -hmm. if you just love the hustle and yeah. love that work, yeah. then you go out to the world. Yeah. And is a tactic picking up the phone? Maybe. Is it sponsoring an event? Maybe. Is it being a speaker? Is it being a thought leader? Is it going on social media? Is it okay. doing all those things? Great. Maybe. But, but the first thing to think about is it's all about building the connection and the relationship. Right. Right. And so are people coming to you or are you going to them? Right. Next level down from that. Yeah. Right? Exciting. Yeah. Okay. So people are coming to you. Yeah. Your marketing tactic can't end at the phone call. All right. This is where brand and personality and sales. I know. Okay. I want. I, I want to back up. I want people coming to me. I want. I want more specific on people coming to me. So. So we did introvert extrovert. Awesome. What else? Like if I'm analytical versus non analytical. Mm -hmm. Is there something I can do that's different? Like if I'm if if you're not analytical and you're doing pay per click campaigns, you're dead. Right? If you hate analytics and numbers, I would, just, I would just hire someone who's good at it to do that for you. Sure, but as a did. starting point, which is what we did. As a starting point, yeah. your first move should not be hire somebody to do PPC, or should it? Your very first move should be hire somebody to do PPC for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I was getting into like PPC as like a next video, but yeah, like, yeah before I'm talking about tactics, that's yeah. like so. Okay, so but but play so, to your strengths would then be like I got to hire somebody. You have to have a great portfolio. 
You, you yes. have to have a portfolio. Yeah. No, you, you say yes, of course. Lots of people don't have portfolios. Okay. Right? You're just starting. What is it? Like, Great. Put as much as stuff in there as you can. You have to have credibility. Okay. So does your website represent itself well? Yeah. Uh, and your brand that we talked about in the last video. Your brand, video. your yep. website. Yep. Uh, do, do you, do, are there, is there anything that would lead someone to believe that you don't exist? Yeah. And, and this is like really tactical stuff down to the point of, do you have an About Us page? Does the About Us page have your photo or mm -hmm. show your team? Mm -hmm. Is your address there? Yeah. If people don't know that, oh, there's a company, like address, even if it's your apartment. Yeah. Oh, there's no photos of these people. Yeah. They don't think you're real. Yeah. Right? They won't call you. Yeah. So are you credible? Do you have a portfolio? Do you represent yourself well? Right. So Those are, that's for everybody. That's for every business that's ever been invented, but marketers especially do it badly. Right. So, but, because but, they're so, so worried about the front. But it's not picking, now it's not picking a market. These are what like everybody has to do. Yes. Where everybody doesn't, doesn't have to be a thought leader. Mm -hmm. So everybody has to have a portfolio. They have to have a portfolio. Have an about page with pictures. They have to represent themselves as real. Whatever right. that looks like. Maybe, maybe it's a video of you. Maybe it's walking around your, your office. Maybe it's linking to your Instagram account. Something that shows Something that shows that you're real people. The mission doing real behind things. what you're doing, yeah. like your story. Address. And address. Address. We're a real place. Right. If it's your apartment, say you can come by my apartment studio. Okay. Right? I so work those from three I work from my shed in my backyard. Like th those are those are core. Yeah. To what what are, do you need doing. to have all your social handles set up? No. So you don't have an Instagram, it's okay. If you're good at it, do it. If no, no, but as an agency, do, like if, uh, do I need to have it set up? No. No, okay. So I need those three things. So, so to be an agency and to succeed, you need that website, you yeah. need the credibility, yeah. you need your portfolio, right? Do you need YouTube or not? Website is the about page. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, got it, okay. yes, yes, yes. Do, do you need YouTube or not? Yeah. Only if you're gonna be good at it and do right. it and like it. Okay, so then that, Do you need Instagram or not? Yes. Only if you're going to be good at doing Facebook. Right. If you're going to be. So we've got. I like this. So we've got the three tactics that everybody has to have. You have to. If you don't have a portfolio, don't worry about going to YouTube yet. Build no. your portfolio. Yes. Don't worry about your Instagram account. Build your portfolio. Yes. Build your about page. Yes. Right. Your story. Awesome. Awesome. Great. So right. that's like for everybody. So, so that's those are for people who are coming to you. Right. So there's three things that you need to. Ab everybody absolutely has to do. Then there's a million other things that you could do. Right. So how do we pick which one? So. When you start to layer on top of, so that's your that's your home base, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's yeah. that's yeah. the thing of people who are coming to you, yeah. right? As you're going out to the world, they're checking to make sure you're real and all of those other things. Yeah. Okay. So the next tactic above that, yeah, is either, yeah, you are going to go to everyone you know, right? Tell them what you are doing, right? Set up your coffees, right? Set up your lunches, yeah. Share what you're doing, yeah, and like literally blast every connection you have. Introvert, extrovert. And, and I say you should do this or that, but I think yeah. you should actually do both. So you should, you should do that. Okay. And on top of that, you should decide how you're going to get people who don't know you to find you. So that can okay. be AdWords, right? That can be YouTube. Yeah. That can be in, like being a thought leader on Instagram. Yeah. It can be social media. Yeah. It uh, can be going to your local chamber of commerce. Uh -huh. Like you need one activity of each, right? You need to go out to all your relationships. Right. And you need to meet with these people. And you should do those things, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, because even if you're an introvert, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You should still push yourself to do that. Right. And you need to find one tactic that's going to introduce you to people who don't know you. Google AdWords, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Okay, it might let me be. ask you this. So if you're if you're say introverted, we're gonna do we're gonna do some of the extroverted stuff, but do I wanna lean heavily on the introverted stuff? I wouldn't say one-on-one -on -one conversations and coffees with people is an extroverted thing. To me, an extroverted thing is like, I'm gonna go speak on this panel. I'm going to go... Sure, it's more the how do I get that person because going up to somebody at, at your church who you don't know and say, hey, I heard you are... Uh, that's more no, extrovert so, thing. W sorry, when I mean when you're just starting, yeah. I mean, I, I am literally going to go through on, onto my personal Facebook and say, hey guys, I'm starting this company. I would love to meet people that are like this. Right. Or um, you're going through your LinkedIn profile because you just quit your job and you're literally scrolling through and you're writing down a list of every person that you may want to ask for coffee for one-on-ones. Whether you're introvert or extrovert, everybody has to do it. I think you should. Okay, I think so it's part I do, of our foundation. I do, it, I do it once a year. So it's part of our three things. Now it's the fourth thing. This is the next layer up, all right? You've taken care of your home base. You're, you're representing yourself with your yeah. about us. But, this, but you're saying there's no option. Everybody has to do it. Sure. No, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, like, no, I, th I think you should. Whether you're introvert or extrovert. It's all about the relationship. I, right? get, I get it. How do you how do you, so how do you how do you form and how do you nurture and how do you build those relationships if you can't if you're not spending time with people? It's not about spending time with at least what I'm thinking. It's not about spending time with people. It's how do you get that initial conversation to happen? Is it 
to your point before, I want I want to have a system that makes my phone ring because I'm happy to talk to people and then go meet mm -hmm. with them, or I'm going to be out networking and shaking hands and meeting new people and going ah, to industry events. Right, I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's the introvert versus extrovert. Right. What I'm saying was everyone should do though is yeah. tap into the people that they know in their lives. Right. So, right? so that's, that's the core. That's home so, base. So it's literally you know we, home base. We, we talked about the woman of the church. Yeah. I should go out for coffee with my pastor. Right. At the church, who knows everybody, and say I'm trying to do this. Is there anyone you think I should be connected with? Right, regardless. I'm, I'm going to my cousin because my cousin is in this company and saying, hey, does your company, can you connect me with anyone right. else? Right, so everybody has to do this. Yes. Great. And, and you should do it at least once a year. Awesome. Keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, so but, I mean as, so your home as, your, base as your group and grows this. and there's only 1,200 people that, you, that you're talking to and whatnot, that's where... You home know, base gets you, you split up. Yeah. This is your first tactic and everybody must do this tactic. Everybody needs to have their website, their about page, their portfolio. If you want to be a successful agency, you need to have those things. Your website, your belt page, your portfolio. And you have to be honest about your address, how to contact your you. address, your story, right? like phone number, Great. like no, like hello at Great. whatever .com. Stop. Great. That's that's foundation, home base. Yep. Next, your first step. Everybody's first step after that, from a marketing tactic, should be to reach out to everybody you know and say you started this business mm -hmm. and you're looking at targeting. Go back to a video around customers who to find. Mm -hmm. I'm targeting people in the automotive industry. Do you know anybody? I'm mm -hmm. starting this company. Can you make introductions? Mm -hmm. Everybody has to do that. So like it's our next path. Great. But but yeah, but when you're doing that, yeah. don't just send out like an e-blast. Don't just go to Facebook and make it easy. Okay, like, awesome, awesome. Like, do, we can, do, we can, we'll put talk in about the that in the next video. Put in the mistakes. time. Put in the time. I can love it. <laughs> I'm looking at the next tactics though because at some point it bridges out to a million different versions yeah. and, you have to, and you can't do everything. So I have to do these three things and I have to do this one thing. Then it starts to bridge. Mm -hmm. What do, how do I pick? So if I'm extroverted, I'm going to go to the conferences. I'm going to be meeting people. I'm going to go to as many events as I can in my industry. If I'm introverted, I'm going to be doing PPC. I'm going to be doing Instagram posts. I'm going to be doing analytical stuff mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Does it break out more than that? Uh, so I think on the extroverted side, do you want to host a podcast or a radio show? Do you want to? Is your dream to be on television? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to become the industry leader? Right, but can we help them make that decision? Because if you say, are you more introverted or extroverted? People can usually, as some people fall in between, but most people can lean one way or sure. the other. Then it's great. Then we cut off a whole bunch of options that they don't have to worry about. And like, you can still win. Focus on these things. Yeah. So if I've picked, I'm an introvert. Awesome. Don't worry about going to as many conferences and events. Mm -hmm. You could win there, but you probably won't win as hard. Go do these things. Yeah. Okay, if I've now identified, this is what I was trying to do with the Myers-Briggs, if now I've identified as the I, great. Is there any other way to split up those things? Or are you just saying, test everything or just see what feels right? Or can we give more context to people to help them make a better decision? Everybody should know what they like and don't like doing. Let's say that. You may not know what you're good at and bad at, but you know what you like doing and don't like doing. But if you haven't tried it, how do you know? If you haven't tried doing a pay-per-click campaign, like how do you know? I'm not saying pay-per-click. Okay. What, what I'm saying is... Computer work? You can build your business off of, and lead generation, off of producing a passion project. Okay. Right? So, so if you are a creative agency that's into design, you can choose to design posters yeah. and pour yourself into that and then put that into a design community um, forum. Right. And then that will get your name known and your agency will start to become known. Or if you're into video, you can go to Vimeo and you can get an Editor's Choice Award for a passion project. And that could be the way for the introvert to build their business through their work, right? Through becoming known and through lifting your way up. And, so, and it's not like a long shot. It happens to a lot of people where they let their I work self sell them. Do we then just refer back to the, the other video on how to make the right decisions based off of your gut feeling, how to trust your gut more? But it's, it's not just gut. It's, it's taking advantage of, of, of like really going into your strengths. So I like helping people. You like helping people. Yesterday I was having a meeting with someone where I spent three hours with them. I don't think they're going to move forward. Okay. I gave them every way that they could, they could run their business without us yeah. because I don't think really we're a great fit. And they kept apologizing about the time. I said, no, no, no. I, like, I, I will invest time. So I chose long ago to hire people to do different things so I can free up my time because me spending time with people is lead generation, and I'm an introvert. But me spending time with people, me having a long conversation with them, me getting them thinking, is the way that I actually generate business and generate work and generate leads, because I'm good at that. But if I was much better at my work, like the actual design, the actual programming, the actual whatever it is, I would come up with 
amazing things and I would or I would write a if I was a better writer I would write a blog on that because because I'd be so inspired by the work we're doing if I was really into analytics I would want to crack the code for the most analytical way to go about something and build my business off of that there are lots of at your desk things you can do where you want to try and carve out your space and your niche through your work I choose to use pay-per-click because people are calling me and then I give them tons and tons of advice and time yeah. everything for free I will pour myself into them they'll move ahead or they won't move ahead that's my lead generation of sales. It still becomes like, how do I pick? I still don't know how I pick. If I'm an introvert and there's still a million things I can do, how do I pick pay-per-click instead but if, of... But if you're a marketing agency, you should be able to pick for yourself. But if I'm starting and I don't know, then I need to figure it out. But you, but you have an idea of the type of marketing agency you want. Like, like I understand if you're a bricklayer. If yeah. you're saying you're a bricklayer and he doesn't know how to pick to grow his business, cool, he's a bricklayer. We're talking to marketers here. We're talking to creative people. These are web people, these are video people, photo people, design people. Like these are people who have an inherent skill, right? If if you're if you're a, 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 if you're the conductor of a symphony, yeah. would you not use that talent to market yourself? Would you not go like I'm going to design um, four different songs for the four different seasons and release them? I'm going to write like like you would use your skill, right? I yeah, you, you need the website and you need the portfolio. But like the on people that. who are trying to get there and they don't know yet, they're trying to figure it out. I'm just trying to shortcut their path. Right. And you're saying if you don't know, you suck, basically, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying look within yourself. But it's not great advice. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's ultimately the best advice, but I don't know what to do with that. How do I look within myself? If, if, if you can figure out, if you can hack yourself, what I'm trying to get to do is hack yourself. Because, yes, you could, you could randomly meet somebody at the airport, and that could be the person who ends up blowing up your business. But if you're an introvert, like, that's not a great strategy to to put yourself in situations where you have a low percentage of winning instead of a high. That's all. I just want to increase the people's percentage of winning to well, a higher one. But So I guess the reason why I'm, I'm not being super specific about it is because because we are not really speaking about sales. And what we're talking about for marketing tactics should flow directly into sales. And so if you're such an introvert that you don't want to have a conversation or don't really want to get out there or talk to people or even one-on-one. I want people to come to me. No, I'm a magnet. I love one-on-ones. This is what I get off on the most. Yeah, so I'm the same way. But I'm, ma I'm a magnet instead of going out right. and... Right? Which, is, which is why you set up a landing page and you have AdWords and you drive traffic to it. But here's Done. the thing. Like, and then once you build that up, you do email that. marketing. Great. Done. I, as an introvert yeah. who, who builds a YouTube channel and does a lot of speaking and, and does books and all that, I don't have any pay-per-click advertising... Period. Right, right. But if we look back through your YouTube channel, yeah. we have year one with, I'll do it for you. We have year one with this growth, yeah. year two with this growth, yeah. year three with this growth, yeah. and, and you take off. At the, at the end of the day, yeah. your greatest ability is to work with the people you already know who are, or who are warm leads, or yes. to be introduced to people who are looking for exactly what you have well, to offer. Go back and watch AdWords, the customer video. Through AdWords. Okay. Like, the, the, that, that, those are your core elements. Listen, we didn't get as far down as, as what I wanted in my mind, but, but I think we still provide a lot of value. I think at the core, people have to have a website, they have to have an about us and our, tell our story mm -hmm. and have your portfolio, mm -hmm. right? You have to have those three things. Then you have to, everybody, reach out to everybody in your network and say you're starting this business and here's the type of client that you wanna reach. If you don't know who your client is, go back and watch the video from before because we helped break that down, it was awesome. Then you can go in extrovert and introvert, and we talked about different options. From there, you're on your own. But we gave you tons of value that can at least help you get that far. <laughs> and hopefully that helps, because that alone gets you to the point where you should be making money in your business. Yeah. Even, the, even that first step, those home base, and then reaching out to everybody should get you some business coming in. And then we help make the next decision, and at some point, now you're on your own. Today we're talking about the three biggest mistakes that agencies make when they are marketing themselves. Number one, what do we got? Number one is, uh, and we all fall into this trap, you have to pay to play. Okay. Right? We, we tell it to clients, but sometimes we don't want to do it ourselves. So what does that mean, pay to play? What it means is if you want to be seen by people, you have to pay someone to do so. Right? If we okay. think back to the old days, there was radio, there was television, okay. people paid money to show it. Yeah. Then the internet come, came along and we thought, okay, well we can create a viral video, we can blog, or we can do all this free stuff and people will just find us. Okay. But truthfully, if you want to save time, if you want to find the right people and you want them targeted, you have to lean on Google AdWords, right, which is pay-per-click where you can have the different ads that you want based on different search terms. Yeah. People come in and they find you. You can go to Facebook, right, and we're 
creative people. We can design uh, banners. We can design videos. We can boost posts. Yeah. We go to Facebook around who we want to target, what they're interested in. Yeah. And we drive traffic to the site. Yeah. We don't, uh, you know, at this point with our clients, I, I can't recall the last time we ran any kind of activity without the expectation that there would be some advertising budget. Got it. That people would put $1,000 a month or $800 a month or $5,000 a month, whatever it might be, that they would put money towards finding people who are looking for their service and dropping them there. Right. Is it the fastest way to grow right now? The fastest uh, way to get awareness? Yeah. Fastest way? It, it always has been. Right. So, so we, we... It's the most expensive way, but it's the fastest way. Well, it's expensive if you're not tracking anything. So okay. I we'll mean, that was that. Gonna, that was going to be our third point. Yeah. But we'll just move it up to number two. Okay. Number two. Right. You got to track. You have to track. Yeah. I mean, the big like, it, it's it's mind boggling to me that people yeah. put money towards things without tracking. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe like Google Analytics is is pretty confusing. I find it confusing. Okay. I have someone who can help me. Yeah. But but at the very least, you need to be able to track your uh, goals. So set a goal. Do we want awareness? Yeah. Do we want people just to see it? Do we want conversion? Do we want people to actually click through and come through? Do we want a conversion on a sale? Uh, there are uh, there's software for call tracking. So if you have a phone number, you can you know we pay a service. I think it's thirty five dollars a month. It ghosts all our numbers, mm -hmm. so we know if this person came in through Google and called us, we can attribute that lead to that call. Mm -hmm. Right? There are all these different things available. They're not really that expensive. They're not really that complicated. But it's all with the intention of being able to get to a place where I can say, I spent $800 and I closed a $10,000 deal. Mm -hmm. right? Or um, I spent $2,000 and I closed a $100,000 deal. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of wasted bad leads in there and it's like $8 here and $10 there and all this stuff. But then the client comes along, that's the client you want, you win that client, you keep them for five years, that client refers you to other people, and year over year, you know, it's, it, it grows your business. But people, one, are not willing to spend money on it, and they should, and then people, two, are not tracking as much as they can, and mm -hmm. they're just wasting money on stuff. If you're, if you, I mean, would you, would you fly, uh, you know, would you fly across the country, um, stay in a hotel for a few days, speak at a tour, uh, with the intention of closing a deal mm -hmm. and then coming back and never tracking if, you know, would you do that? Right. Or would you say, no, no, I want to meet three people mm -hmm. and I want one of, one of those three people to turn in something. If that happened, it was successful. It was worth the, the $4,000 investment. Right. Right. I, I wouldn't do that. I don't like yeah. So why, when you're spending money with Facebook or with Google or uh, with any kind of activity, would you just put money in because you kind of know sales are happening and not worry about what it's right. costing? And, and of, of all your marketing Broken. tactics, it's the easiest to measure versus a TV spend or a radio spend or something else. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sh it, it should be. Right. <laughs> right. So it, would you say that every agency now needs to have that capability either in-house or be working with somebody to help them? So I'm a bit biased. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the only thing that matters. So you can't. So, so when you say, when we started off by saying you have to be able to understand and drive value for a client, yeah. how do you explain what that value is? Right. If you don't know kind of what's happening. So, so if you're a creative agency and you're in charge of branding, yeah. well, I mean, you succeeded if you've created a really great brand. So okay. you don't really need analytics. Okay. But if you're responsible for any kind of lead generation, any kind of spend, any kind of activity that you can and should track, it's, it's core. Right, like it's not good enough that you created something that made people feel good. Right, but unless if that's the intention. If you're a creative agency, are you not testing any of the stuff on an audience? You may, if the client if the client is interested in that, but uh, but you're not forcing it as an agency to say, hey, well, let's get no. some feedback. Okay, not not typically because because if you're doing closed panels, people don't have a tendency of telling the truth. Got it. And it's very skewed. Uh, and if you're doing uh, open online surveys or driving traffic in certain ways. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're doing a name or something and willing to test it, then that yeah. could be a great way leveraging PPC to drive traffic. And that. top three places in order of where I should be spending money right now. Uh, I, I I still believe that Google AdWords is the number one platform to start with. Okay, because now uh, because intent. Well, because search intent is there, yeah. which is very very important. Yeah, uh, and through negative keywords, you can tighten up your campaign okay. very very well. Uh, you can target your geography. You can decide your ad spend. I mean, the larger, more national you go, the more cities you're in, the more right. generic you go, the more money it costs. And you're still doing this for Fanta. Oh, yeah. 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 I wish I could spend more on it. 
I mean, I just, I like we're in a we're in a pretty niche industry, but we also pick the terms and the services right. that we know we like convert. So, so, so as you're tracking a, your data, right, right. So as a marketing agency, though, we don't buy marketing agency. Okay. We don't buy design agency. Okay. We don't buy branding. So what? How do people pick? We pick based off of the terms that we know we have a very high likelihood of closing okay. based on competition. Got it. So there are a lot of marketing agencies. But if someone types in marketing agency or marketing agency Chicago, right. like that is a very generic term. If someone okay. was looking for it's a waste photog of money. photographer, mm -hmm. uh, video production company, um, uh, lead generation company, mm -hmm. uh, landing page design company, right. like those are so specific that they can come in, you can talk about that one tiny project, right. you can impress them with what you're doing and then grow them into a bigger company. Now you used to do videography as your main business before you expanded. Yeah, video production. Video production, yeah. sorry. Did you, did you take out ads for video production, Toronto right. video production, Markham, and that converted for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, so so we, we can go back to the glory days of SEO, but we became a million dollar company based off of SEO before mm. before the good days of Penguin but, but, too. But AdWords is still a part of that piece, no? It was well, only SEO? So, you know, in the old days, you used to be able to invest in, in blogging and content and linking. Right. And then you can start to rank. Like, we, yeah. we at a time, we ranked above Wikipedia for the term video production. Right. Right, like, we, rank, we ranked very, very well. And... I think we had 35 number one keywords. Okay. So in, in the fall of those days, let's put those behind us, AdWords has become more competitive. Uh, there, it costs more, mm -hmm. but you have more data to track than ever. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in the type of business where your average sale is four or $500, mm -hmm. it, you, know, you don't want to be spending too much to acquire that client unless it's going to lead to more. Right. If your average sale is five or ten or fifty or hundred or two hundred thousand, so you're trying to more than break even off your AdWords. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure I understand the question. What do you mean, more than break even? So, like, you want a return on your investment, right? But you're uh, some people look at AdWords. It depends on the industry. So I was curious about yours. Yeah. They see AdWords as as break even. If I break even off my AdWords campaign, it's awesome because I keep that customer. There's referrals. There's repeat business. Oh, for sure. So, but you, so, what do you think in terms of your, how much you want to spend? Is it I want to spend up to how much I'm going to make off the first gig with them, or up to half of what I'm going to spend on the first gig with them? Like, if I make five hundred bucks yeah. per client. So, if you make five hundred dollars per client, yeah. do you really want to focus on return on advertising spend? Right, because it's not and enough. Your cost of acquisition. But but, but what if they stay with me? Really, so then that falls into lifetime value of client. Right. Yes. So if you can calculate your lifetime value of client. Right then you still want to right size that because your margins are so little. Okay. Right. So if you're dealing with, with um, and like in my opinion, if you're dealing with anything of multiples of tens of thousands of dollars yeah. per closed client, yeah. then you're willing to go much lo looser yeah. on it, uh, especially if there's recurring revenue tied to it yeah. or you have uh, the chance to hold on to that client Got it. for a longer period of time. For me, I've hit the point in my business where I really don't care how much we spend. Okay. I outspend every single month. Okay. So Google, but then why not do showing us media agency or marketing agency? Because we're not, so, so there's a difference between being able to spend the money yeah. and generate the person to the page right. and then being able to convert that person into an inbound sales lead. just not converting. Lead, right? You and would so spend more for the leads you're getting, but I, for I new would spend keywords, more and yeah. I would be competing against, we go back to competition, mm -hmm. right? I'm not bumping up against certain people right mm -hmm. now, right? I'm, 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 Bringing people in through right. the tactics that we are the very best at. Right. We are, you know, if, if I was the very best designer, yeah. but I could also do websites and other things, mm -hmm. I wouldn't compete against website companies. Right. I would want people who love design to come in. Yeah. And then once we're having that conversation, I'd say we also do websites and all these other things. So that's the strategy we use. We bring right. people in in the tactics that we are the very best at, where we are the most competitive at, that, that we are amazing at. Yeah. And then once we have that conversation, we've built the trust. We have the credibility. We talk about the other aspects of our business. Everyone I mean, should be using Google AdWords. Every marketing agency, provided it doesn't by month three prove well, we're doing not it, to we're, work. We're doing number two, which is an, <laughs> analyzing. Tracking. Like, yeah. like you may not. I mean, yes, won't. yes, everybody should do it. Right, and until track. it until it proves right. that it's not working. Number two is number two would be would be Facebook. Facebook and number three. Uh, but there's no number three. Google, no, Facebook. I mean, there's two platforms, right? There's Google and Facebook. Okay. So within, within Google, you should be doing AdWords to a landing page. Yeah. 
you should be doing remarketing because it's so cheap, it's so affordable, it's so simple. Yeah. And remarketing is just introducing display banners. To I think those. Is that our third point, remarketing? Uh, no. Oh, what was no, that no. third point? Something else. Okay, good. Uh, so you, you should, should be doing, doing AdWords, you should be doing remarketing. You can, you're a creative agency, so if you can design something, or you're an agency. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense to get into YouTube pre rolls, if you ask me. Um, from a remarketing point of right. view or an awareness, it makes sense on Facebook to do an awareness campaign or a dis or a dis uh, conversion campaign. Okay, you know the idea of boosting likes. Right, nothing. Like, it's a, t a terrible Useless. conversion yeah. rate. Like, and it's the easiest one to because they promote it so hard. Yeah, but what do likes tell you, right? Like, yeah, likes yeah, don't yeah. tell you anything. I want, I want people vanity, who want to work vanity with metrics, me. Vanity metrics, vanity metrics. Right? Yeah. So, so those those are the areas that I yeah. would suggest. Okay, the, so, so, so the, the one we skipped was email marketing. Oh, the third one. Okay, we didn't skip that. So, like, so Google number one, Facebook number two, yeah, and then remarketing well, on the various platforms number three. Exactly. And then make sure you're tracking and analyzing everything. Yes. That's point one. Point two is tracking, and then point three you want the to talk about email. The biggest mistake people make is under leveraging email. Got it. Okay. Right. So, so email it. marketing. I mean, I, I don't know how many times Mailchimp and all the other suppliers can say it's it's proven to be the very best. Thing. It's, yeah. It's the very best converting. Uh, potentially lowest cost, yeah. under leveraged resource that exists for a business. And what's the best way to grow my list? So the size of your list is a relevant targeted list. Whether people love you, believe in you, like you, follow you, part of your tribe is what matters most right. than anything. What's my else. best tactic though to get those people on my list? So it's to offer value. I mean it, it comes down to value. So if I'm if I'm building uh, so as a marketing agency, most of our people within our target persona list and most others will be the same. Mm -hmm. It's it's friends of the brand. So these are people who know you, love you, believe in what you have to say, believe in what you have to do, but but make no mistake, they will never refer you. They will never buy anything off you because they're, they're like a professor or a student or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they're still important. They're friends of the brand. Then there are uh, your clients, people who are your clients, who can work with you and believe in you, and then there's your competition. Now your competition is either competition, or if you're a thought leader in the industry, there are people who are learning from you. Right. And why not teach those people? Sure. Right? It's, it's it's great to elevate yourself as the leader. And is it a monthly email, a weekly email? What are you sending out? So it depends on on the resources you have in house. Right. Consistency is everything. Mm. Consistency is everything, right? Like in, in YouTube, oh, they've, yeah. been, they've been shouting for years. Like yeah, if you yeah, only yeah, do yeah. once a month, yeah. do once a month. Yeah. If you do five times a week, do five yeah. times a week. Yeah. Consistency is everything. So. You need to be able to know for, you know, you have to decide, is the content I'm releasing, and this is the same for blogging as well, but is it for my friends? And then what, what do they get out of it, right? People come because they want to be entertained or they want to be informed. Yep. So what do they get out of it? Uh, is this for my current client base? Is this for my competition or the people who are in my industry? Yeah. Because I want to teach them something. And so when you're releasing this content, how much can you write? Is it, is it written? Or is it video? Is it photography? Is it sharing really amazing case studies, but not boring case studies, but like yeah, the story behind you know, the work you're doing? Yeah, yeah. Is it about your struggles as, as in growing your business? Yeah. Anything that you can do as a YouTuber or yeah. Instagrammer, you can release very, very in well email. through email. It's, yeah. it's, it's a great platform. So, you, would so you, you do can an ad campaign on PPC to build your email list? Is it that valuable? Like, would you spend money, or is it just something that you'd put on your on your website, say, hey, here, download our white paper as a lead magnet kind of thing, but like, do you pay yeah. to get it? Would you we, pay? We don't typically do a lot of gated stuff for ourselves. Okay. So, um, but you, you know, we clients. have tested with a, Hub, with a HubSpot like driven campaign. So yeah. we've gone through HubSpot, we've done the drip nurturing, and, yeah. we've, and, and we were able to grow our list a little bit, okay. like from 600 targeted people to like 1,000. Okay. But um, it wasn't even as successful as if, if we want to do a can if we just really want to build our list, yeah. then uh, have a really great blog. Yeah. Because the blog content is in line with the email marketing. Right. Uh, potentially start an activity like uh, Instagramming, like like live stories, like the way that you do. Right. Uh, YouTubing. But you're not doing this stuff. I'm, I'm not doing so this. So who goes on your same. list? Like clients, you yeah. add them to your list? Like somebody who yeah. signed up as a client, you put them on your email list. Yeah. So and then you, what's your frequency now? Once a month? It's a quarter? Uh, oh no, far far less than that. We send it out maybe twice a year at this twice point. Twice a year. And so it's like what but you're most proud of, your work. We yeah, we thought I mean, leadership. We're we're not great at this right now yeah. because we are It's very, the most underutilized <laughs> marketing tactic. I'm gonna be honest with you, like like and I know it sounds like an excuse, the last yeah. eight months we've been like really busy. It's a good problem to and have. So, yeah, I, I know, but I would but this is something that bothers me. I yeah. would love to be able to do that. But even doing twice more. a year is better than Zero, right? So, so what we do is we try to look for every opportunity to try and make things as as personal and brand 
feel as possible. Right. So for example, uh, three or four years ago, Canada came out with anti-spam legislation. Yeah. It basically really, really strict rules that said businesses cannot email anyone unless if you're a client yeah. or they have expressly given permission. I right. think Europe has something similar. Okay. So am I on your list? Uh, you maybe. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. That's fine. But when we sent out that thing, we sent out like the cheekiest, like we, we everybody sends it out. You Please literally have in. to. Yeah, we're yeah, like, yeah. we're gonna make, we're gonna make this thing. People are gonna love Fun. us or hate us. Yeah. So we sent a picture of the team. Uh, I think our H one was like, you know, like, like, you know, do we look like a bunch of spammers? Of course not. And it was just the the longest. I was basically making funny of the legislation. Yeah. Okay. We had, I don't know, what we had, I had fifteen people email me personally to be like, that was amazing. I right. loved it. It was great. Right, it's, and, it, and, but it's like it's a boring legal yeah, information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it was and it's fun. not a giant list. It's not like twenty thousand people on this list either. It's like no. customers and yeah, yeah, customers and people. So so I always go through and I actually manually uh, like update my list because right. I'm constantly being so who's on the, people. quickly who's on the list? Like types of people that you put on the list manually. Yeah, customers. So, uh, so I manually put customers on the list. Yeah, that's it. That's all you can legally do. In Canada. Oh, okay. That's all you can. So manually. every customer you've worked with gets on the list, and twice yeah. a year they get an email from you mm -hmm. talking about projects, what you're excited by, that kind of stuff. Yeah, or or if you know we're if we're trying to boost some awareness for a specific event or that we're sponsoring. Got it. Right. So so there's the like there's also the idea of, and I don't know if this is something people don't do, but it's it's be seen, but then be seen being seen. Okay. Right. Like you're going to sponsor an event. Yeah. And it's cool that you just showed it to the 400 people at the event. Yeah. The bigger impact is to be seen. Yeah. Sponsoring the event by the 20,000 people who are on social or wherever they are. Yeah. Right, so you, you always want to think in terms of rings. Yeah. And email is a really great way to drive, you know, to take the blog content you're already writing and yeah. send it out and remind people of it. To so say, hey, um, my team had a, you know, a, here are the top ten photos from our Instagram thing, and yeah. just send that out. Yeah. Right, like it's this extra play that you can go into. And of course, if you're a more traditional business, offer codes, yeah, discounts, yeah, yeah. sales, yeah. all that stuff. You're not going to do that. I love email. Like I have 1.6 million at the time of this filming on do you subscribers know? on YouTube. That's when I talked to you. You had like 8,000 people. No, no, no. On YouTube. On YouTube. Oh, okay. But and and For email, email is that. coming up on 100,000. Okay. Almost there, like 97 or 98. Yeah. But I'll, if I have something I need to get out, email is the way it's going to do For it. Sure. Yeah. And I love what you do about it because I, I I mean I can tell the emails that are a little bit more structured, mm -hmm. and then I can see the ones where you're just like. Telling a story. Hey, everyone! It's Easter weekend, yeah. and my friend Mark needs to start a YouTube yeah, video, yeah, that was good. and you need to go out and good. you just blast yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. this thing. So, uh, but email is totally under leveraged, and it's something that, and I mean, email doesn't even have to be email marketing. Yeah, like think anything. Of, think of twelve people that you want to talk to. Yeah. and send them an email. Yeah, say like, hey, I was thinking of you. How's it going? Especially at the beginning too, right? To build yeah. your brand. Yeah. Cool. Okay, okay. so the three biggest mistakes. Not doing enough on PPC. Yeah, not being willing to pay. Not being willing to pay. Yep. Not tracking your data. Not it. doing analytics and, and not using email enough. I love it. Mark runs Fanta. He's been, how long, when did you hit, like how long ago have you been million plus? Six years maybe? Six years ago Five he hit years? million plus. Yeah. Awesome. And, and today we're going to talk about how to scale. I think so it was year seven. I think year six or seven we crossed a million dollars. Year six. How to scale, how to go from like just being a solo entrepreneur to now building a team and building up the company because as we covered in the previous, for, 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 for the previous video, you can't build a million dollar company all on your own. Mm -hmm. And so you've got 12 full-time people, you've got tons of freelancers work for you. What's your advice on how to go from being that solo entrepreneur to scaling your company? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that you have to do is, is obviously know what you like and don't like and know your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Right? You always want to, so a lot of us, when we're starting, we feel, at least I felt, like I had to be the smartest person in the room. Okay. I had to feel like this is my company, so yeah. obviously I know everything. And I guess lucky for me, there are so many parts of the business that I know that I'm not good at. When I find someone who is much better than me at it, I'm like, thank goodness you're here. Like, I, I cannot wait to bring in people uh, who are better than me okay. at what they do. And that's that's the kind of multiplying effect that in a creative agency that um, I didn't think about, and I don't know many people if many people do, mm -hmm. is that when I'm one person, I'm not only limited by my skill set and my time, but I'm also what selling and doing account managing and trying to do the work or trying to manage people and all these things. And when I bring in two people, it doesn't only double. I mean, it doesn't purely double the amount of productivity you can okay. have because you still have to manage that person. Yeah. But it doesn't only double that there are now two people. 
it actually raises what the agency is capable of because the person I'm hiring, if I hire you, mm -hmm. you're, let's, let's be frank, like Evan is really good at, at coaching people and speaking to people. Suddenly I hire you, mm -hmm. Fanta has a new coaching division of the business. Right. We're now the experts at coaching because I can leverage your credibility, I can leverage your background, I can leverage all these things. Right. And when I go from two people to three people, Michael on my team, 20 years of experience with analytics, with product management. I'm not a product manager, yeah. but he has been a product manager at really big companies. And so when we work with a client and he's talking about SKUs and warehouses and all this stuff, like I have no experience. Suddenly Fanta has the experience. Right. And so I almost, I wasn't aware of the magic that comes from each person that you can add who can be better than you, who can elevate the company, who you can leverage their experience. Now it can go the other way, right? You can mishire, I've mishired lots of people. You can yeah. mishire and it can be kind of a downer, but the way that I look at people and scaling and the way that I suggest most people do is not only look at the person who can do what you want them to do, but that's an opportunity to grow your story, to grow your brand, to grow your capabilities, and you can sell, you can sell the benefits of having that person. Who should be the first person somebody hire? How do you figure out who my first hire yeah. should be? It's going to be your opposite. So okay. if I'm really great at sales, mm -hmm. but I'm terrible at operations and delivery and production, I need a production person. If I'm really great at design, but I, I'm terrible at customer service, I need a customer service and account manager. If, um, you know, really within our industry, like you're either really good at the craft mm -hmm. and then you need the business or the salesperson, or you're yeah. really, I, I was much better and I am, I think, much better at the, the sales and account management side. Really, our business took off when I was able to afford, you know, a, a better producer, a better director, a better camera people, better mm. editors, better photographers, uh, better people at wireframing, better people at strategy than me. Like, like we have been able, the reason we have a core team of 12 and then lots of freelancers is because in, I mean, I'd love to have like 18 people here. Mm -hmm. right? Like I want, I want a, I, I want a business manager because I struggle to keep on top of all of the contracts and all of the legal and all of the accounting. I'm just not good at it. I don't right. like it. So we have big projects that never have a contract signed and people are like, where's the contract? I'm like, eh, I never signed it like eight months ago. And like, that's not great. We should yeah. be doing that. So, so you look at all the parts of the business, but you start with just like the polar opposite, in my opinion, of you. Okay. If I'm really great at the craft. I want someone better at the business. If I'm really good at the business. I want someone better at the craft. So that way you elevate. Okay. So that's from one to two. And when you go to three or four or five, I, I recommend you look at the areas of the business that are holding you back. Meaning? So if you can't get things produced fast enough, hmm. so in, in a creative agency, the speed in which you produce mm -hmm. actually affects your margins more than anything else. Okay. Right? And so, so if you have staff on salary and you plan for them to spend you know, a week on it, so 40 hours working on it and they spend 60, your margins are gone. If it's a freelance project though, you might say, well, it doesn't matter how many weeks it takes because I'm only, it's a fixed price. But it takes a certain amount of time to sell something, a certain amount of time to bring it into production, a certain amount of time to work on it. And, and by the time you get to the part where you're delivering that stretched out project, mm -hmm. you now have bodies working on something that was sold and should have been done three months ago, mm -hmm. and you're burning through your overhead. And now suddenly you get to the next part of it and you're selling your next project, you can't work on that project because right. you're busy trying to deliver the thing from three months ago. Right. So, so when I mean the parts that are broken or, or holding you back, is speed of delivery holding you back? Yeah. Uh, are you making mistakes with communications and then maybe you need like a project manager? Hmm. Uh, or maybe sales, like your team is just sitting around doing nothing. Maybe. You gotta get more business. Maybe. I'm, That's not your I'm problem. No, I'm very hesitant to say that. Okay, because, because interesting. Well, because when we did the last video series, how to uh -huh. grow a million dollar business, I, I, I had a salesperson at the time. And yeah. I talked about how I, how three years in, I, I put the whole business on the line to hire a salesperson. Okay. And, and I hired uh, someone who helped me a lot and they were with me for seven years. Yeah. Um, they, like, I don't think Fanta could have gotten where it was without that person. I, okay. I really don't. Like, okay. I, I learned a lot. We grew up together. So, we, so why are you hesitant to say sales is a problem for companies? Because, and, and I've, I've learned this since I mentioned that, yeah. is people think I need a salesperson. Okay. Right? But a salesperson, most salespeople still require lead generation sure. to hand it to them. They still require uh, great account management after the fact. Sure. They, like they, will, they, they still don't know your business as well as you. So you still need to feed them information. So they end up, 
so at a certain point, they will help you close some sales. Right. But then it'll start to shift to the point where you're actually hiring other resources just to feed that salesperson, yep. just so they can do their job. Yep. And it becomes an actual negative on the company. Well, whether it's sales or marketing, like if you ha you're saying, what's the problem in the business? It may be that you're you're just you have too much work and you have to hire people to scale up. Yeah. Or you've got too many people and you don't have enough projects. So whether it's a salesperson or yeah. a PPC campaign or yeah, and most agencies don't. So it's a bit chicken and egg, right? Yeah. Like I need the staff yeah. to make the sales, but I need the sales to pay for the staff. Right. And so we always grew our business based off of kind of, um, I don't even think bootstrapping is the right word. Okay. It's more like f f constantly flying apart at the seams, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so when I hired, so like if I go through my order, like when I hired uh, Daniel, who was my first salesperson, it, like I had, it was just me and him. Yeah. When we hired our first editor, it was because Your literally- first hire was a salesperson? No, my first hire that was real. So I hired, yeah. a, I hired a PA, uh, a production assistant to assist me in this and that. Part-time? Uh, full Full-time, but she was only with me nine months and then the recession hit in 2009. And okay. you know, we were only a $180,000 company at the okay. time. It but was, the first employee that helped you grow your company was a salesperson. salesperson. And you were doing all of the video everything filming else. operations, else. everything. Everything else. But I was, right. I was responsible even for trying to generate Would you leads. do it again? Uh, would I do it again if I started the company again? No, yeah. I'm much better at sales now. So I would do. You myself. would do the sales, and you would hire the team to do the rest. Yeah. Got it. But, first hire. But that's confidence, and that's experience. No, of course, no, yeah. of course. I'm just curious. No, but my first, my first real hire, I, I, I um, the company had zero money. Yeah. All right. We it was 2000, and, just finished 2008. We ate through all of our cash that we had on reserve. There was a three month period where we had zero sales. Yeah. And I was going to close the company down. And then I called my mom, and I said, I, I, you know, I started in 2006. So I was like. It's just too hard, mm. you know. Like, why have I given three years of my life mm. to do something that has no money in the bank? Uh, I didn't earn any income during that time. Like, I gave three years of my life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it was February, and um, I hired, I found a salesperson through uh, through a recruiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hired a recruiter, paid six grand for a recruiter, found a salesperson. Um, Andrew, this amazing guy that we're still friends with, that uh, I really love to have on board. And three weeks in, he quit because he had been offered his dream job right? and he didn't know it was gonna happen and he would never have accepted my job if he right. realized. And so I'm left with like, well, I just spent, I, I paid him three weeks salary, it really right. upset me. I got yeah. nothing for it and, yeah. and, I, and I had no money. Yeah. So I went out and borrowed money, I borrowed 40 or 50 grand. Man. And uh, I went back to the recruiter, I said, find me the next person. And then that was when I didn't pay myself for six months, I cut checks and I paid that person. And you know, like Daniel sacrificed a lot too. So, so that's the yeah, thing. Yeah. Like he came in not as a salesperson; he came in as a as, with a partner mindset. Right. And what I don't, I didn't realize then, but most of my staff, most yeah. of the people who work for me, mm -hmm. you know, you said something about me being a boss earlier, and I'm like, I'm not really a boss. Mm -hmm. I'm just the guy who's kind of in charge. Um, maybe it's the same <laughs> thing. Everybody has to listen to. Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually hire people. I I think I hire more people who treat me like a business partner, okay. and I treat them like a business partner. Okay. So, I mean, they're not fully aware of everything on the financial side. Right. Um, you know, net profit margins and, and things like that. But when yeah. it comes to like, guys, how do we do this as a business? Yeah, yeah right? they're on board. Like, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we figure this out? How do we change this? What's going to yeah. happen? Guys, this department is getting completely overrun, all yeah. hands on deck. Like we're all, we're all business partners. We're all like, but, but they also get the rewards from it. We do profit sharing models. Yeah. So um, uh, if, you know, staff have come to me in the past who, and have been like, I'm facing this life situation. I don't know how I'm gonna get by this month financially. Right. And so, Try to help. Like, well, we just we cut them a check and hand them a bonus. Mm. Right? Like I can't have my team at work not yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, I want yeah, them yeah. thinking, like I wanna, I wanna own them, right? Like, I wanna like, own them, but I'm not a boss. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but I mean, partner. I want every aspect of their life outside yeah, no, I get of it. I hear them you. being I hear amazing you. people to yeah, be yeah, dedicated yeah. to our cause. Yeah, yeah. And so I can't have someone at work barely getting by. So yeah. like, it's the give and take. Yeah. It's the it's the like this isn't you know. Yeah. And first hire freelancer or full time. Yeah, I had a bunch of freelancers. A bunch but of freelancers. What should the advice be? First hire freelancers. because I mean I agree, but because yeah, it's just the variable cost model. So you have to be able to keep your overhead down. Um, now we built our business a bit unusually. You are eating. Look at this. She's eating, eating a screw. screw. <laughs> She's eating a screw. This is not dog food. Okay, you're gonna stay on my lap. Mark's a builder, so. <laughs> this is random not, screws. Not, not, not she actually just, pulled this out of an electrical outlet. Not just, <laughs> not, wow. Not just companies, but he likes to build stuff, too. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, so, freelancer. Uh, yeah, so we built our company a bit unusually. 
Because well, what should people do? What do you think they should do? Well, but I'm biased. So, so I think okay. you should work with freelancers. Yeah. But when we started our company, everyone was working freelancers. Yeah. And freelancers are four, five, six times more, more expensive. per expensive than yeah. full time. Yeah. So I immediately said, hey, hiring full time is really expensive. But if I can hire full time and then keep them really, really busy, right. like my margins are like amazing. Right. right. So we built our business that way. But right? you like year over year over year. Uh, I love the freelancer model at the start because it also teaches you to be a better leader on a low. Yeah. So like the things I don't somebody. like about freelancers yeah. is, um, is one, I think it takes a long time to get into a groove with someone. Train. Yeah. Not only train them, but them train you. Culture. Like they're yeah, better yeah, yeah. than you are. Yeah. So they got to teach you. You got to teach them. You got to yeah. work together. You got to sort of develop shorthand. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I would rather invest that in people who are going to keep around. Yeah. Now, we have freelancers who we've worked with for six or seven years, who are still freelance. Yeah. Because every time I look at the end of the year how much I've paid them, it yeah. still doesn't warrant me hiring them full time. Right. Uh, but but we like to we like to hold on to people yeah. who are good and the people who aren't good. You know, we got I love collecting good leave. people. A lot of the people who are in this field are artists and they're great at what they do mm -hmm. and uh, they hire somebody who's not as good as them and they feel like this person can't do what I do. And then they get rid of them, and they feel like, oh, I'm never going to scale. Yeah, it's tough. I, I'm, you know, I, I suck at managing. I'm just going to go back and do everything myself. And that could work, but you're never going to be a million dollar company doing it. So how do you get through that initial phase of like the first person doesn't work out, and this guy left, and it took three weeks' pay, and I hired somebody, but they're not they're not what I thought they would be, and I hired the wrong person. Like all of the bumps that come at the beginning of hiring, because you've never done it before, so you suck, and you get the wrong people. And they're yeah. not as good as you. So, like, how do you get through all that? So, get used to the fact that every time that you hire someone for a role, the first yeah. person will be wrong. Okay. Like, I, like, I, 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 I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. I feel like I'm pretty good at hiring. Yeah. And yet, the first person I hire for any new role doesn't seem to be the right person. I've been proven maybe once wrong, like, or maybe okay. wrong once. Right. Where someone did come in and they were just great. Right. But. And, and so so get so get comfortable with that because you just don't you just don't know what you need from the person you kind of okay. think you do you don't know what you're looking for you don't know what you need so that's fine so yeah. so get comfortable with that uh, the other thing is give up the things that you're really good at last right right so for Hiring me the opposite your first yeah point. for yeah. me I have very much struggled in the company to give up copywriting hmm. you're and, a good copywriter too this guy this man is a <laughs> I admire his copywriting okay. I look at his he he could like brain dump awesomeness that takes like just out of nothing well, I appreciate it's amazing that. yeah but I, I have a good team as well but but i have like it 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 has bugged me for years where i go i'm doing strategy i'm doing sales i should be focused on all of this stuff and yet i'm doing this low value copywriting why right. can't we find a copywriter who can write copy and do right. what i want this and that and yet it may be low it's not low value it's just low perceived value to me in the, right. my role in the business right and yet, if you have bad copy, everything it about the project apart. falls apart. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. And so I'm always like, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on video scripts. I'm right. still working on stuff. So anyway, we're all these years into it, and it's one of the very last things that I'm willing to give right. up. I, I think creative direction or art direction is the last thing I'm willing to give up. Right. Um, you will give it up at some mm -hmm. point? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so how do you deal with that? How, so is it just because you found somebody who can actually do it better than you or is on par with you? If you feel like you're amazing at it, and you give it to somebody who sucks. Yeah. Obviously, so, you're so one tool it, that we do because I always look I'm like very analytical. Yeah. And I try to explain this to my team. We call it my way, not my way, right or wrong. Okay. So think of a matrix. Four things. Yeah. Right. And there's like there's like my, my way, not my way, right yeah. or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's wrong, it has to be fixed. Sure. Even if it's wrong in my opinion. In your way. Yeah. It has to be fixed. Right. If it's right, everybody's dandy. Yeah. Uh, if it's my way, even better. <laughs> But if it's not my way, and it's right. but it's right still, I have to let it go. Right. Everybody should let it go. Right. Because then that's just me micromanaging. But right is what? By the metrics that you're right tracking? Is, right is the metrics. Right is like what the client has talked about, the conversations right. we've had. It feels right for the product. We're, we're really trying to work to not get bogged down on what is like just inherently I feel is kind of like not my way. Right. But the client doesn't think it's wrong. My team doesn't think it's wrong. Yeah. The designer doesn't think it's wrong. And so I just... I, I've, I let it go, mm. I, and it's hard, and I let it go. And then when something goes wrong, and the client comes back and is like, mm, you know, they like, oh, I don't really like that. I'm like, oh, I knew I should have spoken up. Mm. But that, that doesn't happen. We talked about that in the gut, mm -hmm. right? Like when it's screaming and everyone says it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I should have just done it my way. Mm -hmm. 
but you and I tell that to my team like as 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 I turn something over to producer and that producer become has to start to turn over to thing, people below them and then they have to turn things over to freelancers mm -hmm. I'm now five steps removed from decisions that are being made right I, like I have to believe that every step below understands the context of what's happening and the best intentions and this and that mm -hmm. and the little things can really mess you up but you cannot grow a business having every element of everything be perfect right Right, you have to. I mean, you you talk to me about this, right? Oh, yeah, like, there's yeah, the yeah. world class things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to be world oh, yeah. class at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I thought about that the other day because I think my answer to you was everything. Right. I think my answer was like I'm going to be world class at, at yeah. account management and design and yeah. analytics yeah. and development and this and this yeah. and this. You're like no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. So one last thing I, I will say because I mentioned about how like things are flying off the handle all the time. We only hire someone when that um, higher opposites, a higher, yeah. when we are so busy, yeah. we couldn't possibly go on another day. Okay. So in our business, You're drowning. most of these, like, but you've been drowning for six months. Right. Or eight months. Right. Right. Our businesses have ebbs and flows. Right. The water's already in the lungs. And you don't know if, you're really, really busy right now, and yeah. you're like, you know, the Lord has provided us, and, and it's never going to stop raining. Yeah. And then nine months later, you're like, where did all the business go? What right. happened? Right. And you have all these people here, and you're like, oh, I ramped up to be this business that I'm not turning out to be. Right. And so it's mostly my comfort level. Yeah. But but I literally will wait like six or nine months of mm. just insanity. And if it's proven season over season that it's still insane and it still yeah. looks insane ahead, then I yeah. go, okay, I'm comfortable to hire someone. Got it. But you know, a bunch of years ago, I switched my hiring practice from that model I just mentioned yeah. to, we're going to be a million dollar business. So let's, you know, we were 650. Okay. We're going to be a million dollar business. So let's ramp up like a million dollar business. Okay. And we didn't hit a million dollars. We mm. had like 700. Mm -hmm. And then I think we hit like 920. Mm -hmm. And then we hit a million dollars. But for three years, I had ramped up to be the million dollar business that wasn't there. Right. And in those years, our profitability like dropped. Yeah, tanked. Yeah, tanked. Yeah, yeah, tanked. He's got all these bodies. Yeah. yeah. Whereas before that, when we were flying off the handle, like the most money we ever made was when we were six hundred and forty thousand dollar company. Right? Most, there were most like profit. Take profit. Home. Yeah. 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 There yeah. were like four or five of us in the business. We were yeah. we were working like crazy. Yeah. And I went, I'm ready to be the big company. I'm gonna become. I'm gonna hire the way the big companies do. Yeah. And that hurt us. That hurt us until like two years ago yeah. when we made big changes again and we started going like, forget this. We need to be flying off the handle. What do you, where do you, what's the, like, what's, what does scaling look like for you now? Are you good where you at? Do you want to? No. So where no, do you, we're flying off the handle right now. Well, but where do you, like, <laughs> what's the future version? What are you trying to build? Did you know? You're still figuring it out? You never have it figured out. What's that? You never have it figured out. Okay. So I, I know what I want to do for people. Yeah. And I know the value I want to drive for them. And I know the types of clients who are perfect clients mm -hmm. and what they should pay us very hard to know if all those things are going to align when you're facing a project in front of you mm -hmm. and when you're halfway through and things aren't quite good or they're not going well you know like there was a week two weeks right. ago where i was yelled at by three clients like i had to have really tough conversations with three clients one of them they were confused because we were so busy they were confused by the way we were count managing mm -hmm. i had one conversation someone else on my team had another conversation we contradicted one another mm -hmm. we didn't know that we had mm -hmm. She, and she was like, what is going on here? And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's embarrassing. Yeah. We had to have an open conversation with her about like, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, uh, another, I don't remember what the other one was, another client called at us uh, and was not pleased with some things that were happening. Mm. Uh, last week, I got, I got destroyed by a client <laughs> okay. because of one mistake, one outsourced developer made on one page of one site that mm. caused the entire e-commerce site to crash. Wow. And it was down for whatever 18 minutes. Yeah. But you know, it was like we we weren't we weren't even charging the client for the work. Yeah. We're just managing it to be friendly. Yeah. And uh, and you know, like on a Friday, you know, even now, like I'm I'm like you, you feel like garbage yeah. because of this one little mistake from this one little thing. Yeah. And so when you have those days, you go like, this isn't fun. Why am I doing this? Right. But then I have conversations with people where I'm like I'm like, hey, I have the opportunity to change your life. Right. right? Like your business is here. And it's going to be here. And if I can enable you to get there, not only do I help you, but I help everyone that you help. Right. Right. And, and so, you get to make videos like this, <laughs> inspire so many people. It's fun. Right. It's fun. But yeah. So no, I hear you. I hear you. But, but I mean, you know, but having, could you be, do you see yourself being double the size, triple the size 
Is that like, not like how we, you think? Like we, we need six more people right now. Mm. But do you want to be like 10 times the size? Um, I think we should. I don't, I don't know if it's what I want or, mm. or what we need, or we, we need to do. Okay. Right. You know, like, like we're hovering around $2 million and, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, and it's a very different company for six or eight or $10 million. Mm. Very, very different company. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I don't have the, the, I'm not opposed building that company, but I just want to know, I'm more curious why I would want to build that. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I want to build that because it's like, yeah, I really want that hundred person team yeah. and I really want, uh, the $8 million in revenue, like for like an $8 million company earns more or less the same profits that a $2 million company does when you're in marketing because you're going to go through these ebbs and flows. I mean, if you're really 8 million, 8 million, 8 million, really yeah. tight, really yeah. good, you're going to earn a lot of money. Yeah. But, um, but we do okay. So it's gotta be more about, about the capabilities about how well we do it for me. Yeah. Um, and, and the, the amount we are able to impact a business. Right. That's all I care about. Well, when we make a how to get to $8 million marketing agency, we'll come back and do this all again. There you go. <laughs> no, let's go. I'm, I'm pumped to see your growth. Okay. So like key takeaways, uh, if you want to build a million dollar business, you can't do it by yourself in this industry. You have to, you have to bring on people. You hire your opposite. Don't hire the person who does what you do. Hire the exact opposite of stuff you hate. Start with freelancers and then work your way to get full time. Uh, let go of the thing that you love the most last in your business. And it's not even the thing you love, the thing that you're best at. Thing that you're best at right? last like, in the business. I don't love copywriting, I just think I'm good at it. That's and then you know. expect your first hire in each role that you hire for not to work out, a to little, suck. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And then, and, and you'll find your good person on the other side of the mm -hmm. continuing to, to go through the hiring process. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. The last thing, yeah. is, I used to be paranoid about it. Don't be afraid for good people to leave you. Right? It used to motivate me to do all kinds of crazy things and I would live in fear and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Good people come and good people leave. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of good people out there. Your company will survive anyway. Mm -hmm. right? Don't be afraid for your company to shrink by 50%. Mm -hmm. right? you have a, I, I have a friend, a mentor, who ran a 40 person agency that's down to 18 people and they're doing the best work they've ever done. Mm -hmm. right? It's not like, like Companies grow in agencies, the companies grow and they shrink and they yep. go up and they go down and you have good years and you have bad years and, and people come and people go and, and the company will go on, yep. right? What you can do for people will go on. It's, it, it took me like 11 years to figure that out, but I feel much more free now that I know it. Hopefully they learn it faster. Yeah. That's how we're hacking his brain. There you go. This last one we're talking about how to stay motivated as an entrepreneur. It's one of the things that I think everybody can learn from whether you're in a marketing agency or not. It's one of the tougher things, you know, it's a lonely game, especially at the beginning when you're by yourself and you're trying to mm -hmm. do this thing when people may not believe in you, when you have that voice saying, who are you kidding sometimes? How do you stay motivated? What do you do? Uh, so, gosh, I mean, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm really preaching to the choir. Or... Oh, no, I love it. Great. No, it's, it's... I know, I know. So, so truthfully, having the work that you do, you know, your channel, your Espresso series, your one word. Uh, there have been times, I think in August, I was like, man, I need more Evan in my life. Like, you know, listening to people who, who can connect with you yeah. on a regular basis. Like, you're asking me what I do. Yeah. You already have videos on this, so I can just repeat back to you. It's like, oh, every morning you need to start off by, by having a dose of something to pump you up. Yeah. Uh, you know, you need to create an environment where, where it feeds you and all of this stuff. And, and like, that stuff's all true. Yeah, yeah but your story, um, like, is interesting. It's a different perspective. It's somebody who's had success. People... Yeah. There's a lot of people watching who want to build a million dollar business. Plus, you know, they see you, they may not know you yet, but like through this series, they've come to respect your opinions and see like uh, he's, he's a couple years ahead of me. Like I want to get yeah. there. So you dealt with some frustrating points, <laughs> especially in the beginning of your business yeah. where most people will quit. Most people would not keep, keep it through, keep going. Yeah. So, so like, what did you do to stay motivated in those early days? And then I guess even now, like now you're watching videos awesome, but like how did that, those first early moments when you were struggling, how do you get through it? So there was, for me, it wasn't the belief of what I could build. It was the, like, I really want to build a certain type of company. Okay. I saw what others were doing mm -hmm. and I knew that I couldn't do it. Okay. Like I, I physically, like, you know, so we're in an industry where you need a lot of smart people doing a lot of things for the magic to come together. Okay. And the only way that I can do the type of work that I wanted to do, the mm -hmm. quality, 
uh, that I would be proud of and have the company that, I, that would produce work that I was proud of was to bring on other people. And so, uh, you know, early on recognition certainly helped. You know, the, any work that I did, if someone was like, oh, it's a great project, great job, you know, client, client feedback, that feedback loop of, you know, of, of being able to bring a client in certainly uh, helped. But um, what kept me going is, one, knowing that I wanted to build a certain type of company, um, a hope that we would eventually get there. And, I, you know, early staff is like, Mark, I've been waiting for nine years for this company to come around. I'm like, we're still going to get there, guys. Yeah. Uh, so so there's, there's that. And then um, I really wanted to, I, I just, I wanted to run and own a business. And um, so what do you tell yourself? Though? Like, didn't you call your mom and say you want to quit or like you were yeah. at your end, end of the rope? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so in the February, February 2009, maybe it was, whenever it was that I was thinking about packing it in. Yeah. Um, it just came down to like, I will always kick myself if I, I said at the time, I should just give it one more chance. Okay. Because if I don't, I'll always, it wasn't that I would be a failure. I would kick myself and regret. look back on this with regret. And I, I mean, so much. thank That's goodness, me. thank goodness that I did. I mean, yeah. like, like I have people who go like, I want the type of company you have. And I don't even know how we did it. Yeah. Right? Like I can look back and piece it together. But it's year over year, step over step, a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, I'm, I'm always worried about, about how can we drive the most value and what, do, like I'm always trying to analyze what do we actually do for clients and what are people buying and what are we selling and all these things. Um, so much so that I'm probably holding us back from just, you know, years ago someone said, just find something you're good at and just do it a thousand times. And I'm like, no, every project has to be different and mm -hmm. everything has to be custom and I can't, I can't become a machine. Yeah. But, but mostly it's like, I, I, I wanna give this a shot and then you hit a point. I was talking to a, you know a business owner who's in year two, building a, a website agency, and he's at, he's at this point where he's just like, I just I don't have enough money to support the team I need, and I'm on this hamster wheel, and mm -hmm. it feels like it's never going to end. You need the money to pay the team. You need the team to make the sales. You need the sales to have the money to pay for the team. And the only thing I could tell him, which is what happened for me, and it's happened in twice now, mm -hmm. in, in two different. In, in, versions of Fanta mm -hmm. is that it looks l like it's impossible and then just one day it's no longer impossible and you didn't know when it changed. Mm. So in my house I'm, I'm renovating in my backyard, I'm doing this really big project in my backyard and so I have this dirt, like I have this bobcat, this, um, this skid steer that I have to move dirt to make a patio and right now it starts hilly okay. and, I, and this summer is really weird. I was like, I was in there and I have this, this shovel and this skid steer and I'm trying to make it smooth with this really big machine. And the more I work it, the less smooth it is and the mm. more bumpy it is. And I'm at the point where I'm like frustrated. It's like six hours in and I'm like broken down and I'm just like, I, I feel like I wanna cry because I'm like, I'm like, I'm never gonna be able to do this. <laughs> yeah. And then like 20 minutes later, I just looked around and everything was smooth. Okay. And I went, that's weird. And then a, a few days later, I'm working on something else and I hit that point where I'm getting really frustrated. I said, no, let me push through this. Okay. Let me push through this. And then half an hour later, everything's smooth. Okay. And a few days later, I'm working my wife's car and I'm trying to hammer this broken thing off and it won't come off. And I'm frustrated and I'm like, and I'm like, I'm never going to get through this. And then finally I take this really big hammer and I'm like, well, this thing has to come off. And I just hammer the heck out of it. And I spent two hours trying to hammer this thing off. I hammer the heck out of it. It comes off. Okay. 10 minutes later, I put it all back together. And what seemed hopeless. Yeah. Right. I just beat the crap out of it. Right. But that, and then that, 10 minutes later, it's all together and it's there. That's the piece that most people miss. And that's, and that's what happens in business. Yeah. Is right, like, is like you're trying, you're trying, you're in the hamster wheel, the hamster wheel, the hamster wheel, and then one break happens. Mm -hmm. Or you get a little bit more revenue on one project, you're like, I'm gonna apply this to this. Mm -hmm. Or you push through and you, when you're about to give up, you wait, and then the call comes, mm -hmm. and you get the project to go ahead. And suddenly that, that one thing, you know, hammering extra hard and putting the extra effort in, and it comes off and then 10 minutes later it's done. Mm -hmm. like, like in life, things turn really fast. Mm -hmm. And so this guy who's two years into his web building business, who doesn't have a team, and doesn't have a team I'm, like, I'm like, don't stop, keep going, mm -hmm. right? Keep going, keep going, because suddenly you're gonna get a project and that's gonna let you hire one person, which is suddenly gonna snowball into now hi selling three more, which snowballs into hiring two or three more people. And in like a year and a half, you spent all this time struggling yeah. and then suddenly you have a half million dollar business or a million dollar business or whatever it is. And so when I started, three years of struggling, and then we were able to figure something out, and we became a pretty good like four, five, six hundred thousand dollar business. Mm -hmm. And then it took us 
a few years to figure out how to be a million dollar business. Mm -hmm. And then we were a million dollar business with no growth for four years in a row. And I was like, well, obviously this isn't getting me to where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I made, and I made some really big changes and I rethought how I looked at the company and suddenly we grow 50% or 60% in one year. And then I go, well, is that a fluke? And then I, I try to put that in it and we put together a few more years of the same. So now I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for the next one. But you have to push through the time where you're going to give up, where you're like, you're like, this is a mess. I've just made it messier. I haven't made my life simpler. Mm -hmm. But you push through, and then suddenly everything ha happens, and it all comes together, and you're like, cool, I'm a genius. Right. And people pat you on the back, but meanwhile, you didn't believe you could do it. And it's everybody's, I mean, not everybody, it's a lot of people's story. The hardest part is just getting up and doing the thing every day and pushing through when it feels hopeless. I just didn't feel like I had a choice. Because of regret. Uh, re regret. Uh, I'm the I'm the sole breadwinner. Uh, you know, at first it was like I start my company. But you could have got a job. You could have gone back and got a job if you, if it's just made, you would have made more money at a job than doing this. I'd make more money at a job right now. <laughs> it's okay, but it's not so. <laughs> so but, but but you have a choice there in that if it's just being a breadwinner, you can make money doing a yeah. job. If it's the regret of I don't want to look back in 50 years and say like I missed my shot. Yeah, but it was also at the time you're not realizing that it's okay to fail. Right, mm. like, like now that I've done this, yeah. like, like if, if this all disappears, yeah. I'm like, cool. What's next? <laughs> like, seriously, like, like I, I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a great team, and I'm so like, great. How can I save the team and bring them with me wherever I'm going? Yeah, yeah. your identity was tied to the. Which, yeah. which, do you think that saved it? I'm glad I didn't give up. Yeah, but but, 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 you think it but more important today. Yeah, more important today is actually me giving up, right? Because because truthfully, tr truthfully, it's like we have. Um, so I've been doing this for 12 years. I have uh, a comfortable income. It's not where I want it to be. I don't know if anyone's income ever is, but it's a comfortable income. I've got a good team. When days are hard now, yeah. I, go, I go, why am I doing this? Like, yeah. like, I built up this company and I'm doing all this stuff. Do I really need this? It's like, I don't know if that's ego. Yeah. I don't know if that's um, getting tired because yeah. it's like you, you don't want to burn out or whatever it is. But... Um, uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not actually when you're sitting there with nothing, saying spinning your wheels at the end of the day and going, like you're you're sitting there and you're you're drinking a glass of wine or you're crying and you're or you're confessing to someone yeah. that you feel like a failure. Uh -huh. I feel like you push through that. The the bigger enemy are are the the days or the weeks or the months mm -hmm. where you go into work and you don't want to go into work because it's just not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. Where did that magic go? And for that. Um, I've kind of taken comfort in saying like, hey, if you have a bunch of those days or weeks or months in a row, then change your business. Like, mm. like you're in the wrong business. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to get out. Like, your business is a vehicle that you should be able to take anywhere you want. If, if next year you check on this video and Fantas become an electrical engineering company or something, it's like, cool, here I am, the expert at uh, running an electrical contracting company or right. whatever it is, because that's what I'm interested in now. <laughs> right. Now, I'm not going to like do that to my team. Yeah. I owe it to them to keep going yeah. the direction and, and my clients. But, but yeah, I mean, like this can come, this can go. All I know is that I'm building something, I'm bringing great people on, and I want to hold on to those people wherever, wherever this takes us. Yeah. And how about now? Staying motivated, doing what you're doing. I mean, you said you watch videos, what I'm doing, that kind of stuff. But Yeah, so uh, I think it's really, really important to listen to things outside of the, the field you're in. Okay. So um, being able to better shape uh, and things of interest, right? Okay. So um, I, I think people talk about like, hey, you know, entrepreneurs say, you got to work out and take care of your body because if you don't take care of your body, you can't do anything else. Yeah. I think people in their 40s and 50s hit that page where they're mature enough to say, you got to do it. I still don't quite take care of my body as well. Okay. Like, yeah, I'll worry about that later. Right. But I have hit the part of my life where I'm like, it's important to be a well-rounded person. Okay. And when I was younger, it was more like, focus on work, focus on work, focus on work. And the well-roundedness keeps you motivated to still be an entrepreneur and push forward? Yeah. So like, what, what changed? What's something you do that you didn't do before? Um, that's a great question. What's something I do that I didn't do before? It's uh, the so first time in 10 episodes that he said, that's a great question. Actually, no, in episode one. In episode one. In episode one, he said, it's a great question. <laughs> when I asked you three questions, and now episode 10, we have another great question. <laughs> You've been phoning it in the rest of the time. All right, right good. That's uh, interesting, because I, I heard the expression, mailed it in. Yeah, you can phone it in or mail it in. But they're both forms of communication. Yeah, it's basically, you just didn't show up. Interesting. <laughs> so, interesting. anyway. Okay, yes. Uh, what was my great question? 
So what did you do differently in the past year or so that you weren't doing before? Yes. Yeah. So quite often I don't take my laptop home with me. Okay. At night. So that you can what? Spend more time with the kids? Uh, Mark's got a thousand right. kids, by the way. You started, with, you started with a three month old. Yeah, Rachel, she's 12 now. And now you've got Four six? Kids. Four kids. Oh, I you, why did I think six, I had six kids. Why did Four I feel kids. Like you had six? Okay. Four kids. That's not that bad, actually. Four yeah, kids. Four it's still, kids. This is a lot, but um, you're still young for four kids. Yeah, I'm 35. Yeah. Four kids. Yeah. So um, we, so what do I do? Uh, you don't take the laptop home with me. I don't you. take the laptop home with me, which means when I get home, it's like, it's like dinner, it's, it's family time, it's put the kids to bed, it's do the dishes, it's walk the dog, it's make the kids lunches. Hmm. Which actually means that like at nine o'clock when I'm like, huh, I've done all my stuff. Yeah. I'm not tempted to sit down and work till one or 2 a.m. Okay. So what's nine to bedtime? Um, just whatever the heck Veg I Veg out, like whatever, Netflix whatever, or... Whatever. Uh, uh, follow a lot of people on YouTube. Okay. Read a lot. Uh, like not books, but I go down rabbit holes. Okay. Uh, research Explore stuff. stuff. Uh, I mean, I'll blue sky. I'll be like, I'll still think about work. Okay. But I'm not on my laptop, which means it, it actually like limits me to like just like it limits me to, it. to like I'm not getting into work mode because when I'm in work mode, right. Uh, and I still have to do it sometimes, but it will literally be one or two or three in the morning, and hmm. I'll be like looking up. I'll be like, oh, uh, and then I'll look down at my calendar because I track everything in 15 minute increments. And I'll be like, oh, I started this at 6.15. I've just been working for seven extra hours on this one thing. Hmm. Um, and so it's, it's slowed me down a little bit, but I don't know if that's a bad thing. Um, I make an effort to come into work earlier in the morning hmm. so, I can, so I can give myself permission not to work late at night because I'm going to come in before work actually starts in the morning and what catch up. What time do you up. get in? Uh, I try to get in between 7 and 8. If I need to, if I need to I'll come in at like 6. Yeah. But, but you, it sounds to me like you're spending your evening time kind of taking in the world. Just what it's, but it's 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 the only time of my day yeah. and my weekends yeah. where I can do whatever I want. So right. maybe if you, like maybe if you're single. So if I were single, I would yeah. be tempted to work all the time. Right. I would work all the time on right. everything. I would get up in the morning. I would work. I would go home. I would go to bed. Yeah. Luckily, I'm, I'm, I have a wife and kids who demand me to socialize. Right. So so at least it forces me to do that. On the weekends, um, I very rarely answer emails or. Now I still monitor them, but I very rarely answer emails. And for the first time um, in the summertime, when I took a week off, I didn't, I didn't, um, resp I didn't look at my phone at all during the day. But that so, extra time that you're spending at night is is not like I'm just going to shut off the world and watch 18 hours of Simpsons, or not 18 hours, but like Simpsons repeats. It, it can be if I feel I want to do that. Okay. You know, if like if I feel like I just want to like. But do you feel like you need like to shut TV? off the world? I'm an introvert. Okay. Like I need time to like recoup. Yeah. Trust me, man. Tonight I'm gonna need time to recoup. <laughs> we filmed all ten in one day, in one of sitting. Of course, they see us well, sitting wearing the sitting. same. The same not wearing one the same sitting. stuff. We had we got up and went to the washroom. Ate shawarma and stuff. But you know, like go, going. Oh man, getting the dog. Like, gosh, she's a pain in the butt. And the but lawnmower. Forcing me to. Oh, dude, my lawnmower. I love it. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. We're Why like, do you love the lawnmower? It takes him an hour to cut the grass every hours. weekend. Three, Three hours. hours. Three hours. Three hours. I thought it was mm -hmm. one. No, no. We're, wow, you, you we're have on a half acre. Giant property. Okay. Yeah. So, so three hours to cut. But why is it your favorite part of the weekend? Oh, because it's like I my see it's a little bit reduced because my I I've admitted this too many times, so my uh -oh. wife now knows uh -oh. what the deal is. Now it's on camera. But <laughs> I put I put I put music on. I put my headphones on. I go out and cut the grass. And it's not a time where I have to be a father. It's not a time where I have to be a business owner. It's not a time where anyone's calling me. It's literally like, well, I got to cut the grass. It's growing. Right. And no I one did podcasts. Yeah, I'll listen to podcasts. Okay, okay, okay. I'll listen to podcasts okay. so one and a half times. So yeah. that way it's extra efficient. Right. Or uh, that's fast. People one and a half times. Could you listen to my book one and a half speed? Really? I listen to Ben Shapiro sometimes at one and a half speed. Have you ever really? heard that guy talk? Yeah, you got it. I have a hard time at one point two five, but I'm also not an auditory learner. It's the hardest one for me, so I have to slow it down. Anyway. Yeah. So you listen to music, listen to podcasts for three hours every weekend. If yeah, it's your I mean, ritual. Yeah, in the summertime, sometimes the grass starts stops growing. But uh, uh, well, how do you deal with the winter when it's snow? I go snowblow. Okay. I have a long driveway. Or rake the leaves. It takes me an hour and ten minutes to snowblow. Okay. okay. Now that one's less fun. I have to say, if you're out on a beautiful sunny day cutting right. your lawn, right? And you know you see the green. You know it's my lawnmower is pretty pretty like you know I get the headphones on. That's amazing. Yeah. Snowblowing's not. <laughs> <laughs> Shuffling, it's not that much fun. <laughs> right. But it's still like, oh, I gotta go still out. Something. I gotta go out and, yeah, yeah. and get outside Nature, and physical. do my stuff. But walk the dog or do the like. Even, yeah. even I enjoy doing the dishes. I mean, I don't, I don't really. Yeah. But I like that it forces me to stand there. Yeah. And think or watch something or mm -hmm. learn something. 
Uh, what are you usually doing when you watch my videos? Or do I want to know? What do you think I'm doing? Well, I don't know. I'm just kidding. So, I mean, your videos, <laughs> I mean, uh, typically I'm, I'm watching the stuff early in the morning. Okay. So it's... Uh, morning routine? Yeah. So it's either, like, as soon as I wake up, the only thing that can wake me up is to start reading. Like, if I don't start, like, if I don't grab my phone uh -huh. and start just trying to get my eyes onto the phone... Huh. Like, I will go back reading to sleep. Reading email? Reading a story? And, yeah, anything. Okay. Anything to literally okay. force that light into my eyes okay. because I am getting up early. And yeah. Uh, otherwise, I will be very tempted. Or if I have a meeting, then I have to get up. Right, right, I, right. I have to be downtown in an hour right. and 15 minutes or whatever right, it is. Right, you rush. But otherwise, yeah, yeah like, literally, I'll be like, ah, I, can, I don't have to come into work at 7 a.m. Right. Because I don't have to. I can come in at 9. Yeah. Or I can come in at 10. Right. Who's going to say what? Okay. Right? So, so you read on the phone? I read on the phone. Uh, that's when I, I will pop in. Sometimes I get up before your, your, uh, your 535 email goes out or whatever. Oh, the confidence, <laughs> yeah, 254, yeah. okay. 254, great series. Everyone should look at it. Yeah. Uh, but so I do that. And um, otherwise it's like, yeah, in between like brushing my teeth in the shower or although I, I mean, I don't know how detailed we want to get here. I do brush my teeth in the shower because it's a great way to save time. I'm with Mark naked in the shower. <laughs> I don't want your videos him. naked oh, no? in the okay. shower. No. Okay, I'm not with Mark naked no. in the shower. Uh, the other thing I do is because I because I, 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 I get up and I and I get out the door quick and I grab a coffee on my way in. I have a, like about a 40, 45 minute drive into the office here, yeah. which is great. There's no traffic or anything. Yeah. The other thing I do is when I get here, yeah. I find no matter how energized I was when I woke up, yeah. it's like you lost an it. hour and a half later. Yeah. Okay. Right? And so or an hour and 15 or whatever it is. So sometimes I find as soon as I get into the office, I just open it up um, and just force myself to watch something. What or do you I, watch? Or I put on oh, something, like, something, any something, the from, videos? something from it. you or I put on music and Got it's it. like, dancing and, in the office. and I like to close the door okay. if someone's here or whatever it is, but it's like, I need Get naked time. in the office. and Get naked in the office. <laughs> such a big window on this side. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Random. We'll Random. stock Mark and see what happens. I, I don't think anything I do is really that uh, extraordinary, but, yeah. but what drives me crazy is people who waste time when they come in. Right. Right. Not not, not my staff. I mean, it. even for myself. In general, like, yeah. like to walk in the door and, and chit chat yeah. and make a coffee and talk. No, like, like come to work, sit down and start working. Okay. And then you can look up an hour or two later and go like, oh, hey, it's whatever time it is. Or sometimes yeah. I forget to eat lunch or whatever it is. But Final yeah. message to someone who's feeling unmotivated. They're watching this. They're thinking about quitting their business. Yeah. You know, they wanted to learn something in this series. They, they clicked on the title. You know, they might, based off of your answer, yeah. quit or not quit. Yeah, it's tough. What do you want to tell them? It's tough. Um, I would say, I would say that it's never easy, but it, and, and it's not always rewarding, but when you stop back and you look at what you're doing, if you have a purpose, if you know your one word, if you're focusing on momentum and not the little bumps along the way, that it will be worth it to push through, right? It's, it's never, it's never, I have a friend who's starting a business who I was talking to and he's just like, oh, I just can't wait for things to smooth out. I'm like, never, never happens, mm -hmm. right? So, so there are things you must love when things are clicking. Try to work for that magical moment, right? Like, like try, to, try to get to the place where, where you're like, yes, this is really working. And then don't try to just hold on to that, like keep growing and keep building off that, but, but find that in the little things you're doing, right? Like I'm a perfectionist, um, other people might be, I get down on myself, I know lots of other people get down on what they're doing. It always seems broken. Nobody has this figured out, right? You know, you work with some of the CEOs in the biggest companies, they don't have this figured out. Mm -hmm. Right, and so just just know that we're we're all you know we said at lunch we're all walking the same path we're all going the same direction some people are ahead and some people are behind some people leapfrog and just stay with it if you have a passion and you believe you can do it. To see my one-on-one -on -one with Grant Cardone on how he built a million-dollar business in 90 days, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe. I'll see you there. I'll tell everybody right now I didn't hit the target. Spoiler. I'm calling home every night on my new phone to my wife crying like a little baby.